This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Water Sleeps, written by Glenn Cook and narrated by McLeod Andrews. Chapter 52 It was dry in that wicked temple, but it never got warm. I do not believe a brush fire could have routed the chill that inhabited that place, that gnawed into your bones and soul like an ancient and ugly spiritual rheumatism. Even Narayan Singh felt it. He hunched over the fire, twitching as though he expected a blow from behind at any minute. He muttered something about his faith having been tested enough. I do not belong to an empathetic and compassionate brotherhood. Those who offend us must look forward to moments of extreme discomfort. Should God, in his magnanimity, see fit to present us with the opportunity to provide it? And our antipathy toward Narayan Singh was so old it had become ritual. So it was not with any commiseration that I told him, We're prepared to make the exchange. Our first book of the dead for your key. His head came up. He stared at me directly. The true Narayan behind the masked Narayan considering me coldly. Wariness took life in the corners of his eyes. Oh, good. Never mind. We have it. A swap was the deal. And we're ready to swap now. Calculation began to replace caution. I would have bet a handsome sum he was assessing his chances of murdering us in our sleep so he would not have to keep his side of the bargain. It would be, perhaps, a less elegant solution than mass murder, Narayan. But why not just do the deal the way we agreed? I shivered. The temple seemed to be getting colder, if that was possible. In fact, I'll give you a bonus. Once you hand over the key, you can go. Away. Free. As long as you vow not to screw with the Black Company anymore. A vow he would make in an instant, I was sure. Such vows being worth the bark they are written on when they spring from the mouths of deceivers. Kina would not expect him to keep faith with an unbeliever. A truly generous offer, Analyst, Singh replied suspiciously. Let me sleep on it. By all means. I snapped my fingers. Iqbal and Runmust broke out the shackles. Put the goat bells on him tonight, too. We had several of those, to go with the several goats. Once attached to Narion's shackles, they made a racket whenever he moved. He was a stealth master, but not master enough to keep the bells from betraying him. But don't be surprised if I don't feel as generous when light and warmth return to the world. Darkness always comes, but the sun also rises. I had my blanket around me already. I pulled it tighter and lay down, squirmed a little in a vain attempt to get comfortable, then fell into the sort of evil haunted dreams apparently experienced by anyone who passes the night in the grove of doom. I was aware that I was dreaming, and I was familiar with the dreamscapes, though I had never visited them myself. Both Lady and Mergen had written about them. The visual elements did not trouble me terribly, but nothing had prepared me for the stench, which was the stink of thousand-week-old battlefields. Worse than any stench I remembered from the siege of Jaikur, countless crows had come to banquet there. After a while, I began to feel another presence, far off but approaching, and I was afraid not wanting to come face to face with Narion's dreadful goddess. I wanted to run, but did not know how. Mergen had drawn upon years of experience when he eluded Kina. Then I realized I was not being stalked. This presence was not inimical. In fact, it was more aware of me than I of it. It was amused by my discomfort. Mergen? "'Tis I, my apprentice. "'I thought you'd dream here tonight. "'I was right. "'I like being right. "'It's one of the joys of bachelorhood, 
I had forgotten until I became a haunt. I don't think Sara would appreciate. Of course not. Forget that. I don't have time. There are things you should know, and I won't be able to reach you again directly until you enter the dark roads on the glittering plain. Listen. I listened. Life in Taglios was proceeding normally. The scandal at the Royal Library and disappearance of the chief librarian had been played into a major distraction by the protector. Soulcatcher was more interested in consolidating her position than in rooting out remnants of the Black Company. After all these years, she still did not take us as seriously as we wanted. Or she was completely confident that she could root us out and exterminate us any time she felt like bothering. That being a possibility, Mergen's advice was sound. We should keep moving fast while that option was available. The best news was that Jal Barundandi had shown an eager willingness to attach himself to the cause in hopes of avenging his wife. His initial assignment, to be carried out only if he was confident he could manage without getting caught or leaving evidence, was to penetrate the protector's quarters and steal, destroy, or somehow incapacitate the magical carpets she had stolen from the Howler. If those could be denied her, our position would improve dramatically. He was also to recruit allies without telling them that he was helping the Black Company. The ancient hysterical prejudice remained potent. It sounded wonderful, but I counted on nothing. Men driven solely by a need to revenge are flawed tools at best. If he let the obsession consume him, he would be lost to us before he could do any of the quiet, long-term things that make an inside man such a treasure. The bad news was bad indeed. The main party, traveling by water, had passed through the delta and was now ascending the Nagir River, meaning it was way ahead of us in terms of time still needed to reach the Shadow Gate. One Eye had suffered a stroke two nights earlier, during a drunken knockdown drag out with his best friend Goblin. Death did not claim him. Goblin's swift intercession had prevented that. But now he suffered from a mild paralysis and the sort of perplexing speech problems that sometimes come after a stroke. The latter made it difficult for One Eye to communicate to Goblin what Goblin needed to know to cope with the problem. The words One Eye wanted to say or write were not the words that came out a problem that is maddening enough for the ordinary analyst, coping only with time constraints and native stupidity. You cannot prepare yourself enough. The inevitable is always a shock when it lowers its evil wing. As if responding to a great joke, the circling crows rattled with dark mocking laughter. The skulls in the bone field grinned, enjoying the grand joke too. There were more minor bits of news, once Mergen exhausted his store, I asked, Can you reach Slink if he's here? Can you put a thought into his empty head? Possibly. Try. With this. My idea amused Mergen. He hurried off to haunt Slink's certain-to-be strange dreams. The crows scattered, as though there was nothing interesting keeping them around anymore. I continued to people the place of nightmare, hoping I would not become a regular, as had befallen Lady and Mergen. I wondered if Lady still went there, making her interment that much more a session in hell. A crow landed high up in a barren tree, against the face of what passed for a sun in that place. I could not distinguish it, but it seemed different from the other crows. Sister, sister. I am with you always. Terror reached down inside me and squeezed my heart with a fist of iron. I shot bolt upright. Panic and confusion swamped me as I grabbed for my weapons. Doge stared at me from beyond the fire. Nightmares. I shivered in the cold. Yes. They're the bad side of staying here. But you can learn to shut them out. I know what to do about them. Get away from this godforsaken place as soon as I can. Tomorrow, early, 
right after the deceivers turn over the key and you authenticate it. I thought I heard faint crow laughter in the night outside. Chapter 53 I took my turn on watch. I discovered that I was not the only one with problem dreams. Everyone slept poorly, including Narayan. Iqbal's baby never stopped whimpering. The goats and donkeys, though not allowed inside, also bleated and snorted and whimpered all night long. The Grove of Doom is just plain a bad place. No way around that. Some things are black and white. Morning was not much more pleasant than night had been. And even before breakfast, Narayan tried to sneak away. Riverwalker showed remarkable restraint in bringing him back still able to walk. You are going to run out on me now? I demanded. I had a good idea what he really had in mind, but did not want him to suspect I knew what had become of the friends he had expected to rescue him. I thought you wanted that book back, he shrugged. I had a dream last night, and it wasn't a good dream. It took me places I didn't want to go, with beings I didn't want to see. But it was a true dream. I came away with the certainty that neither of us has any chance of getting what we want if we don't fulfill our ends of our bargain. So I'm here to tell you I'm playing it straight up. The Book of the Dead for the Key. Narayan betrayed a flicker of annoyance at my mention of a dream. No doubt he had hoped for divine guidance and had failed to receive it last night. I just wanted to look for something I left here last time I visited. The key? No. A personal trinket. He squatted beside the cook fire, where Mother Goda and Suruvija were preparing rice. The Radisha, to the amazement of all, was trying to help. Or, better put, was trying to learn what was being done so she could help at another time. Neither woman offered the princess's status any special respect. Goda snarled and complained at the Radisha exactly as she would have done with the rest of us. I watched Narayan eat. He used chopsticks. I had not noticed that before. Paranoid me. I searched my memory, trying to remember if Singh had used the customary wooden spoon in the past. Uncle Doge, like all Nguyenbo, used chopsticks, and he claimed they constituted some of his deadliest weapons. I was going to go crazy if I did not get Narayan out of my life for a while. He smiled as though he was reading my mind. I think maybe he put too much faith in my word on behalf of the company. Show me the book, Analyst. I looked around. Doge? The man appeared in the temple doorway. What was he up to in there? Yes. The master deceiver wishes to see the Book of the Dead. As you wish. He descended the leaf-strewn outer steps, rummaged through one of the donkey packs, came up with the oil-skin package we had retrieved from the Shadowlander tomb. He presented it to the deceiver with a bow and a flourish stepped back and crossed his arms. I noted that, in some mystic manner, Ash Wand had found its way back onto his back. I recalled that Doge's adopted family bore Narion Singh and the Strangler cult an abiding grudge. Deceivers had murdered Totan, the son of Sara's brother, Tai Dei. Tai Dei lay buried beneath glittering stone with the captured. Uncle Doge had offered no promises to Narion Singh. I wondered if Singh knew all that. Most of it, probably, though the subject never arose in his presence. I noted also that without plan or signal, my other companions had placed themselves so that we were surrounded by armed men. Only Swan seemed unsure of his role. Settle and have some rice, I told him. I hate rice, Sleepy. We're going places where there'll be a little more variety. I hope. I've eaten rice till it's coming out my ears, too. Narayan opened the oil skins reverently, set them aside one by one, ready to be reused. The book he revealed was big and ugly, but not much distinguished it from volumes I saw every day when I was Dorby Day Bonerjay. 
Nothing branded it the most holy, most sacred text of the darkest cult in the world. Narion opened it. The writing inside was completely inelegant, erratic, disorganized, and sloppy. The Daughter of Night had begun inscribing it when she was four. As Narion turned the page, I saw that the girl was a fast learner. Her hand improved rapidly. I saw, too, that she had written in the same script used to record the first volume of the annals. Were both in the same language? Where was Master Centaraxita when I needed him? Out on the Nagir with Sara and One Eye. No doubt complaining about the accommodations and the lack of fine dining. Too bad, old man. I have the same problems here. Satisfied that it's genuine? I asked. Narion could not deny it. So I've lived up to my half of the bargain. I have, in fact, made every effort to facilitate it. The game is back to you now. You have nothing to lose, analyst. I still wonder how I would get away from here alive. I won't do anything to keep you from leaving. If revenge is absolutely necessary, it'll be that much sweeter down the road. Narion tried to read my true intentions. He was incapable of accepting anything at face value. On the other hand, there's no way you'll go anywhere if you don't produce the key, and we'll know if you try to pass off a substitute. I looked at Doge. Narion did the same. Then he settled into an attitude of prayer and sealed his eyes. Kina may have responded. The grove did turn icy cold. A sudden breeze brought a ghost of the odor from the place of the bones. Sing shuddered, opened his eyes. I have to go into the temple. Alone. Wouldn't be a back way out of there, would there? Sing smiled softly. Would it do me any good if there were? Not this time. Your only way out of here is not to be a deceiver. So be it. There'll be no year of the skulls if I don't take a chance. Let him go, I told Doge, who stood between Narion and the temple. River and Runmust, I noted, now had bamboo in hand, in case the little man made a break. He's been in there a long time, River complained. But he's still there, Doge assured us. The key must be well hidden. Or not there anymore, I did not say. What are we looking at here? I asked Doge. I'm not clear on what this key is. Is it another lance head? The lance of passion had opened the plane to Croker, then had ushered the captured to their doom. I've only heard it described. It's a strangely shaped hammer. He's about to come out. Narion appeared. He seemed changed invigorated, frightened. Riverwalker gestured with his bamboo. Runmust raised his slowly. Singh knew what those poles could do. He had no chance if he tried to run now. He carried what looked like a cast iron war hammer, old, rusty, and ugly, with the head all chipped and cracked. Narion made it seem heavier than it looked. Doge? I asked. What do you think? Fits the description, analyst, except for the head being all cracked. Singh said, I dropped it. It cracked when it hit the temple floor. Feel it, Doge. If there's any power there, you ought to be able to tell. Doge did as I said once Singh surrendered the hammer. The Nguyen Bo seemed startled by its weight. This must be it, analyst. Take your book and start running, deceiver, before temptation makes me forget my promises. Narion clutched the book, but did not move. He stared at Suruvija and the baby. Suruvija was using a red silk scarf to dab spit up off the infant's chin. Fools. Idiots. Chapter 54 While we were getting ready to travel, 
one of Iqbal's kids, the older boy, noticed a particularly deep flaw in the head of the hammer. The rest of us had been too busy congratulating ourselves and deciding what the company would do once we brought the captured forth from the plane. The boy got his father's attention. Iqbal summoned Runmust and me. Being old folks, it took us a while to see what the boy meant. Us having bad eyes and all. Looks like gold in there. That would explain the weight. Doge, come here. You ever hear anything about this hammer being gold inside? Iqbal began prying with a knife. A fragment of iron fell away. No, Doge said. Don't damage it anymore. Everybody calm down. It's still the key. Doge, study it. Carefully. I don't want all the years and all the crap we went through to go to waste now. What? Weapons had begun to appear. Look who's here, Swan said. Where did those guys come from? Slink and his band had arrived. I exchanged looks with Slink. He shrugged. Give us the slip. I'm not surprised. We screwed up here. He knew somebody was out there. Suruvija still had the red scarf draped over her shoulder. Folks, we need to get traveling. We want to get across the bridge at Goja before the protector starts looking for us. From the beginning, I had pretended that getting across that bridge would give us a running chance. I told Slank, You guys did a great job at Simki. Could have been better. If I'd thought about it, I'd have waited till they damaged the Bodhi tree. Then we'd have been heroes instead of just bandits. I shrugged. Next time. Swan, tell that goat we're going to eat it if it don't start cooperating. You promise? I promise. We'll get some real food when we get to Jaikur. Chapter 55 Our crossing at Goja was another grand anticlimax. We all worked ourselves into a state of nerves before we reached the bottleneck. I sent Slink forward to scout and did not believe a word, emotionally, when he reported the only attention being paid anyone went to those few travelers who argued about paying a two-copper pace toll for use of the bridge. These tightwads were commended to the old ford downstream from the bridge, a ford that was impassable because this was the rainy season. Traffic was heavy. The soldiers assigned to watch the bridge were too busy loafing and playing cards to harass wayfarers. Some part of me was determined to expect the worst. Goja had grown into a small town serving those who traveled the Rock Road, which was one of the Black Company's lasting legacies. The captain had had the highway paved from Taglios to Jaikur during his preparations for invading the Shadowlands. Prisoners of war had provided the labor, more recently, Mogaba had used convicts to extend the road southwestward, adding tributaries to connect the cities and territories newly taken under Taglian protection. Once we were safely over the main, I began to ponder our next step. I gathered everyone. Is there any way we could forge a rescript ordering the garrison here to arrest Narion if he crosses the bridge? Doge told me, You're too optimistic. If he's going south, he's already ahead of us. Swan added, not to mention that if he fell into the protector's hands, she'd find out everything he knows about you. The voice of an expert heard. I didn't take the job voluntarily. All right. She could, yes. He knows where we're headed. And why. And that we have the key. But what does he know about the other bunch? If he doesn't get caught, won't he try to intercept them so he can do something about getting the Daughter of Night away from them? No one found any cause to disagree. I suggest we remind one another of that occasionally so it gets said sometime when Mergen is around to hear it. Sarah never promised to spare Narion's ragged old hide. Maybe she could ambush him and take back that unfinished first book of the dead. Swan pointed out, 
That crow is still following us. A small but lofty fortification overlooked the bridge and ford from the south bank. The bird was up top watching us. It had not moved since our crossing. Maybe it wanted to rest its bones too. River whispered, we still have one bamboo pole with crow killing balls in it. Leave it alone. It doesn't seem to mean any harm. For now, anyway. I was sure it had tried to communicate several times. We can take it out if anything changes. At Goja, we heard nothing but the traditional grumbling about those in charge. Rumors concerning events in Taglios seemed so exaggerated that no one believed a tenth of anything they heard. Later, after we reached Jaikur and were taking it easy for a while, the temper of rumor began to change. It now carried a subtle vibration suggesting the great spider at the heart of the web had begun to stir. It would be a long time before any concrete news caught up, but the general consensus was that we should get going right now and not dawdle along the way. Runmust discovered that a man answering Narion's description had been seen lurking in the vicinity of the shop operated by his now pseudonymous offspring, Sugriva. The man does have a weakness. Should we kill Sugriva while we're here? He's never done anything to us. His father did. It would be a reminder to him. He doesn't need reminding. If Narion is so dim that he thinks we're done with him now, let him. Just let me be there to see the look on his face when we catch him again. Narion had stood out in Jaikur, because the city was still very nearly a military encampment. People would remember us as well, if asked during the next few weeks. I roamed around looking for my childhood a few times, but nothing that I remembered, people or places, good or evil, remained. That past survived nowhere but within my mind which was the one place I wished that it could die. Chapter 56 The practical rules of company field operations resemble those obeyed by stage magicians. We would prefer our audience saw nothing at all, but we do realize that invisibility is impractical. So we try to show the watcher something other than what he is looking for, thus the goats and donkeys. And south of Jaikur, all new looks and identities for everybody, with the enlarged party breaking up into two independently traveling families, plus a group of failed southern fortune hunters dragging home in despair and defeat after having had their spirits crushed by the Taglian experience. There were quite a few men of the latter sort around. They had to be watched. Many were not above taking advantage of weaker parties if they thought they could manage it. The roads were not patrolled anymore. The protector did not care if they were safe. Doge and Swan, Goda and I, formed the advance party. We looked weak, but that old man was worth four or five ordinary mortals. We had only one scrape. It was over in seconds. Several blood trails led off into the brush. Doge had chosen to leave no one dead. The land became less hospitable and rose steadily. In clear air, it was possible to look ahead and catch the faintest glimpse of the peaks of the Don de Preche, still many days' journey south of us. The paved road ended alongside an abandoned work camp. They must have run out of prisoners, Swan observed. The camp had been stripped of everything portable. What they ran out of is enemies Soul Catcher thought were worth an investment in a road. She could always find people she doesn't like and use them up in an engineering project. And she had done so on the western route, which was being followed by the rest of the company. They would have paved footing all the way to Taranda Prash. Their road and the waterways serving it had remained under construction until just a few years ago, when the protector evidently decided the Kiolune Wars really were over that it was not necessary to make life easy for the great general and his men, and bullied the Radisha into no longer spending the money. I wondered what the Radisha's perspective would be. I suspected she had believed she was in charge right up to the moment we disappeared her. Then she had begun getting an education, here amongst her faithful subjects. 
We reached Lake Tanji, which I love. The lake is a vast sprawl of icy indigo beauty. When I was a lot younger, we fought our deadliest encounter with the things that had given the Shadow Masters their names here. More than a decade later, you could still see places where rock had melted. If you went exploring some of the narrow gulches scarring the hillsides, you could find clutches of human bones that had come back to the surface with time. This is a place of dark memory, Doge remarked. He had been here for that battle, too, and so had Goda, who had stopped complaining long enough to deal with her memories also. She really did have a lot of pain these days. The white crow streaked overhead. It dropped down the slope ahead, vanished into the ragged foliage of a tall mountain pine. We saw that bird almost every day now. There was no doubt it was following us. Swan swore that it had tried to strike up a conversation with him once when he was out in the brush, relieving himself. When I asked what it wanted, he said, Hey, I got the hell out of there, Sleepy. I've got problems enough. I don't need to get known as a guy who gossips with birds, too. It might have had something interesting to say. Without a doubt. And if it really wants to tell somebody something badly enough, it'll come talk to you. Right now, Swan looked down the slope and said, It's hiding from something. But not from us. I looked back up the slope. The ground appeared untouched up there. There was no sign of other travelers. Below me, downhill, the meandering track appeared occasionally upon the slope and along the shore, both of which were deserted. This was no longer a popular route. I could retire beside that lake, I told Swan. Must not be the best place, or somebody would have beaten you to it. He had a point. This country was far emptier now than it had been twenty years ago. Then there had been villages around the lake. There you go, Swan said, looking back. What? I looked. It took a moment. Oh, the bird? Not just a bird, a crow. The regular kind of crow. Your eyes are better than mine. Ignore it. If we don't pay it any special attention, it shouldn't have any reason to concentrate on us. My heartbeat was rising, though. Maybe it was just a feral crow and had nothing to do with Soul Catcher. Crows are not fastidious about their dining. Or maybe the protector had, at last, begun looking for us outside of Taglios. White crow in hiding, black crow in the air, searching. What did it mean? Not much we could do about it, whatever. Though Uncle Doge had a calculating eye whenever he looked up at the black crow. It lost interest after a while. It went away. I told the others, That shouldn't be a problem. Crows are smart for birds. But one by itself can't remember a lot of instructions or carry much information back if it is one of hers. We had to assume that it was. Crows were much less common than they used to be. Those remaining always seemed to be under Soul Catcher's control. Her control was probably why they were dying out. If this one was a scout for the Protector, it would be days yet before it could report. Doge observed, If it was suspicious, we can expect to have shadows around in a few days. That would be Soul Catcher's best means of scouting us. Shadows traveled faster than crows, could be given much more complex instructions, and could bring back far more information. But could Soul Catcher control them so far away? The original Shadow Masters had had major difficulties managing their pets over long distances. We passed along the shores of Lake Tanji. Each of us seized an opportunity to bathe in the icy water, the old road then led us on to the plain of Chirandaprash, where the Black Company had won one of its greatest triumphs and the great general had suffered his most humiliating defeat, through no fault of his own. Though a capricious history would not recall the blame due his cowardly master, Longshadow, wreckage from that battle still lay scattered across the slopes. A small garrison watched over the approaches to the pass through the Dondaprash, 
It showed no interest in clearing any mess or even in monitoring traffic. Nobody looked my group over. Nobody asked questions. We were assessed an unofficial toll and warned that the donkey might find the footing treacherous in the high pass because there was still ice on the rocks up there. We did learn that there had been heavier traffic than usual lately. That told me that Sara's group had encountered no insuperable difficulties and was ahead of us, as it should be, even with all the old men and reluctant companions. The mountains were far colder and more barren than the highlands we had crossed. I wondered how the Radisha was handling it, about her thoughts concerning the empire she had acquired, mostly thanks to the company. Doubtless her eyes had been opened some. They needed a lot of opening. She had spent most of her life cooped up inside the palace. The white crow turned up every few days, but its darker kinfolk did not. Maybe the protector was preoccupied elsewhere. I wished I had Mergen's talent for leaving his body. I had not had so much as a good dream since leaving the Grove of Doom. I knew exactly as little as everyone else. And that was extremely frustrating after having had easy access to secrets from afar for so long. Nights in the mountains get really cold. I told Swan I was tempted to take up his suggestion that we go off somewhere and set up housekeeping in our own tavern and brewery. When it got really cold, a few lesser sins did not seem to matter. Chapter 57 The timing of events in Taglios is uncertain because the principal reporter, Mergen, had maintained such a casual relationship with the concept for the last decade and a half, but his sketchy descriptions of events in the city, following our departure, are of more than passing interest. At first, the protector suspected nothing. The stay-behinds planted smoke buttons and started rumors, but with a declining enthusiasm the Taglian peoples began to sense. At the same time, though, the populace developed an abiding suspicion that the protector had done away with the reigning princess. The people became less tractable by the hour. The arrival of the great general and his forces guaranteed the peace. Moreover, it freed the protector to go hunting enemies instead of spending her time making sure her friends remained intimidated enough to continue supporting her. In just days, she found the Nguyen Bo warehouse on the waterfront. Empty now except for a few cages occupied by missing members of the Privy Council, none of whom were in shape to resume their duties. An armamentarium of booby traps came with the prodigal ministers, of course, but none of those were clever enough to inconvenient soul-catcher herself. Quite a few greys were not so fortunate. The protector took rather a heartless view of those who did fall victim to the company legacy. Better to get the dimwits winnowed out now, when the broader risk is minimal, she told Mogaba. The great general's attitude complimented hers precisely. Questions asked in the neighborhood produced no information of substance, however vigorously they were put. The Nguyen Bo merchants had been careful to maintain a veil around themselves and their businesses. They had even employed the magical in their quest for greater anonymity. Wisps of confusion spells persisted yet. They smelled those two wizards, Soulcatcher muttered. But you promised me that they were dead, didn't you, great general? I saw them die myself. You'd better hope you don't irritate me so much you don't survive to see them die again for real. Her voice was that of a spoiled child. The great general did not respond. If Soulcatcher frightened him, he showed no sign. Neither did he betray any anger. He waited, reasonably confident that he was too valuable to become the victim of an evil caprice. Perhaps... In his heart of hearts, he thought the protector was not equally valuable. There's no trace of them, Soulcatcher mumbled later in a voice academically cool. They're gone. Yet the impression of their presence persists, as bold as a bucket of blood thrown against a wall. Illusion, Mogaba said. I'm sure you'd find a hundred instances in the Black Company annals, of where they drew an enemy's eye in one direction while they moved in another. 
or made someone believe their numbers were far greater than they actually were. You'd find as many instances in my diaries. If I bothered to keep any, I don't, because books are nothing but repositories for those lies the author wants his reader to believe. The voice she used now was the antithesis of academic. It was that of a man who knew, from painful experience, that education just taught people sneakier ways to rob you. They aren't here anymore, but they may have left spies. Of course they did. It's doctrine. But you'll have a hell of a time finding them. They won't be people anyone else would suspect. Jal Barandandi and two of his assistants laid out a dinner while the protector and her champion talked. The presence attracted no notice. Paranoid, though she was, Soulcatcher paid little heed to the furniture. Every staffer had been interrogated in the hours following the Radish's disappearance, and no inside accomplices had been found. The protector was not unaware that she was not as beloved of the staff as the Radisha had been. But she was not troubled. No mundane attacker had any genuine hope of penetrating her personal defenses. And these days, she had no peer in this world. Sheer perversity and protracted elusiveness had put her in a position to elect herself queen of the world, if she wanted to bother. Some day, when she got her head organized, she was going to have to think about that. Halfway through a rare meal, Soulcatcher paused in mid-chew. She told Mogaba, Find me a Nguang Bo. Any Nguang Bo. Right now. Right away. The lean black man showed no emotion as he rose. May I ask why? Their headquarters was inside the Nguang Bo warehouse. Nguang Bo have been associated with the company since the fighting at Dejagore. The last analyst married one of them. He had a child by her. The association may be more than historical happenstance. She knew a great deal more about Nguang Bo than she was willing to share, of course. Mugaba inclined his upper body in a ghost of a bow. Mostly he was comfortable working with Soulcatcher. Mostly he approved of her thinking. He went in search of someone who could catch him a couple of swamp monkeys. The servants hovered around the protector, perfectly attentive. Oddly, she noted that these three were among the same half-dozen who struggled to make her life easier wherever she happened to be in the palace. In fact, one or more always followed her on her exploratory safaris into the maze of abandoned corridors that made up the majority of the palace just in case she needed something. Lately they had brought life into her personal quarters, which for so long had been as chill and barren and dusty as the empty sectors. It was their nature. It was bred into them. They must serve. Without the Radisha to fulfill their need for a master, they had had to turn to her. Mogaba was away hours longer than she liked. When the man did deign to return, her voice of choice was spoiled brat querulous. Where have you been? What took you so long? I've been demonstrating how hard it is to catch the wind. There are no Nguang Bo anywhere in the city. The last time anyone can remember seeing any of them was the day before yesterday. In the morning. They were going aboard a barge that later headed downriver, toward the swamps. Evidently the swamp people have been leaving Taglio since before the Radisha disappeared, and you hurt your heel. Soulcatcher growled. She did not want to be reminded that she had been tricked. The heel itself was reminder enough. The Nguang Bo are a stubborn people. Famous for it, Mogaba agreed. I visited them twice before. Each time they failed to appreciate my full message. I suppose I'll have to preach to them again and round up any fugitives they've taken in. It was an obvious conclusion that the company's survivors had retreated into the swamps. The Nguang Bo had taken in fugitives before, and supportive evidence was available if the protector cared to dig. 
The barges carrying the majority of the company had gone downriver. You had to go down into the delta to get to the Nagir River, which was the principal navigable waterway leading into the south. Soulcatcher popped up. She rushed out with the bounce and enthusiasm of a teenager. Mogaba settled down to contemplate the remains of his meal, which had not yet been cleared away. One of the servants murmured, We thought you might wish to continue, sir. Should you prefer otherwise, we will clear away instantly. Mogaba looked up into a bland face that projected eagerness to serve. Nevertheless, he had a momentary impression that the man was measuring his back for a dagger. Take it away. I'm not hungry. As you wish, sir. Girish, take the leftovers to the charity postern. Make certain the beggars there know that the protector is thinking of them. Mogaba watched the servants depart. He wondered what had given him the impression that that man was insincere. The truth supposedly lay in a man's deeds, and that one never behaved as anything less than a totally devoted servant. Soulcatcher stamped into her personal suite. The more she thought about the Nguyen Bo, the more enraged she became. What would it take to teach those people? That seemed like something they could work out between them before the sun came up. A night of shadow terror ought, at the very least, to put them into a mood to pay attention. Soulcatcher understood herself better than outsiders believed she did. She wondered why she was in so foul a temper, which seemed to go beyond her usual caprice and irritability. She belched, hammered her chest with a fist to loosen another burp. Maybe it was the spicy food. She sensed bad heartburn coming. She felt a little lightheaded, too. She climbed to the parapet, where she kept the only two flying carpets left in the world. That could be reached only by the route she followed. She would go down there and make those swamp monkeys pay for the heartburn, too. Dinner had been a Nguyen Bo ethnic specialty consisting of big, ugly mushrooms, uglier eels, and unidentifiable vegetables in a blisteringly spicy sauce, served upon a bed of rice. It had been a favorite of the radishes, served often. The kitchens had not changed their routines, because the protector did not care about the menu. The protector belched again. The growing heartburn seared her insides. She jumped on the larger carpet. It creaked under her weight. She ordered it to head downriver, fast. A few miles out, 400 feet above the rooftops, streaking faster than a racing pigeon, sabotaged frame members under the carpet began to snap. Once the first went, the stress became too much for the others. The carpet disintegrated in seconds. A burst of light flared bright enough to be seen by half the city. The last thing Soulcatcher saw, as she arced toward the surface of the river, was a huge circle of characters declaring... Water sleeps. Just before the flash leaped through his window, a bemused Mogaba discovered a folded, sealed letter on his Spartan cot. Belching, glad he had eaten no more of that spicy food, he broke the wax and read, My brother unforgiven. Then the unexpected lightning grabbed his attention. He read the slogan in the sky, too. All the labor he had invested in learning to read over the past few years was to be rewarded thus? What now? If the protector was gone, pretend she was in hiding, too, and make the deceit a double veil? He belched again, settled down on his cot. He did not feel well at all. That was a baffling new feeling for him. He never got sick. Chapter 58 a chatty youngster of native stock and a more than customarily ambitious disposition interviewed us at the military control point we encountered at the southern end of the pass. He was not yet old enough to be pompously officious, but he would get there. Personally, he seemed more interested in foreign news than in contraband or wanted men. What's going on up north? He wanted to know. We've seen a lot of refugees lately. He examined our meager possessions without ever looking inside anything. 
Goda and Doge rattled at one another and Yuang Bo and pretended not to understand the young man's accented taglian. I shrugged and responded in Jaikuri at first, which is close enough to taglian for the two peoples to understand one another most of the time. But here it only frustrated the young official. I had no desire to stand around gossiping with a functionary. I do not know about others. We have had nothing but decades of misfortune and suffering. We heard there were opportunities down here, so we abandoned the land of our sorrows and came. The official assumed I meant a particular country, as I had hoped, rather than recognizing that the land of our sorrows was the Vedna way of describing where a convert lived before he became acquainted with God. You say there are many others doing the same as us? I tried to sound troubled. Recently, yes, which is why I feared something might be afoot. He feared for the stability of the empire to which he had attached himself. I could not resist a prank. There were rumors that the Black Company had surfaced in Taglios and was warring with the Protector. But there are always crazy stories about the Black Company. They never mean anything and they had nothing to do with our decision. The young man became more unhappy. He passed us through without further interest. I did not bother commending him, but he was the only official we had encountered since leaving Taglios who was making a serious effort to perform his duties, and he was doing it only in hopes of getting ahead. I never had to bring out the richly complex legend I have invented for our foursome, in which Swan was my second husband. Goda, the mother of my deceased first spouse, and Doge, her cousin, all of us survivors of the wars. The story would have played in any region where there had been any extended fighting. Splatch-cobbled family survival teams were not at all uncommon. I complained. I worked on weaving us a history all the way down here, and I never got to use it. Not once. Nobody's doing their job. Doge smiled and winked and vanished into the broken ground beside the road, off to reclaim the weapons we had hidden before approaching the checkpoint. Somebody should do something about that, Swan declared. Next vice regal sub-officer, I see. I'll march right up and give him a piece of my mind. We all pay taxes. We have a right to expect more effort from our officials. Goda woke up long enough to call Swan an idiot in Taglian and Yuang Bo. She told him he ought to shut up before even the god of fools renounced him. Then she closed her eyes and resumed snoring. Goda had begun to concern me. She had shown less life every day for the past few months. Doge seemed to think she believed she no longer had anything to live for. Maybe Sara could get her going again. We should be joining up with the others before long. Maybe Sara could get her excited about rescuing Tai Day and the captured... I was troubled about consequences. All these years I had striven toward the undertaking we would launch before long, and now, for the first time, I had begun to wonder what success might really mean. Those people buried out there never were paragons of sanity and righteousness. They had had almost two decades to ferment in their own juices. They were unlikely to entertain much brotherly love toward the rest of the world. And then there was the guardian demon Shivetya, and... Somewhere, the enchanted and unchained thing worshipped by Narayan Singh and the Daughter of Night, not to mention the mysteries and dangers of the plane itself, and all the perils we did not yet know. Only Swan had any experience of that. He had nothing positive to report. Nor had Mergen at any time over the years, though his experiences had been dramatically different from Swan's. Mergen had experienced the glittering plane in two worlds at once. Swan seemed to have experienced the version in our world in sharper focus. Even after so many years, he could describe particular landmarks in exquisite detail. How come you never talked about this before? I never hit it, Sleepy. But there just don't seem to be much percentage in volunteering anything in this world. If I admit anything I know about that place, next thing I'll know is good old Willow Swan is elected to go back up there as the guide for a gang of invaders guaranteed to irritate the shit out of whatever spirits haunt the place. Am I right, or am I right? You aren't as stupid as you let on. I thought you didn't see any spirits. Not the way Mergen claimed he saw them. 
but that don't mean I didn't feel them creeping around. You'll find out. You try to sleep at night when you feel hungry shadows calling you from a few feet away. It's like being inside a zoo with all the predators in the world slavering just the other side of the bars. Bars that you can't see and can't even feel and so have no way of knowing if they're trustworthy. And all this jabber ain't doing my nerves any good at all neither, sleepy. We may never have to go up there, Swan, if the key we've got is a fake or isn't any good anymore. Then there won't be anything we can do but maybe set up your brewery and pretend we never heard of the Protector or the Radisha or the Black Company. Be still my heart. You know goddamn well that thing's going to be the true key. Your god, my gods, somebody's gods have got a boner for Willow Swan, and they're going to keep making sure that whatever happens, it's going to be the worst possible thing, and it's going to happen to me. I ought to run out on you now. I ought to turn you into the nearest royal official. Only that would let Soulcatcher know that I'm still alive. Then she'd get real nasty, asking me why I didn't turn you in three, four months ago. Not to mention you'd probably get yourself dead long before you could unearth an official who cared enough to listen to you. There's that, too. Doge came back with the weapons. We passed them around. Resumed traveling. Swan continued eloquently describing himself as the firstborn son of misfortune. He went through these spells of high drama. A half mile down the road we encountered a small peasant's market. A few old folks and youngsters who could not contribute much on the farm waited to take advantage of travelers still shaking from the miseries of the mountains. Fresh foods in season were their hot sellers, but they retailed gossip at no charge as long as you contributed a few snippets of your own. They found doings beyond the Don de Presh particularly intriguing. I asked a young girl, who looked like she could be the little sister of the customs official back up the road. Do you remember many of the people who came through here? My father was supposed to have come down ahead of us, to find us a place to settle. I proceeded to describe Narion Singh in detail. The child was a light-hearted thing, without a care or concern. Chances are she did not recall what she had eaten for breakfast. She did not remember Narion, but went off to find someone who might. Where was she when I was young enough to get married? Swan grumbled. She'll be pretty when she's older. And she doesn't have a brain in her head to complicate things. Buy her. Bring her along. Raise her upright. I'm not as pretty as I used to be. I tried to think of someone who was. Not even Sara qualified. I waited. Swan muttered. Doge and Goda wandered around, uncle swapping tails and mother examining the wares for sale. Except for the produce, those were feeble. She did acquire a scrawny chicken. The one positive of our travel team was that there were no Goonie or Shadar to complicate mealtime. Only Goda, who kept trying to do the cooking, Maybe I could murder the chicken in her sleep and get it roasted before she woke up. The girl brought a very old man. He was no help either. He seemed interested only in telling me what he thought I wanted to hear. But it did seem possible that Narion had come through the past some time before we had. I hoped Mergen was on the job and had alerted the others to the possibilities. Doge and Goda headed on down the road before I finished with the locals, surprised that my command of the language was adequate to the task. Evidently, Goda was tired of riding. The donkey certainly could use the brake. Is that a pet? The small girl asked. It's a donkey, I said, really astonished that I had been having so little trouble communicating. They had donkeys down here, did they not? I know that. I meant the bird. Huh? Well, the white crow was perched on the donkey's pack. It winked. It laughed. It said, Sister! Sister! and flapped into the air, then glided on down the mountain. Swan said, I was just thinking I found an upside to this trip. It's not raining down here. Maybe I'll see if they'll let me have the child in exchange for your strong back. We're getting a little too domestic here, good wife. 
Sleepy? Didn't you ever have a real name? Anya Nyadir, the lost princess of Jaikur. But even now my wicked stepmother has discovered that I still live and has summoned the princes of the Rakshasas to bargain with them for my murder. Hey, I'm kidding. I'm sleepy. And you've known me practically since I started being sleepy. Off and on. So just let it be. Chapter 59 Once we cleared the mountains, it was no long journey to the site of Kialune. Incredible destruction had been wrought there during the Shadow Master Wars, then during the Kialune Wars between the Radisha and those who chose to keep faith with the Black Company. A pity most of the wreckage had been cleared away even before Soulcatcher decided she would declare victory and go north to claim her new place as protector of all the Taglias. The Radisha should have seen it at its worst. To understand what she had wrought by betraying her contract with the company. But the worst now existed only in the memories of survivors. The once clamorous valley now boasted a sizable town and a checkerboard of new farms peopled by a mixture of natives, former prisoners of war, and deserters from every conceivable faction. Peace had broken out, and was being enthusiastically exploited on the presumption that it could not possibly last. The transition from the old Kielune, once called Shadow Catch, and the new, simply called the New Town, saw one thing remain unchanged. Over there on the far slope of the valley, miles and miles away, beyond the crumbled, brush-strewn ruins of once mighty Overlook, where the land quickly changed from rich green to almost barren brown, was the dreaded thing called the Shadow Gate. It did not stand out, but I felt its call. I told my companions, We have to be careful not to get in a hurry now. Haste could be deadly. The Shadow Gate was not just the only way we could get up onto the plain to go free the captured. It was also the only portal through which the shadows imprisoned up there could escape and begin treating the whole world the way their cousins had the destitute of Taglios. And that gate was in tender shape. The shadow masters had endured and weakened it badly when gaining access to the shadows they enslaved. We're in complete agreement on that, Uncle Doge replied. All the lore emphasizes the need for caution. There had been some disagreement between us lately. He had resumed his romance with the idea of the company analyst becoming his understudy and the peculiar role he played among the Nguyen Bo. The company analyst, who had no great interest in the job, but Doge was one of those people who just have grave difficulties getting their minds around the concept. No. That's new, I said indicating a small structure a quarter mile below the shadow gate beside the road. And I don't like its looks. It was hard to tell from so far, but the structure looked like a small fortification built of stones salvaged from the rubble of Overlook. Doge grunted. A potential complication. Swan observed. We keep standing around looking like spies. Somebody's going to get unpleasant with us. A point not without substance although those in charge seemed awfully lax. It was obvious that trouble had not visited in a while, quite probably not since the Black Company left. Somebody, probably named me, because I'm the only one here who looks like what she says she is, will have to go scout around. The original plan had been for everybody to camp in the barrens not far downhill from where that new structure now stood. I was troubled. Someone should have been watching for us to come out of the mountains. I hoped that was just Sarah's oversight. She had been married to the company for an age, but never did learn to think like a soldier. If nobody offered good advice, or she chose to ignore the advice she was given because, like many civilians, she could not grasp why all the little horse-pucky things have to be done, she might not have thought it important to watch for us. I prayed it was as simple as that. Nobody demanded that I give them the role of scout. Poor me. More sore feet, while the rest of them loafed around in the shade of young pines. 
The white crow materialized minutes after I turned the knee of a hill, and the others were out of sight. It swooped at me and squawked. It swooped at me again. I tried to swat it like it was some huge, really annoying bug. It laughed and came back, now squawking what sounded like words. I got it. Finally. The bird wanted me to follow it. Lead on, fell harbinger, never forgetting that I'm not Goonie, and therefore hobbled by no holy ban against eating meat. I had enjoyed, if that is the proper word, crow stew several times during the lowest lows of my military career. The crow had only my interests at heart. It led me straight to a large tent village on a hillside overlooking the near outskirts of the new town. Our people had to be only some of the refugees housed there, but Sarah's hand was obvious everywhere. The layout was neat and orderly and clean, exactly as the captain's rules insisted, though those are honored mainly in the breach when he is not around. I suffered an immediate conflict. Charge ahead to see everyone I had missed for months, or run back and collect my traveling companions. Once I started grabbing, it might be hours before... My choice got made for me. Tobo spotted me. My first warning was a shout. Sleepy! A mass of churning arms and legs charged in from the left and collected me in a totally unexpected hug. I wriggled loose. You've grown! A lot. He was taller than me now, and his voice had deepened. You won't be able to be shiki anymore. The great men of Taglios will be brokenhearted. Goblin says it's time I start breaking the girls' hearts anyway. There was not much doubt that he would have the power to do that. He was going to be a handsome man who had no lack of confidence. Uncharacteristically, I slipped an arm around his waist and walked down toward where other familiar faces had begun to appear. How was your journey? Mostly kind of fun except when they made me study, which was about all the time. Sri Surendranath is worse than Goblin, but he says I could be a scholar. So Mother always backs them up whenever anybody wants to make me study. But we got to see a lot of neat things. There was this temple in Pryferbed that was completely covered with carvings of people doing it all different ways. Oh, I'm sorry. He reddened. Tobo had a mental image of me as a sort of chaste nun, and most of my adult life would not contradict that view. But I am not against interpersonal adventures. I am just not interested myself. Probably because Swan insists, I have not yet run into the man whose animal presence completely overwhelms my intellectual reluctance. Swan being a leading authority in his own mind. He keeps volunteering. Who knows... Maybe someday I will become curious enough to experiment, just to find out if I can be touched without running away to my place to hide. Now the others were wishing me welcome, with a sincerity that set another place inside me, a small, warm place all aglow. My comrades, my brothers, all kinds of rattle and chatter inundated me. Now we were going to do something. Now we were going to get somewhere. Now we were going to kick some ass if we had to. Sleepy was here to figure it all out and tell everybody where and when to stick the knife. God knows all the secrets and all the jokes, I said. And I wish he'd share the secret of the joke that explains why he created such a scruffy bunch of hired killers. I used a little finger to get rid of a tear before anybody realized that it was not raining. You guys look pretty fat for having been on the road so long. Somebody said, Shit! We've been here waiting for you for a whole fucking month. Some of us. The slowest ones got here last week. How's one eye doing? I asked as Sara wriggled through the throng. He's fucked up, a voice volunteered. How'd you know? I exchanged hugs with Sara. She said, We were starting to worry. A question clung to the edge of her statement. Tobo, your grandmother and Uncle Doge are waiting in the woods back up the road. Run up and tell them to come on down. Where are the rest? Somebody demanded. 
Swan is with them. The rest are behind us somewhere. We broke up into three groups after we reached the highlands. There were crows around. We didn't want to give them anything obvious to watch. We did the same thing after we left the barges, Sara told me. Did you see many crows? We saw only a few. They might not have been the protectors. The white one keeps turning up. We saw it too. Are you hungry? You kidding? I've been eating your mother's cooking since we left Jaikur. I looked around. People were watching who were not black company. They might only be refugees too, but the enthusiasm of my reception was sure to cause talk. Sarah laughed. It sounded more like the laughter of relief than that of good humor. How is mother? I think there's something wrong, Sarah. She stopped being nasty, bitter old Kai Goda. Most of the time she's lost inside herself. And those times when she is completely aware, she almost has manners. In here. Sarah lifted a tent flap. It was the largest tent in the encampment. And Uncle Doge? A step slower, but still Uncle Doge. He wants me to turn Yuang Bo and be his apprentice, like I have a lot of free time being Mergen's apprentice. He says it's just because he doesn't have anybody else to pass his responsibilities on to, whatever they are. He seems to think I should sign on before he tells me what for. Did you get the key? We did. Uncle Doge has it in his pack. But Singh got away. Not unexpectedly. Did he turn up here? We picked up rumors along the way that gave me the idea that he was ahead of us and gaining ground. You do still have the girl. Sarah nodded. But she's a handful. I think bringing her south again put her in closer touch with Kina. Common sense tells me we should break our promise and kill her. She settled on a cushion. I'm glad you're here. I'm completely worn out. Keeping these people under control when there's so little for them to do. It's a miracle that we haven't had any major incidents. I bought a farm. You what? I bought a farm. Not far from the Shadow Gate. They tell me the soil is lousy. But it's a place where most of the men can stay out of sight and keep out of trouble. And even stay busy building houses or working the ground, so we'll eventually be self-supporting. Half the gang is over there now. Most of these guys here would be too, except that Mergen said you were going to arrive today. You made good time. We didn't expect you for several more hours. Does that mean you're all caught up on what's going on in the world outside? I have a particularly talented husband who doesn't always share everything with me, and I don't always share him with the others. And we both probably shouldn't be that way. There's a thousand things we need to talk about, Sleepy. I don't know where to start. So why not just with... How are you? Chapter 60 The Brotherhood had to begin moving. Goblin burst into the tent uninvited and gasped out the news that Mergen said my fetid arrival had caught the eyes of official informants and had aroused the suspicions of the local authorities. Those folks had been disinclined to investigate the refugee camp before, only due to a complete lack of ambition. I sent Kendo and a dozen men to secure the southern end of the pass through the Dondepreche, both to guarantee a favorable welcome for those coming down behind me and to help keep anyone from strolling off northward with news about where we were. I sent several small teams off to capture senior officers and officials before they could become organized. There was no real fixed, solid governmental structure here because the protector favored the rule of limited anarchy. It was obvious that these former Shadowlands, despite their proximity to the glittering plain, were no more than an afterthought to the powers in Taglios. The troubles in the region had been settled with a vengeance. The great general had won the reputation he had desired. There were few troops and no officials of any renown here now. It looked like a safe, remote province suitable for rusticating human embarrassments deemed not worth exterminating. 
Even so, region-wide, there were many more of them than there were of us, and we were out of battle practice ourselves. Brains, speed, and ferocity would have to sustain us till we gathered the whole clan and completed preparations to follow the road up the south side of the valley. So, now you've had your power fix and you've got time to talk. How the hell are you, Sleepy? Goblin asked. He looked exhausted. Worn to the bone from traveling, but still full of vinegar. It's nice to talk to somebody where I don't have to lean over backwards to look them in the eye. Walk in the goddamn door talking that shit. I knew there was a reason I didn't miss you. You say the sweetest things. How's one eye? Getting better. Having go to here will hurry it up. But he's never going to be completely right. He's going to be slow and shaky and have spells where he'll have trouble remembering what he's doing. And he'll always have trouble communicating, especially when he's excited. I nodded, took a deep breath, said, And it's going to happen again, isn't it? It could. It often does. It doesn't have to, though. He rubbed his forehead. Headache. I need some sleep. You can drive yourself crazy trying to deal with something like this. If you need sleep, you'd better get it now. Things are starting to happen. We'll need you fresh when it gets exciting. I knew there was another reason I didn't miss you. You haven't been here long enough to blow your nose, and already people and things are flying all over, getting ready to beat each other in the head. It's my perky personality. Think I should visit one eye? Up to you. But he'll be heartbroken if you don't. He's probably already all bent out of shape because you came and saw me first. I asked how to find one eye and left Goblin. I noted that refugee is not associated with the company were sneaking out of the camp. There were signs of excitement over in the new town, too. Gota, Doge, and Swan were nearing the camp from the uphill side. Tobo lurked around them like an excited pup. I wondered where Swan would stand once the real excitement started. He would stay neutral as long as he could, probably. You look better than I expected, I told One Eye, who was actually doing something when I ducked into his tent. That spear? I thought you lost it ages ago. The weapon in question was an elaborately carved and decorated artifact of extreme magical potency that he had begun crafting back during the Siege of Jaikur. Its designated target then had been the Shadow Master's Shadow Spinner. Later, he had continued improving it so he could use it against Long Shadow. That spear was so darkly beautiful that it seemed a sin to use it just to kill someone. One Eye took his time collecting himself. He looked up at me. There was less of him than there was when last I had seen him and even then he had been just a shell of the one eye I remembered from when I was young. No. Just that one word. None of the usual creative invective or accusations and insults. He did not want to embarrass himself. The results of the stroke were more crippling emotionally than physically. He had been master of his surroundings for two hundred years, far beyond the dreams of men but now he could not count on being able to speak a complete coherent sentence. I'm here. I've got the key. And things have begun to happen already. One eye nodded slowly. I hope he understood. There had been a woman in Jaikur. She was a hundred nineteen when she died, they said. In all my years, I never saw her do anything but sit in a chair and drool. She understood nothing anyone said to her. She had to be changed like a baby. She had to be fed like a baby. I did not want that to happen to one eye. He was old and cantankerous and a major pain, more often than not, but he was a fixture of my universe. He was my brother. That other woman... That married one. She does not have the fire. His words were a ghost of speech. When he talked, 
His hands shook too badly to hold his tools. She's afraid to succeed. And afraid not to. You are busy, little girl. He beamed because he had gotten that out without much trouble. You do what you must. But I have to talk to you again. Soon. Before this happens to me again. He spoke slowly and with great care. You are the one. He was tiring. So great was his mental effort. He beckoned me closer, murmured, Soldiers live and wonder why. Someone threw the tent flap back. Brilliant light burst inside. I knew it was Goda without being able to see. Her odor preceded her. Try not to make him talk too much. He's worn out. I have seen this problem before. Cold, yet civil. More animated than she had been for some time, but still not the caustic, frequently irrational Goda of last year. I will be of more value here. Her accent was much less heavy than usual. Go kill someone, stone soldier. Been a while since anybody called me that. Goda bowed mockingly as she waddled past. Born warrior, soldier of darkness, go forth and conjure the children of the dead from the land of unknown shadows. All evil dies there an endless death. I stepped outside, baffled. What was that all about? Behind me. Calling the heaven and the earth and the day and the night. I thought I had heard that formula before, but could not recall the place or the context. Surely it was some time when a person of the Nguyen Bo conviction was being particularly cryptic. The excitement had increased. Someone had stolen some horses already, had acquired them. Let us not leap too far with our conclusions. Several riders were charging around, unguided by any rational plan. Something should have been in place for a situation like this. I grumbled. This is what happens when nobody wants to take charge. You three men, get over here. What in the name of God are you doing? After listening to their hemming and hawing, I gave some orders. They galloped off with messages. I murmured, There is no God but God. God is the Almighty, boundless in mercy. Show mercy unto me, O Lord of the seasons. Let mine enemies be even more confused than my friends. I felt like I was inside the eye of a storm of screw-ups. My fault? All I did was show up. If I was likely to have that effect, someone should have met me away from witnesses and led me to Sarah's farm. That might have given us time to get into shape with nobody the wiser. We really had very little formal organization. No declared chain of command, and no established table of responsibility. We had no real policies other than fixed enmities and an emotional commitment to release the captured. We had deteriorated into little more than a glorified bandit gang, and I was embarrassed. It was partly my fault. I rubbed my behind. I had a distinct feeling the captain was going to catch up on years' worth of chew-outs. I could make all the excuses I wanted about only being a stand-in for Mergen while he was buried, but I had been chosen as his understudy, and the analyst is often the standard-bearer, too and the standard-bearer is generally designated because those in command think he is capable of becoming lieutenant and possibly, eventually, captain, which meant that Mergen had seen something in me a long time ago and the old man had not found cause to disagree with him. And I had done nothing with that but have a good time designing torments for our enemies while a woman who was not a pledged member of the company assumed most of its leadership by default. Sarah's courage and intelligence and determination were beyond reproach, but her skills as a soldier and commander were less so. She meant well, 
but she did not understand strategies not designed around her own needs and desires. She wanted to resurrect the captured, of course, but not for the benefit of the black company. She wanted her husband back. To Sarah, the company was just a means of achieving her ends. We were about to pay the price of my reluctance to step forward and serve the interests of the company. We were hardly more than the gang of thugs the protector claimed us to be. I was willing to bet that any determined resistance we encountered hereabouts was likely to shatter what little family spirit the company had left. We would have to pay for forgetting who and what we were, and my anger, mainly at myself, made me seem twice life-size. I stomped around screaming and foaming at the mouth, and before long had bullied everyone into doing something useful. And then a sorry bunch of ragamuffins trudged out of the new town and headed for the refugee camp like a reluctant flock of geese, honking and straggling all over. They numbered about fifty and carried weapons. The steel was more impressive than the soldiers carrying it. The local armorer did his job well. Whoever trained recruits did not. They were more pathetic than my gang. And my guys had the advantage of having knocked people over the head before, and so had little reluctance to hurt someone again, particularly if that someone threatened them. Tobo, go get Goblin. The boy eyed the approaching disorder. I can handle that clusterfuck, Sleepy. One Eye and Goblin have been teaching me their tricks. Scary idea, a frenetic teenager with their skills and their lunatic lack of responsibility. That might well be. You might be a god, but I didn't tell you to handle it. I told you to go get Goblin, so move it. Red anger flooded his face, but he went. If I had been his mother, he would have argued until the wave of Southerners rolled over us. I walked toward the soldiers, painfully conscious that I still wore the rags I had had on since the day we sneaked out of Taglios. Nor was I equipped with anything remarkable in the way of weapons. I carried a stubby little sword that never had been much use for anything but chopping wood. I was always at my best as the kind of soldier who stands off at a distance and plinks the enemy when he is not looking. I found a suitable spot and waited. Arms crossed. Chapter 61 No grand effort had been made to train these troops or clothe them well which reflected the protector's disdain for petty detail. What threat could the fledgling Taglian Empire possibly face out here at the edge of beyond anyway? There were no threats from beyond the borders. The officer leading the pack was overweight, which also told me something about the local military. Peace had persisted for a decade, but times were not yet so favorable that this country could support many fat men. Huffing and puffing, the officer could not speak first. I told him, Thank you for coming. It shows initiative and a mind capable of recognizing the inevitable swiftly. Have your men stack their weapons over there. Assuming everything goes the way it should, we'll be able to let them go home in two or three days. The officer gulped some more air while he strove to understand what he was hearing. Evidently, this little person had some mad notion that she had the upper hand, though he had no way of telling if I was he, she, or it. I allowed the rags at my throat to fall open long enough for him to see the black company medallion I wore as a pendant on a silver chain. Water sleeps, I told him. Sure, rumor had had plenty of time to carry that slogan to the ends of the empire. Though I failed to intimidate him into ordering his men to disarm instantly, I did buy a few moments for the rest of the gang to gather, and a grim-looking band of cutthroats they were. Goblin and Tobo came down to stand beside me. Sarah shouted at her son from somewhere behind us, but he ignored her. He had decided he was one of the big boys now, and that stinking goblin kept encouraging his fantasies. I said, I suggest you disarm. What's your name? What's your rank? If you don't get rid of the weapons... A lot of people will get hurt, and most of them are going to be you. It doesn't have to be that way. If you cooperate. 
The fat young man gulped air. I do not know what he had expected. This was not it. I was not it. I expected he was used to bullying refugees too battered by fate to even consider resisting another humiliation. Goblin cackled. Here's your chance, kid. Show us what you got. Here's one I've been practicing when nobody was around. Tobo kept on talking, but in a whisper so soft I could not make out the words. In a few seconds, I did not care about the words anyway. Tobo began turning into something that was no gangly teenage boy. Tobo began turning into something I did not want to be around. The kid was a shapeshifter? Impossible. That stuff took ages to master. At first, I thought he was going to become some mythical being, a troll, an ogre, or some misshapen and befanged creature still essentially human in shape. But he went on to become something insectoid, mantis-like, but big and really ugly and really smelly and getting bigger and uglier and smellier by the second. I realized I did not smell so good myself. Which is usually a clue that you smell pretty awful to those around you, since you are not normally aware of your own odor. Like most of what he saw from his teachers, Tobo was presenting an illusion, not undergoing a true transformation. But the Southerners did not know that. I was part of an illusion of my own. Goblin's huge grin told me who was behind the little practical joke, too. He was not too far over the top with it, either. So I might not have noticed had I not been alerted by what was happening with Tobo. I seemed to be becoming some more traditional nightmare. Something like what you might expect to see if for generations they had been saying that the black company was made up of guys who ate their own young when they could not roast yours. Have your men stack their weapons before this gets out of hand. Tobo made a clacking noise with his mouth parts. He sidled forward, rotating his bug head oddly as he considered where to start munching. The officer seemed to understand instinctively that predators take the fat ones first. He discarded his weapons where he stood, having no inclination to get any closer to Tobo. I said, Men, you might help these fellows dispose of their tools. My own people were as stunned as the native soldiers were. I was stunned myself, but remained plenty scared enough to take advantage while we retained the upper hand psychologically. I went around to the other side of the soldiers, putting them between horrors. Horrors they were not yet sure were entirely illusions. Sorcerers conjured some pretty nasty creatures sometimes, or so I have heard. That must be true. My brothers had told me about the ones they had seen. The annals told me about more. The southerners began to give up their weapons. Spiff or wart or somebody remembered to make them lie down on their bellies. Once a handful got it started, the rest found themselves short on the will to resist, too. Sarah could not hold back anymore. She tied into Goblin. What are you doing to my son, you crazy old man? I told you I don't want him playing with... A sss and a clack erupted from Tobo. A claw on the tip of a very long limb snipped at Sarah's nose. The kid was going to be sorry about that stunt later. Uncle Doge hustled up. Not now, Sarah. Not here. He pulled her away. His grip evidently caused her considerable distress. Her anger did not subside, but her voice did. The last thing I heard her say was something unflattering about her grandmother, Hong Tre. I said, Goblin, enough with the show. I can't talk to this man if I look like a Rakshus's mother. It ain't me, Sleepy. I'm just here to watch. Take it up with Tobo. He sounded as innocent as a baby. Tobo was preoccupied, having altogether too much fun playing the scary monster. I told Goblin, you're going to be teaching him that stuff? You'd better put some time into getting across the concept of self-discipline, too. Not to mention you need to teach him not to bullshit people. I know who's doing what to whom here. Goblin, stop it. I was not disappointed to discover that Tobo had some talent. It was almost inevitable, actually. It was in his blood. 
What troubled me was the time of life when Goblin and presumably one eye had chosen to lure his talent into the open. In my opinion, Tobo was at exactly the wrong age to become all-powerful. If no one controlled him while he learned to rule himself, he could become another perpetual adolescent chaotic like Soul Catcher. All part of the program, Sleepy. But you need to understand that he's already more mature and more responsible than you or his mother want to admit. He's not a baby. You have to remember that most of what you see in him is him showing you what he thinks you expect to see. He's a good kid, Sleepy. He'll be all right if you and Sarah don't mother him to death. And right now he's at an age when you have to back off and let him stub his toes or regret it later. Child-rearing advice from a bachelor? Even a bachelor can be smart enough to know when the child-rearing part is over. Sleepy, this boy has a big hybrid talent. Be good to him. He's the future of the black company. And that's what that old Nguyang Bo granny woman foresaw when she first saw Mergen and Sara together, back during the siege. Marvelous reasoning, old man and your choice of time to bring that to my attention is typically, impeccably inconvenient. I've got fifty prisoners to deal with. I've got a pudgy little new boyfriend here, and I need to convince him that he ought to help me talk his fellow captains into cooperating with us. What I don't have is time to deal with the difficult side of Tobo's adolescence. Pay attention. In case you haven't noticed, we're no longer a secret. The Kia Wars have started up again. I wouldn't be surprised if Soul Catcher herself didn't turn up some day. Now get me out of this imaginary ugly suit so I can do whatever I have to do. Oh, you're so forceful. Goblin made the illusion go away. He made the one surrounding the boy fade too. Tobo seemed surprised that he could be overruled so easily. But the little wizard softened the blow to his ego by immediately engaging him in a technical critique of what he had accomplished. I was impressed by what I had seen. But Tobo as the future of the company? That made me real uncomfortable, despite its questionable reassurance that the company did have a future. Chapter 62 I stirred the fat officer with a toe. Come on, hop up here. We need to talk. Spiff, let the rest of these people sit up as soon as their weapons are cleared away. I'll probably let them go home in a little while. Goblin, you want to go face the music with Sarah? Get that out of the way so it isn't just waiting for a bad time to blow up on us? The fat officer got his feet under him. He looked very, very unhappy, which I could understand. This was not his best day. I took hold of his arm. Let you and me take a walk. You're a woman. Don't let it go to your head. Do you have a name? How about a rank or title? He offered a regional name about a paragraph long, filled with the unmanageable clicks that messed up a language otherwise already unfit for the normal human tongue. As proof of my assertion, I offer my inability to manage it at much more than a pigeon level, despite having spent years in the area. I picked out what sounded like it identified his personal place in the genealogy of a nation. I can call you Souverain, then? He winced. I got it after a moment. Souverain was a diminutive. No doubt he had not been called that by anyone but his mother for twenty years. Oh well, I had a sword. He did not. Souverain, you've probably heard rumors to the effect that we're not nice people. I want to put your mind at ease. Everything you've ever heard is true. But this time, we're not here to loot and pillage and rape the livestock the way we did last time. We're really just passing through. We hope with minimal dislocation for everybody. Both us and you. What I need from you, assuming you'd rather cooperate than lie in a grave being walked on by some replacement who will is a bit of official assistance, aimed at hurrying us on our way. Have I been going too fast for you? No. I speak your language well. 
that's not what I... Never mind. Here's what's happening. We're going to go up on the glittering plain. Why? Pure fear filled his voice. He and his ancestors had lived in terror of the plain since the coming of the Shadow Masters. I offered a bit of nonsense. For the same reason the chicken crossed the road, to get to the other side. Suvran found that concept so novel he could think of no response. I continued. It'll take us a while to get ready. We have to assemble provisions and equipment. We have to scout some things. And not all of our people have arrived yet. I'd just as soon not fight a war at the same time. So I want you to tell me how to avoid that. Suvran offered an inarticulate grumble. What's that? I never wanted to be in the army. My father's doing... He wanted me away from the family. Some place where I couldn't embarrass him. But he also wanted me doing something he felt to be in keeping with the family dignity. He thought, if I was a soldier, there'd be nothing I could mess up. We had no enemies who could embarrass me. Stuff happens. Your father should know that. He's lived long enough to have a grown-up son. You don't know my father. You might be surprised. I've met plenty just like him. Probably some that were way worse. There's nothing new in this world, Suvran. And that includes all kinds of people. How many more soldiers are there around here? How many all told on this side of the mountains? Do any of them have any special loyalties to Taglios? Will they abandon Taglios if the pass is closed? The territories south of the Donda Presh were vast but weak. Long Shadow had exploited them mercilessly for more than a generation. Then the Shadow Master and Kialune Wars had devastated them. Uh, he wriggled, but not hard, just enough to satisfy his self-image. We spent the remainder of the day together. Suvran made the transitions from grudging prisoner to nervous accomplice to helpful ally. He was easily led, over-responding to modest praise and expressions of gratitude. My guess was that he had not had many nice things said to him during his young life, and he was scared to death that I would demolish him the instant he did fail to cooperate. We sent the rest of the soldiers home as soon as our men stripped the new town armory. Most of the weapons stored there looked like they had been picked up off old battlefields and treated with contempt ever since by the armorer whose work I had so much admired earlier. I found the man and drafted him. He was a prima donna, a master with an artist's attitude. I figured one eye could tame him. Suvran accompanied me when I went across to the farm Sara had acquired. Poor leader though he was, Suvran really was in charge of all the armed forces in the Kielune region, which said very little for the quality of his men or for the wisdom and commitment of his superiors. But I decided to keep him handy. He was useful as a symbol, if nothing else. When I went across, I insisted that everyone else make the move, too. I wanted everyone not out on picket duty or patrol in one place so we could respond quickly in strength to any threat. I told Suvren, I've neutralized the whole province except for that little fort below the Shadow Gate, right? That stronghold had sealed its gate. The men inside would not respond to the messenger I sent. Suvren nodded. He was having second thoughts too late. Will they leave if you tell them to go? No. They are foreigners, left by the great general to keep the road to the shadow gate closed. How many? Fourteen. Good soldiers? Embarrassed. Much better than mine. Which might only mean that they could march in step. Tell me about their fort. How are they set for water and provisions? The fat man hemmed and hawed. Suvren, Suvren, you have to think about this. Ah. Uh. You can't get in any deeper than you already are. You can only do your best to get back out. Too many people have seen you cooperating already. I'm sorry, buddy. You're stuck. I fought sliding into the character of Vajra the Naga, seductive as it was. It was so blessedly useful. Suvran made a sound suspiciously like a whimper. 
Courage, cousin Souverain. We live with it every day. All you can do is put on a death's head grin and tug on their beards and yank out their tail feathers. Here we go. This looks like the place. A poorly built structure had loomed out of the darkness. Light leaked out through the roof and walls both. I wondered why they bothered. Maybe it was still under construction. I could make out the vague shapes of tents beyond it. Something stirred on the roof tree as I pulled the door hanging aside so Suvran could enter. The white crow. A soft chuckle came from the bird. Sister, sister, Taglios begins to waken. The thing took wing. I watched it fade in the light of a rising fragment of moon. That had been pretty clear. I shrugged and went inside. I could worry about the white crow next week, once I finally got a chance to go to bed. Are any of you guys aware that we're at war? That under similar circumstances, every army since the dawn of time has put out sentries to watch for people sneaking up? Several dozen faces watched me blandly. Goblin asked, You didn't see anybody? There's nothing out there to see, old man. Ah, and you got here alive, too. Which remark left me to understand that there were dire traps out there, held in abeyance only by the alert decision-making of sentries I not only overlooked, but whose presence I never suspected. All I can say to that is, somebody must have taken a bath sometime since the turn of the century. The same could not be said for most of the crowd inside that shelter, which might be the reason the roof and walls were so porous. This is my new friend, Suvren. He was the captain of the local garrison. I blew in his ear and he decided he wanted to help us, so we would go away before the protector shows up and makes life tough for everybody. Somebody in back said, You could blow in mine and... Ow! What the fuck you hit me for, Willow? Vajra the Naga said, Knock it off! Swan, keep your hands to yourself. Vigan, I don't want to hear your mouth again. You should know better. What have you guys done to get ready to knock over that tower over by the Shadow Gate? Nobody said a word. You guys obviously did something while you were waiting around. I gestured at our surroundings. You managed to build a house. Badly. Or a barracks. But you didn't do anything else? There's no scouts out? No planning got done? No preparations got made? Was there something going on that I haven't heard about yet? Goblin sidled up. In an uncharacteristic tone, he murmured, Don't press these issues. Now isn't the time. Just tell people what to do and send them out to do it. I trust the little wizard's wisdom occasionally. Sit down. Here's what we'll do. Dig out whatever fireball launchers we have left. Vigan, pick ten men. Carry the heaviest launcher yourself. The others can carry lighter ones. If there aren't enough to go around, bring bows. We'll go take care of this right now. Vigan, choose your team. The man who had made the mistake of irritating me rose. In a surly tone, he named his helpers. Chances were all of them had irritated him some time recently. It rolls downhill. In the few minutes it took Vigan to get ready, I had the others tell me things they thought I ought to know. Chapter 63 I had the men encircle the little fort. We carried torches and made no effort to sneak. Per instructions, Vigan carried the heaviest piece of bamboo. It had an interior diameter of three inches. He told me, There's supposed to be only a couple, three balls left in this one. That ought to be enough. Right here should be fine. A good archer with a strong bow might cause us trouble. But those were exceedingly rare in modern Taglian armies. Mogabo was a warrior. He believed real men got in close, where they could get splattered with each other's blood when they fought. It was a blind spot we had exploited more than once during the Kielune Wars, and would exploit again until he figured it out. 
Goblin shuffled into position behind us. Tobo did too. They said nothing, which must have been a trial for the boy. He talked in his sleep. What do I do? Vigon asked. Let them have one. Through the stonework, right above the gate. Louder, I said. Stand fast. Nobody do anything until I tell you. The first two times Vigon turned his hand release crank, nothing happened. Is it empty? I asked. It's not supposed to be. Goblin advised. Try again, then. It's been over ten years since it was used. Maybe it just needs to be loosened up. I mused. I'll bet nobody's bothered to keep the mechanism clean. And you folks wondered why I wanted to hire an armorer. Go ahead. Crank it again. Carefully, so you don't lose your aim. Whack! Crack! Crackle! Crackle! Sizzle! Into the distance, the fireball ripped right through the little fortification's two outside walls and whatever lay between them. Stone steamed and ran. The scarlet ball wobbled through the air for several miles more. Gave up the last of its momentum, gradually darkened as it drifted to earth beyond the ruins of Overlook. Move to the left a few yards. Drop your aiming point five feet, then do it again. Vigan was having fun now. There was a bounce to his step as he moved to his new position. This time it took only one extra turn of the crank to get the fireball launched. A blistering, lime-colored ball ripped through the fortification. It hit something significant inside. It had almost no energy left when it appeared on the far side. A gout of steam blew out the top of the tower. Must have gotten a water barrel, I said. Water and the fireballs made a wicked combination resulting in storms of superheated steam. Suvrin, where are you? Two fireballs should have gotten their attention inside, should have gotten the survivors to thinking. Now I could begin placing my shots. Suvrin, have you ever been inside that rock pile? The fat man came forward reluctantly. When he was close by me, his face was in the light. The garrison inside would remember him. He wanted to lie to me too, I could see, but he did not have the courage. Yes. What's the layout? It doesn't look like it could be that complicated. It isn't. The animals and storage on the ground floor. They can pile up stuff behind the gate so you can't knock it in. They live on the second floor. It's just one big room. There's a stove for cooking and pallets for sleeping and racks of weapons, and that's about it. And the roof is basically just a fighting platform, right? Wait a minute, Vigan. Don't spend any more fireballs than we have to. Let them think for a while now. Maybe they'll give up. They know I didn't hurt Suvren's men. Tobo, circle around and tell all the men that if they have to launch a fireball, we need it to go through the second level, preferably low. They'll probably get down on the floor when death starts coming through. Can I shoot one of those things, Sleepy? Get the message out first. I watched him scoot off. He did not expose himself unnecessarily. Faces could be seen occasionally behind the archer's embrasures over yonder. A couple of arrows had come out and fallen harmlessly. I told Goblin, If anybody had been paying attention, we'd have the place mapped down to the last cot and table, and we'd know exactly where to aim every fireball to get the best effect. You're absolutely right again. Just as you always are. Be quiet for a second. There's something going on here. Those men aren't as scared as they should be. As he spoke, I glimpsed a face peeking over the parapet. A moment later, the white crow plummeted out of the night. It knocked the leather helmet off the soldier. I yelled, Everybody wake up! They're about to pull something! Goblin had started muttering already. He was doing something odd with his fingers. Men jumped up atop the little fort. Each had something in hand, ready to throw. A half dozen fireballs squirted their way without my approval. One grenadier went down, but not before he launched his missile. Glass, I saw. 
same type one I had used to make fire bombs years ago. We still had a few of those, too. But throwing fire bombs at us out here would be pointless. We were too far away to be reached. Aim low! I yelled. Shadows coming! That was not a shout that had been heard for an age, but it was one the veterans remembered and could respond to without ever thinking. Goblin was already wobbling across the slope and as near a sprint as his old bones could manage. Still muttering and wiggling his fingers, pink sparks leaped between his fingers and slithered around amongst his few remaining hairs. He grabbed a skinny little bamboo pole from one of the men. It had been painted with black stripes, meaning that its dedicated purpose was use against shadows. Fireballs flew. Some peppered the fortress, some dove after the shadows that spilled out of the breaking glass containers. Suvran began whimpering behind me. I told him, don't run. They'll get you for sure. They love a fleeing victim. There was a lot of screaming inside the fortress. Fireballs streaking through had found human targets. In their way, the fireballs were almost as bad as the killing shadows. One of my men began shrieking when a shadow found him. But he was the only one. Goblin's spell helped some. The quick use of fireballs helped more. Goblin began loosing fireballs from the pole he had snagged, but sent them racing northward instead of toward the stubborn little fort. He quit after only a few tries. He came back to me. They've done their job, those brave boys in there. They got their warning away. He was as sour as a lemon slice under the tongue. So I take it Soulcatcher didn't die when she hit the water. I had heard the news from Taglios, only up to the part where the protector's carpet had fallen apart in midair, with her streaking along 400 feet above the river. The break coming at that point had not been because anyone was trying to make things particularly dramatic. It was just because there was too much going on to have a lot of time left for catching up, especially where Mergen was concerned. Mergen seemed to be employed full-time easing Sarah's frights and concerns. She was one of the ten who were taken, Sleepy. Those people don't hurt easy. Hell, she survived having her head cut off. She carried it around in a box for about fifteen years. I grunted. Sometimes it was hard to remember that Soulcatcher was more than just an unpleasant, distant senior official. They likely have any more surprises in there? I meant the question for Suvran, but Goblin answered. If they did, they would have used them. You thinking about going in after them? Oh, heck no. Somebody might get hurt. Somebody besides them. Suvran, go over there and tell them if they surrender in the next half hour, I'll let them go. If they don't, I'll kill them all before the hour is up. The fat man started to protest. Vigan poked his behind with the tip of a dagger. I told Suvran, if they do anything to you, I'll avenge you. That's a big weight of my heart. Goblin asked, How are you going to avenge anybody, considering you're not going to go in there after them? That's what we have wizards for. This looks like a wonderful opportunity for you to give Tobo some on-the-job training. Am I surprised? Not hardly. For a hundred years it's been... What do we do now? I don't know. Let's let Goblin handle it. I ought to just take a hike and let you figure it out for yourself. I'm tired. I'm going to sit down here and rest my eyes until Suvran gets back. I heard Goblin tell Vigan to put another heavyweight fireball into the corner of the fortification. Along the length of the wall, so all its energy would be spent devouring the pale limestone. There was a solid thump swiftly followed by the smell of superheated limestone. As I drifted away, Goblin muttered something about burning them out. Chapter 64 The surface of the river was not friendly when Soulcatcher hit it, but neither was the impact like hitting stone from the same altitude. Her fall had been long enough to allow her time to prepare for the landing. Even so, 
The collision was brutal enough to extract her consciousness temporarily. But she had prepared for that, too, between curses. When consciousness returned, she was drifting downriver with the flood, head above the surface. It being the rainy season, the river was high and the current brisk. It took a great effort to complete the swim to the south bank. By the time she crawled out of the flood and collapsed, she was half a dozen miles downstream from where she had gone in, which was outside the city proper, in a domain best known for its jackals of both the two- and four-legged varieties. It was said that leopards still hunted there at night. The occasional crocodile could be found along the shore, and it was not that many years since a tiger had come visiting from down the river. The protector experienced no difficulties with any mad or hungry thing. A hundred crows perched around her, standing guard. Others flapped about in the darkness until squadrons of bats had gathered. Birds and bats together discouraged the scavengers and predators, till Soulcatcher awakened and in a fit of pique, sent an entire band of jackals racing away with their pelts aflame. She stumbled toward home, regaining strength slowly, muttering about growing old and less resilient. A tremor entered the voice she chose to inveigh against the predations of time. Eventually, she reached the home of a moneylender, where she commandeered transportation back to the palace. She arrived there somewhat after the breakfast hour, in a temper so foul that the entire staff made a point of becoming invisible. Only the great general came to inquire after her well-being, and he went away when she started snarling and snapping. Though she reveled in her paranoia, Soulcatcher did not suspect that her accident had been anything else until she examined her remaining carpet preparatory to another effort to fly off to entertain the Nguang Bo. Then she discovered that the light wooden frame members on which the carpet was stretched had been weakened by strategic saw cuts. The who and probable why became clear within seconds. She sent out a summons to Jal Barundandi and his associates. Surprise. Barundandi was nowhere to be found. He had been called out of the palace for a family emergency, he had said, just moments after her return. So the Greys reported when told to investigate. What an amazing coincidence. Find him. Find the men he worked with regularly. We have a great deal to discuss. Greys scattered. One bold captain, however, remained behind to report. Rumor in the city says the Bodhi intend to resume their self-immolations. They want the Radisher to come out and address their concerns personally. The news did not improve Soulcatcher's temper. Ask them if they would like me to donate the naphtha they need. I'm feeling particularly charitable today. Also, ask them if they can hold off starting long enough for the carpenters to put up grandstands so more of the radish's good subjects can enjoy the entertainment. I don't care what those lunatics do. Get out of here! Find that Baron Dundy slug! The voice she used was informed with a potent lunacy. Joel Barundandi's luck was mixed. He managed to avoid the attentions of the bats and crows and shadows the protector released when the greys had no immediate success in locating him. But an informer eventually betrayed him when the reward for his capture grew large enough. The lie was that he had attacked and severely wounded the Radisha that only the protector's swift intercession with her most powerful sorcery had saved the princess's life. The Radisha's situation remained grave. The Taglian people loved their Radisha. Jal Barundandi discovered that he had no friends but his accomplices, and it was one of those who betrayed him in exchange for a partial reward, the grey officers pocketing the bulk, and a running start. Jal Barundandi suffered terrible torments and tried hard to cooperate, so the pain would stop. But he could tell the protector nothing that she wanted to know. So she had him put into a cage and hung fifteen feet above the place where the Bodhi disciples generally chose to give up their lives and issued a rescript encouraging passers-by to throw stones. It was her intent that he hang there indefinitely, his suffering never ending. But sometime during the first night, somehow, someone managed to toss him a piece of poisoned fruit 
while leaving his betrayer and a murdered Gray below, each with a piece of paper in his mouth bearing the characters for Water Sleeps. Crows savaged both corpses before they were discovered. It was the last time Black Company tokens would be seen, but their appearance was sufficient to provoke the Protector almost beyond reason. For days, the still loyal remnants of the Greys remained extremely busy making arrests, most of them of people unable to guess what they had done to irk Soulcatcher. She never did get to the Nguangbo swamp, despite having made necessary repairs to her remaining carpet. Taglios became more fractious by the hour. She had to devote her entire attention to keeping the city tamed. Then came the faithful and tattered little shadow that had made its way through mountains and forests, over lakes and rivers and plains, in order to bring her news of what was happening in the nethermost south. Soulcatcher screamed a scream of rage so potent that the entire city became informed of it instantly. Immigrants began to rehearse the wisdom of a return to the provinces. The great general and two of his staff officers broke through the door to the protector's apartment, certain she needed rescuing. Instead, they found her pacing furiously and debating herself in half a dozen voices. They have the key. They must have the key. They must have murdered the deceiver. Maybe they made an alliance with Kina. Why would they go down there? Why would they go onto the plain after what happened to the last group? What keeps pulling them out there? I've read their annals. There's nothing in those. What do they know? The land of unknown shadows? They cannot have developed an entirely new and independent oral tradition since they served me in the North. If it's important, one of them will record it. Why? Why? What do they know that I don't? Soulcatcher became aware of Mogaba and his men. The latter looked around nervously, trying to figure out where the voices were coming from. When Soulcatcher became excited, those seemed to come from everywhere at once. You! Have you caught any of the terrorists yet? No. Nor shall I, unless an angry family member comes forward, because he thinks it would be a good way to get even. There won't be more than a handful left here and those probably don't know each other. I gather, from what I overheard, that they've gone back to Shadow Catch. He had worked for the Shadow Master Long Shadow. He could not get out of the habit of calling Kia Lune by the name given it by his previous employer. Exactly. We're back where we were fifteen years ago. Only now they have the Radisha and the key. Her tone left no doubt she placed the blame entirely on him. Mogaba was not bothered, not immediately. He was accustomed to being blamed for the shortcomings of others, and he did not believe the remnants of the Black Company could offer any real threat any time soon. They had been beaten down too thoroughly and had been away from it too long. They were more military than the deceivers, only inside their own fantasies. Even the comic opera functionaries down there ought to be able to wear them down and bury them eventually. They would find no aid or sympathy in the Shadowlands. The people down there really did remember the Black Company's last visit. The key? What is that? A means of passing through the Shadow Gate unharmed, a talisman that makes it possible to travel on the plane. Her voice had become pedantic. Now it became angry. I possessed that talisman at one time. Long ago, I used it to go up there and explore. Long Shadow would have been unmanned had he known. More unmanned than the eunuch he already was. But it disappeared in the early excitement around Kialune. I suspect that Kina clouded my mind while the deceiver Sing stole both it and my sister's darling daughter. I can't imagine why that rabble would want to go onto the plane after the previous disaster. But if it's something they want to do, it's something I want to prevent. Prepare for a journey. We can't leave Taglios unsupervised for as long as it would take us to travel all the way to Shadowcatch. We don't have the stallion anymore. 
even if it could carry double. Soulcatcher was baffled. What? The black stallion from the north. The one I've been using all these years. It's vanished. It broke down its stall and ran off. I told you that last month. She did not recall that, obviously. We'll fly. But Mogaba hated flying. In the days when he had been Long Shadow's general, he had had to fly with the Howler almost daily. He still loathed those times. I thought the larger carpet was the one that was destroyed. The small one will carry both of us. It'll be hard work. I'll have to rest a lot, but we'll be able to get down there and back before these people know we're gone and try to take advantage. A week for the round trip. Ten days at the outside. The great general had a few dozen reservations, but kept them behind his teeth. The protector was worse than Longshadow had been about suffering opinions she did not want to hear. Soulcatcher said, We'll adopt disguises once we get there and go among them. I want you to keep an eye out for a hammer, so by so, made of cast iron, but far heavier than it ought to be. Mogaba bowed slightly. He said nothing about how difficult it would be for either of them to blend in with the crowd they would be chasing. Soulcatcher told him, Prepare your men. They'll have to keep Taglios under control for a couple of weeks. Mogaba withdrew, saying nothing about the proposed time changing already. In his position, it was necessary to do a lot of saying nothing. The protector watched him go, amused. He did not conceal his thinking nearly as well as he believed. But she was ancient in her wickedness and had studied the dark side of humanity so thoroughly that she could almost read minds. Chapter 65 The little fortress settled in upon itself slowly, as though made of wax only slightly overheated. As soon as I fell asleep and could not interfere, Goblin handed the magical siege work over to Tobo, who did a creditable job of rooting the enemy survivors out of their shelter. The wicked little thing had been taking lessons a lot longer than he and his teachers would admit. The garrison was bringing out its dead and wounded when a shout awakened me. I sat up. Morning had begun to arrive, and the world had changed. What's Spiss problem? I asked. One of my veterans had recognized one of theirs. The devil himself arrived to explain. The guy in charge, that's Kusavir Pete, sleepy. You remember? We thought he was killed when the Barata Battalion got wiped out in the ambush of Kushkoshi. I remember. And I recalled something that Spiff did not know, a fact I shared only with Mergen, who had been the ghost in the rushes while the slaughter was taking place. Kusavir Pete, at that time a sworn brother of the company, had led our largest surviving force of allies into a trap that efficiently took us out of the Kielune Wars. Kusavir Pete had cut a deal. Kusavir Pete had betrayed his own brothers. Kusavir Pete was high on my list of people I wanted to meet again. Though until just now, I had been the only one who knew that he had survived and that his treachery had been rewarded with a high post, money, and a new name. But just seeing him had some of the men figuring it out fast. You should have asked her to change your face, too, I told him when they flung him down bleeding in front of me. Though you've had a better run than you probably expected when she turned you. I held his eyes with mine. What he saw convinced him it would not be worth his trouble to deny anything. Vajra the Naga had come out to play. More and more of the men gathered around, most of them not getting it until I explained how Kusavir Pete had been seduced by Soulcatcher into betraying and helping destroy more than 500 of our brothers and allies. Would-be greetings quickly became imaginative suggestions of ways whereby we might reduce the traitor's life expectancy. I let the man listen until some of the troops tried to lay hands on. Then I told Goblin, Hide him somewhere. We may have a use for him yet. 
The excitement was over. I had indulged in a decent meal. My attitude much improved. I took the opportunity to renew my acquaintance with Master Surindranath Centaraxita. This life seems to agree with you, I told him as I arrived. You look better now than you did when we left the city. And that was true. Dorabi? Lad, I thought you were dead, despite their endless assurances. He leaned closer and confided. They aren't all honest men, your comrades. By some chance did Goblin and One-Eye offer to teach you to play Tonk? The librarian managed to look a little sheepish. Not to play with them is a lesson everyone has to learn. Sheepishness transformed into impishness. I think I taught them a little something, too. Card tricks were one of my hobbies when I was younger. I had to laugh at the idea of those two villains getting taken themselves. Have you discovered anything that would be useful to me? I've read every word in every book we brought along, including all of your company's modern chronicles written in languages known to me. I found nothing remarkable. I have been amusing myself by trying to work backward into the chronicles I can't read by comparing materials repeated in more than one language. Mergen had done a lot of that. He had had a thing about copying stuff over, in cleaner drafts, and one of his great projects had been to revise ladies and the captain's annals for accuracy, based on evidence provided by other witnesses, while rendering them into modern Taglian. We have all done that to our predecessors some, so that every recent volume of the annals is really an unwilling collaboration. I said, we drag a lot of books around, don't we? Like snails, carrying your history on your back. It's who we are. Cute image, though. Doesn't all that study get dull after a while? The boy keeps me sharp. Boy? Tobo. He's a brilliant student. Even more amazing than you were. Tobo? I know. Who would expect it of a Nguyen Bo? You are destroying all my preconceptions, Durabi. Mine are taking a beating, too. Tobo. Either Centaraxita had an unsuspected talent for inspiring students, or Tobo had suffered an epiphany and had become miraculously motivated. You sure it's Tobo and not a changeling? The demon himself popped in. Sleepy. Runmust and Riverwalker and them are on their way over. Good morning, Master Centaraxida. Tobo actually seemed excited to be there. I don't have any other duties right now. Oh, Sleepy, Dad wants to talk to you. Where? Things had been happening too fast. There had been no chance to catch up with Mergen. Goblin's tent. Everybody but Mom thought that would be the safest place to keep him. I had no trouble picturing Sara being irritated about not being able to share the occasional private moment with her husband. When I ducked out, the young man and the old were already settling with a book. I glared a warning at Centaraxita, which, it developed, was both wasted and unnecessary. Goblin was not home. Of course not. He was working his way through a long list of jobs bestowed upon him by me chuckle. I found it hard to credit the possibility that one human being could make so huge a mess in a space so constricted. The inside of Goblin's tent was barely wider than either of us was tall and twice as deep. At its peak, it was tall enough for me to stand up with two inches to spare. What looked like a milkmaid stool, undoubtedly stolen, constituted the wizard's entire suite of furniture. A ragged burrow of blankets betrayed where he slept. The rest of the space was occupied by a random jumble, mostly stuff that looked like it had been discarded by a procession of previous owners. There was no obvious theme to the collection. It had to be stuff he had acquired since his arrival here. Sara would never have allowed him space on a barge for such junk. The mist projector stood at the head of Goblin's smelly bedding, tilted precariously, leaking water. If this is the safest place to keep that darn thing, then
then the whole company is mad with delusions of adequacy. A whisper came from the mist projector. I got down close to it, which offered me an opportunity to become intimately aware of the aroma permanently associated with Goblin's bedding, some pieces of which must have been with him since he was in diapers. What? Mergen's strongest effort was barely audible. More water. You need to add more water, or there won't be any mist much longer. I started to drag the evidence out of the tent. Anger gave Mergen a little more voice. No, damn it. Bring the water to me. Don't take me to the water. If you suffer from a compulsion to drag me around, at least wait until after you water me. And don't waste time. I'm going to lose my anchor here in a few minutes. Finding a gallon of water turned out to be a challenging experience. What took you so damned long? Bit of an adventure coming up with the water. Seems it never occurred to any of these morons that we need to have some handy somewhere, just in case the Royal Army decides to camp between us and the creek where we've been getting it, which is almost a mile away. I just unleashed several geniuses on the problem. How am I supposed to put this in here? There's a cork in the rear. It might be of some use to you to start doing readings from the annals, like they do in temples, the way I used to do sometimes. Pick something situationally appropriate. In those days the company was in service, and so on, so they have examples of why it might be useful to haul water up the hill before you have to use it, and such like. These are grown men. You can't just bully them into doing the right things. But if you start reading to them, they'll have heard tell of other times when the analyst did that, and they'll recall it was always right before the big shitstorm moved in. You'll get their attention. Tobo said you want to talk to me. I need to catch you up on what's going on elsewhere, and I want to make suggestions about your preparations for the plane one of which is to listen to Willow Swan, but the most critical of which is, you're going to have to upgrade discipline. The plane is deadly, even worse than the plane of fear, which you don't remember. You can't ignore the rules and stay alive there. One idea would be for you not to burn or bury the man who was killed by the shadow last night. Make every survivor look at him and think about what will happen to all of you if even one of you screws up up there. Read them the passages chronicling our adventures. Have Swan bear witness. I could just bring a handful of reliables in to get you. You could, but the rest of the world wouldn't be very nice to the men you leave behind. Right now there's a shadow heading north to tell Soulcatcher where you are. She may know enough already to figure out what you're trying to do. She definitely doesn't want her sister and Croker on the loose and nursing a grudge. She'll get here as fast as she can. And aside from Soulcatcher, there's Narayan Singh. He retains Kina's countenance, so he's extremely hard to trace, but I do catch glimpses occasionally. He's on this side of the Danda Presh, and he's probably not far away. He wants to recapture the Daughter of Night and reunite her with the book you traded for the key. Which, by the way, you should take away from Uncle Doge before he becomes overly tempted to try something on his own. And so Goblin can study it. Um... He was a gush of information this morning. All of it carefully rehearsed. There's more to the key than you see right away. I have a feeling the deceiver overlooked something. Doge keeps picking at it, trying to find out what's inside the iron. We should find out more about it before we trust it. And we need to find out fast. It won't be all that long before that shadow gets to Taglios. River and Runmust are coming in. They're halfway responsible people. I'll turn some of the work over to them as soon as they're rested up. Then I can worry about... Worry about it now. Let Swan's sergeant for you. He's experienced, and he's got no choice but to throw in with us now. 
Catcher will never believe that he didn't betray her. I hadn't thought of that. You don't have to do everything yourself, Sleepy. If you're going to take charge, you need to learn to tell people what needs doing. Then get out of the way and let them do it. You keep hanging over their shoulders, nagging like somebody's mother. You aren't going to get much cooperation. You seduced that fat boy yet? What? That local yokel captain. The one who couldn't keep in step if you painted his feet different colors. You got him wrapped up yet? You're zigging when I'm zagging. You lost me completely. Let me draw you a picture. You forget to tell him Catcher is going to stop by. You get him to make a deal. He keeps his job. He helps us out so he can get us out of his hair. When he isn't looking, you fix him up. So when the shitstorm starts, he don't have no choice but to take his chances with us. I have him wrapped up, then. Seventy percent. Hey. Blow in his ear. Throw a lip lock on his love muscle. Do whatever you have to. If Ketcher loses him, she won't ever trust anybody else down here either. Goblin used almost the same language as Mergen had when I stopped to visit again. He found Mergen's advice fully excellent. Grab fat boy by his prong and never let go. Give him a little squeeze once in a while to keep him smiling. I've probably said it before, you're one cynical mudsucker. It's all those years of watching out for one eye that done it to me. I was a sweet, innocent young thing when I joined this outfit. Not unlike yourself. You were born wicked and cynical. Goblin chuckled. How much stuff do you think you need to collect before we go up the hill? How long do you think it'll take? It won't take forever if Suvern cooperates. Never, ever forget that you don't have long. I can't emphasize that enough. Soulcatcher is coming. You've never seen her when she's all worked up. The Keelanay Wars don't count? He must have seen something extreme. He was determined to pound the point home. The Kia Wars don't count. She was just entertaining herself with those. I forced myself to make the visit I had been avoiding. The Daughter of Night wore ankle shackles. She resided inside an iron cage heavily impregnated with spells that caused ever-increasing agony as their victim moved farther away. She could escape, but that would hurt. If she pushed it hard enough, she would die. It appeared that every possible step had been taken to keep her under control, except the lethal step reason urged me to take. I had no more motive for keeping her alive, except that I had given my word. The men all took turns being exposed to her, in pairs, at mealtimes and such. Sara had not been lax. She appreciated the danger the girl represented. My first glimpse left me stricken with envy. Despite her disadvantages, she had kept herself beautiful, looking much like her mother in a fresher body. But something infinitely older and darker looked out through her pretty blue eyes. For a moment, she struck me not as the daughter of night, but as the darkness itself. She did have plenty of time to commune with her spiritual mother. She smiled as though aware of the serpents of dark temptation slithering the black quarters of my mind. I wanted to bed her. I wanted to murder her. I wanted to run away begging for mercy. It took an exercise of will to remind myself that Kina and her children were not evil in the sense that Northerners or even my Vedna co-religionists understood evil. Nevertheless, she was the darkness. I stepped back, tossed the tent flap open so my ally, Daylight, could come inside. The girl lost her smile. She backed to the far side of her cage. I could think of nothing to say. There was really nothing we could say to one another. I had no inclination to gloat and little news of the world outside to report, which might motivate her to do something besides wait. She had her spiritual mother's patience, that was sure. A blow from behind rocked me. I clawed at my stubby little sword. 
White wings must my natally arranged hair. Talons dug into my shoulder. The daughter of night stared at the white crow and revealed real emotion for the first time in a long time. Her confidence wavered. Fear leaked through. She pressed back against the bars behind her. Have you two met? I asked. The crows said something like, We're on the... The girl began to shake. If possible, she became even paler. Her jaw seemed clenched so tight her teeth ought to be cracking. I made a mental note to discuss this with Mergen. He knew something about the crow. What could rattle the girl so badly? The crow laughed. It whispered, Sister, sister, and launched itself back into the sunlight, where it startled some passing brother into a fit of curses. I stared at the girl, watched the inner steel reassert itself. Her gaze met mine. I felt the fear within her evaporate. I was nothing to her, less than an insect, certainly less than a stub toe at the beginning of her long trek across the ages. Shuddering, I broke eye contact. That was a scary kid. Chapter 66 Our days began before sunrise. They ended after sunset. They included a great deal of training and exercise of the sort that had been let slide for too long. Tobo worked with almost fanatic devotion to improve his skills as an illusionist. I insisted upon daily readings from the annals in an effort to reinforce the depth and continuity of brotherhood that were so much the foundation of what the company was. There was resistance at first, of course, but the message sank in at a pace not unrelated to a growing realization that we were going to go up onto the glittering plain. Really. Or we're going to die here in front of the shadow gate when Soul Catcher chose to write our final chapter. The renewed training paid dividends quickly. Eight days after we reduced the fort below the shadow gate, another mob like Suverin's, but much larger, trudged in out of the country west of the new town. Thanks to Mergen, we had plenty of warning. With Tobo and Goblin assisting, we sprang a classic company ambush using illusions and nuisance spells that confused and disorganized a force that had had almost no idea what it was doing already. We hit fast and hard and mercilessly, and the threat evaporated in a matter of minutes. In fact, the relief force fell apart so fast we could not take as many prisoners as I wanted, though we did round up most of the officers. Suvran generously identified those he recognized. Suvran was practically an apprentice company man by now. So desperate was he to belong to something and to gain the approval of those around him. I felt halfway guilty exploiting him the way I did. The prisoners we did take became involuntary laborers in our preparations for the future. Most jumped on the opportunity because I promised to release those who did work hard before we went up onto the plain. Those who failed to work hard would go along as porters. Somehow a rumor got started among the prisoners that human sacrifice might be involved in what we were going to be doing once we passed the shadow gate. I found Goblin in with one eye, whose recovery seemed to have been sped by Goda's presence, possibly because he needed to be well enough to get away from her and her cooking. I do not know. They had the key laid out on a small table between them. Doge, Tobo, and Goda watched. Even Mother Goda kept her mouth shut. Sara was conspicuously absent. She was carrying her snit over Tobo too far, I expect there was more to it than what she admitted, though. A big part would center on her fear of the near future. Right there. One I said just as I leaned forward to see what Goblin was doing. The little bald man had a light hammer and a chisel. He tapped the chisel. A piece of iron flipped off the key. This had been going on for a while, evidently because about half the iron was gone, revealing something made of gold. I was so surprised at the wizard's lack of greed that I almost forgot to worry about what they were doing to the key. 
I opened my mouth. Without looking up, one eye told me, Don't shake your knickers yet, little girl. We ain't heard nothing. The key is this thing inside, this golden hammer. You want to bend down a little closer? Maybe you can read what's inscribed on it. I bent. I scanned the characters made visible by removal of the iron. Looks like the same alphabet as the first book of the annals. Not to mention the first book of the dead, which I did not mention. Goblin used the tip of his chisel to indicate a prominent symbol that appeared in several places. Doge says he saw this sign at the temple in the Grove of Doom. It should be there. I knew that one. Master Santaraxida had taught me its meaning. It's the personal sign of the goddess. Her personal chop, if you want. I did not name a name. I suggested. Don't speak the name. Not in any of its forms. In the presence of this thing, that would be guaranteed to attract her attention. Everyone stared at me. I asked. You didn't do that already, did you? No. Uncle, you don't know what this thing might really be, do you? I had an intuition it was something Narion Singh might never have surrendered had he been aware that it was in his possession. I thought it might exist solely so that the priest who carried it could obtain the attention of his goddess instantly. Even in my own religion, people had had a much more immediate and scary relationship with the godhead in ancient times. The scriptures told us so. But no such golden hammer played any part in the Kina mythology, insofar as I could recall. Curious. Maybe Master Centaraxita could tell me more. Goblin continued chipping away. I continued watching. The process went faster as each fragment fell. That isn't any hammer, I said. That's a kind of pickaxe. It's a deceiver cult thing. And older than dirt. It has to be something of huge religious significance, I suggested. Show it to the girl. See how she responds. You're as close to a Kina expert as we've got, Sleepy. What could it be? There's actually a name for that kind of tool, but I can't remember what it is. Every deceiver band had a pickaxe like this. Not made out of gold, though. They used them in the burial ceremonies after their murders. To break the bones of their victims so they would fold up into a smaller wad. Sometimes they used them to help dig graves all with the appropriate ceremonies aimed at pleasing Kina, of course. I really do think somebody should show this to the Daughter of Night and see what she says. It seemed like a thousand pairs of eyes were staring at me, waiting for me to volunteer. I told them, I'm not doing it. I'm going to bed. All those eyes kept right on staring. I had put myself in charge, this was something nobody but the guy in charge ought to handle. All right, Uncle, Tobo, Goblin, you back me up on this. That child has talents we can't guess at yet. I had been warned that she still tried to walk away from her flesh at night, despite all the constraints surrounding her. She was both her mother's daughter, and there was no telling what might happen when she had to suffer too much stress. Tobo protested. I don't like to be around her. She gives me the creeps. Goblin beat me to it. Kid, she gives everybody the creeps. She's the creepiest thing I've run into in a hundred fifty years. Get used to it. Deal with it. It's part of the job. Which they say you were born to do, and which you did ask for. Curious. Goblin, the mentor and instructor, seemed much more articulate than Goblin the want-to-be layabout and slacker. The little wizard suggested, You carry the key. You're young and strong. The daughter of night did not look up when we entered the tent. Perhaps she was not aware of us. She seemed to be meditating, possibly communing with the dark mother. Goblin kicked the bars of her cage, which rattled nicely and shed a shower of rust. Well, look at her. Cute. What? I asked. 
She's been working some kind of spell on the iron. It's rusting away a thousand times faster than it ought to. Clever girl. Only? The clever girl looked up. Our eyes met. Something behind hers chilled me to the bone. Only what? I asked. Only every spell holding her and controlling her has that cage for an anchor. Anything that happens to it will happen to her. Look at her skin. I saw what he meant. The daughter of night was not exactly rusty herself, but did look spotty and frayed at the surface. Her gaze shifted to uncle, goblin, tobo, and she gasped, like she was seeing the boy for the first time. She rose slowly, drifted toward the bars, gaze locked with his. Then a little frown danced across her brow. Her gaze darted down to Tobo's burden. Her mouth opened and, I swear, a sound like the angry bellow of an elephant rolled out. Her eyes grew huge. She lunged forward. Her shackles gave way. The bars of the cage creaked and let fall another shower of rust. They bent, but did not give. She thrust an arm through in a desperate effort to reach the key. Little bits of skin blackened and fell off her. And still she was beautiful. I observed, I guess we can safely say the thing does hold some significance for the deceivers. You could say so, Goblin admitted. The girl's whole arm had begun to look like it had been badly burned. So let's take it away and see what else we can find out. And get the cage reinforced and her shackles replaced. Tobo! The boy kept staring at the girl like he was seeing her for the first time. Don't tell me he just fell in love. I couldn't handle it if we had to worry about that in addition to everything else. No, Uncle Doge reassured me. Not love, I think. But the future, just maybe. Although I tried to insist, he would not expand upon that remark. He was still Uncle Doge, the mystery priest of the Nguyen Bo. Chapter 67 Things came together nicely after the defeat of the relief column. Mergen said nobody else was likely to challenge us without help from beyond the mountains. Which help, unfortunately, was on the way already. Soulcatcher was airborne and lurching southward in small erratic leaps that, nevertheless, were bringing her closer, faster than any animal could do. Even one of those magical stallions from the tower at Charm. But still definitely very feebly for a flying carpet. Once upon a time, the Howler could conquer the miles between Overlook and Taglios in a single night. Soulcatcher had to rest several hours for every hour she spent aloft. Even so, she was on her way. And the impact of the news on the troops was electric. With only days left, or possibly only hours, everyone buckled down and put their back into it. I saw very little slacking, little wasted effort, and some very serious concentration when it came to honing military skills. Suvren was right in there with the troops, drilling his behind off. Literally. Though he had been with us only a short time, he had begun to lose weight and show signs of shaping up. He approached me soon after Mergen and Goblin began issuing regular reports about Soulcatcher's progress. I want to stay with you, ma'am, he told me. You what? I was surprised. I'm not sure I want to be part of the Black Company, but I do know for sure that I don't want to be here when the Protector shows up. She has a reputation for seldom letting herself be swayed by the facts. The futility of me having resisted you won't impress her. You're right about that. If you shirked because you would have gotten killed doing what she expected, she'll arrange it so you get dead anyway in a less pleasant way, if possible. All right, Suvren. You've kept your word, and you've been a good worker. He winced. You understand what Suvren actually means? Junior, essentially. But you're stuck with it now. Most people in the company don't go by their birth names. Even most of the men who go by regular names don't go by their real ones. 
They're all getting away from their past. And you will be, too. He grimaced. Report to Master Centaraxita until I find something else for you. Your job will be to assist him. Old Baladitya is no use at all. He's worse than Centaraxita, who keeps getting farther and farther behind in his packing because he keeps getting distracted by his books. Centaraxita had managed to acquire several antique volumes locally that had, miraculously, survived the countless disasters that had beset the region these past several decades. Suvran bowed. Thank you. There was a fresh bounce in his step as he walked away. I suspected he and Master Centaraxita might have a lot in common. Heck, Suvran could even read. Tobo materialized. My father says to tell you that Soulcatcher has reached Charanda Prash, and that she's decided to rest there before she crosses the Donda Presh. A few more hours, Grace. Excellent. Means there's a good chance there won't be anything left here for her to find but our tracks. How are you getting along with your mother? Did you make any effort at all? Dad also says he wants you to post somebody with a warning horn that can be sounded once the protector gets dangerously close. And he says you should pull in the pickets watching the pass now. Just in case Soulcatcher changes her mind about taking some time off. That was a good idea. Runmust and Riverwalker made the mistake of being close enough to be seen. I sent them to go bring the scouts home. Tobo, you can't ignore your mother. You'll end up getting along with her worse than she gets along with your grandmother. Sleepy, why can't she just let me grow up? Because you're her baby, you idiot. Don't you understand that? When you're twice as old as one eye, you'll still be her baby the only baby that cruel fate hasn't gobbled down. You do remember that your mother had other children, and she lost them? Uh, yeah. I've never had children. I never want to have children. In part because I can see how horrible it would be to see my own flesh and blood die and not be able to do anything to prevent it. Family is supposed to be extremely important to you, Nguyen Bo. I want you to drop whatever you're doing, right now. Go over and sit on that boulder. Spend two hours not thinking about anything but what it must have meant to your mother to see your brother and sister die. Think about how badly she must not want to go through that again. Think about what it must be like to be her after everything else she's had to go through. You're a smart kid. You can figure it out. When you were around people long enough, you get a feel for how they react. I could see his first petulant inclination was to remind me that I had been younger than he was now when I attached myself to Bucket and the company, which had little to do with the argument at hand, but which was the sort of tool you grab when you are that age. If you intend to say something, make sure it makes sense before you do. Because if you can't think logically and argue logically, then there isn't much hope that you'll have any success with the sorcery, no matter how talented you are. I know. I know. From everything you've seen, the bigger the wizards are, the crazier they are. But within the boundaries of their insanity, every one of them is rigorously mathematically rational. The entire power of their minds serves their insanity. When they stumble... It's because they let emotions or wishful thinking get in the way. All right. I surrender. I'll sit on the damned rock until it hatches. Oh, Dad also said to tell you that Narion Singh is somewhere close by. He can sense the deceiver. But he can't pinpoint him. Kina is protecting him with her dreams. Dad says you should ask the White Crow to look for him. If you can find it, and get it to sit still long enough. Crow Hunter. Maybe I'll call myself that. It sounds more glamorous than sleepy. Tobo sounds more glamorous than sleepy. Tobo headed for the boulder and settled in an approved attitude. I hoped I had planted seeds that would take root and sprout while he was trying to think of everything else but. At least you get to change your name when you grow up. 
stupid. Anytime I feel like it, I can tell everyone to call me whatever strikes my fancy. Crow Hunter gave up her name. She was a failure. The white monster was nowhere to be found. So I went and spent some time with Sarah, even though she did not welcome me right away. We recalled old days, hard times, her husband's lack of perfection, till I thought she was relaxed enough to actually listen to what I had to say about Tobo. The villain himself scored a coup by showing up with an olive branch at the perfect time. I elected to remove myself while things were going well. I hoped the peace would last, but did not count on forever. I would settle for one halcyon week. In a week, we would know if it was possible to resurrect the captured. In a week, we would either be dead on the glittering plain or ready to return as a force of ultimate destruction. Or maybe... Chapter 68 The warning horn sounded deep in the night, when even those who were stuck with guard duty were at their most sluggish. But the man on horn duty was married to his job. He kept blowing and blowing. In minutes, our entire encampment was seething. And I was out there with my heart in my throat, striding along, making sure the chaos was only apparent, not real. Everyone remained calm and focused. There was no panic. I was pleased. Even a little training and discipline are better than none. I ducked into Goblin's tent. Sarah and Tobo were there already, and not at one another's throats. I must have gotten through to the kid. I should keep after them both. In my copious free time. I bent close to the mist projector. What's the word? Mergen whispered. Soulcatcher is airborne and moving south. She plans to arrive shortly after sunrise. She has a good idea where you are. During her rest time, she sent a shadow down to scout your position. She didn't learn a lot more. The shadow didn't dare get close enough to eavesdrop. She plans to don one of her disguises and infiltrate your camp, so she can find out what you're really up to. From the beginning, she's operated under the assumption that we're dead out here even though she didn't kill us directly when she trapped us. She flew out of there believing we'd be dead in just a few days. I expect learning that Croker and Lady are still alive is going to be the kind of shock that ruins her whole century. How fast is she moving? Strike that. You said she'd get here just after sunrise. Is Mogaba with her? That would make a big difference in how fresh she would be when she arrived which would determine the shape of what I started doing now. No. If she manages to get in among you and unearths all the answers to the questions she has, she'll smash you, scatter you, grab the key, then go back for the great general. Mergen sneered when he used Mogaba's title. The fact that we never beat him once, heads up, during the Kielene Wars did nothing to ease our contempt for him as a deserter and traitor. Warn me if she does anything unexpected. Sarah, have you checked on your mother? Briefly. Doge and Jojo are helping her, and One-Eye. I think she was a little delirious. She kept muttering about a noose and a land of unknown shadows and calling the heaven and earth and the day and the night. All evil dies there in endless death. That too. What is it? I don't know. A phrase I picked up somewhere. It has to do with the plane, but I don't know what. Doge might be able to tell you. He promised to be cooperative and forthcoming. But since I passed on his offer to make me his apprentice, that hasn't materialized. My fault as much as his, probably. I haven't taken time to press him. I have work to do. I ducked out. The excitement had become more rigorously organized. There were torches and lanterns to light the road to the shadow gate. A band of our bravest were up near the gate already, arranging more lighting and fine-tuning the colored powders used as road marks. Loaded animals were beginning to line up. Likewise, a train of carts. Babies cried, 
Children whined. A dog barked without pause. Sounds of men slipping through the darkness beyond the light came from all around. Prisoners who had been sure we meant to drag them onto the plane to become human sacrifices were being chivied toward the new town. Some of the harder men had wanted to use them as bearers instead of the animals, disposing of them as their usefulness ended. I had demurred. They would become obstinate and obstreperous after the first few died, and we would not be able to eat them after we ate up the consumables they carried. Not that the majority of us would eat flesh anyway, but those who could would from the beginning. I spied Willow Swan strolling through the mob. He spun off orders like a drill instructor. I approached him. Gone nostalgic for the good old days when you were the boss, Gray? A true genius, whose name we won't bring up in present company, sent all the master sergeants to make preparations at the Shadow Gate. She didn't detail anybody to keep things moving down here. The unnamed genius had to admit that he was right. River, Runmust, Spiff, all the men I had known the longest and trusted the most were up there or somewhere out in the darkness. I guess I just assumed Sara and I could handle everything else, forgetting that I would be sprinting around making decisions for everyone who could not make up their minds for themselves. Thanks. If I don't get a better offer by my 40th birthday, I'll marry you yet. Swan made a half-hearted effort to click his heels. So, how old are you today? Seventeen. That's about what I guessed with maybe another twenty years of experience, plus wear and tear. It's tough being a teenager today. Just ask Tobo. Nobody's ever had it as awful as he does. He chuckled. Speaking of kids, who's handling the daughter of night? Which I don't want to be me. Darn. I figured Goblin and Doge for that. But Goblin's tied up helping keep track of Soulcatcher, and Doge has Goda and One-Eye to worry about. Thanks for reminding me. I headed back toward Goblin's tent. Hey, short wart. Leave it to Tobo and Sara a while. We got to get the daughter of night loaded up. Goblin came out muttering, surveyed the excitement, grumbled. All right, let's get at it. Only how come the fuck we never gave her a name? So what if she don't want one? She don't want to live in no cage either. Even Boo-Boo would be easier than calling her Daughter of Night all the time. Whoa! What the fuck is that? He stared past me, downhill. I turned, saw a pair of red eyes bobbing in the darkness, coming closer fast. I grabbed for my sword, then frowned as I heard the hoofbeats. Then I said, Hey, buddy! Is that you? What the heck are you doing here? I thought you had yourself a job working for the trader. The old black stallion stepped close, lowered its head to nuzzle the hair beside my right ear. I hugged it around the neck. We had been friends once upon a time. But I had not thought we were so close that it would desert Mogaba and track me down over hundreds of miles once it discovered that I was still alive. The creatures had been created to serve the lady of the tower but were supposed to be used to passing from one secondary master to another. This one had been Mergen's before it had become mine. Then I had lost it. You ought to get out of here, I told it. Your timing's really lousy. Soulcatcher is going to be all over us in just a few hours, if we're not already up there on that plane. The horse surveyed my companions and what it could see of the company, shuddered, then, turning its gaze on Swan, the stallion managed a very human snort. I patted its neck. I'm not sure I don't agree with you, but Willow does have his redeeming qualities. He just keeps them well hidden. Go ahead and tag along if you want. I'm not riding. Not without a saddle. Swan chuckled. So much for the conquering Vedna horseman whose pride disdained both saddles and stirrups. Admitting no shortcomings of my own, I still have to observe that most of those proud horsemen were over six feet tall. I'll find you a ladder. 
and promise never to say a word about how those proud conquerors fared as soon as they ran into cavalry who did favor saddles and stirrups. Bite him, buddy. To my amazement, the stallion snorted and nipped at Willow's shoulder. Swan leaped back. You always did have a temper and bad manners, half-ass. Might be the company. Far be it from me to interfere with your sparking, crow hunter, Goblin said. But I thought you had a notion to do something with Boo Boo. Sarcastic eavesdropping mud sucker. I did, didn't I? And I overlooked our old pal Kusavir Pete, too. I haven't checked on him lately either. Is he still healthy? The horse nuzzled me again. I patted its neck. Maybe it felt more nostalgic about our good old days than I did. I can check. You definitely overlooked him and your master plan. Oh, no, I didn't. Not a bit. I have a very special mission cooked up specially for Kusavir Pete. And if he pulls it off, not only will he get to stay alive, I'll forgive everything he did at Kushkoshi. Somebody shouted. A scarlet fireball blistered across the night. It missed its target. It did not miss a tent, however. Then another tent after that. Then the crude wooden barracks the men had built while they were waiting for me to arrive. All three began to smolder. That was Narian Singh, Willow Swan said, stating what two score people had seen during the Carmine instant. And he had Boo Boo. Can it, Swan? I started yelling at everyone nearby, trying to organize a pursuit. Goblin told me, Calm down, Sleepy. All we need to do is wait till she starts screaming, then go pick her up. I had forgotten the incredible array of control spells attached to the Daughter of Night. Her pain would increase geometrically as she moved farther away from her cage. Then, at some distance, known only to Goblin and One-Eye, choke spells would kick in and tighten rapidly. Narion could take her away from us, but only at the cost of killing her. Unless... I asked. The spells have to be taken off from outside. She could be her mother and sister, the shadow masters, and the tin who were taken all rolled into one, and she'd still have to have somebody else help her get loose. All right, then we'll wait for the screams. There were no screams. Not then or ever. Mergen looked hard. He could find no sign. Kina was dreaming strongly, protecting her own. Goblin remained adamant that they had to be close by, that there was no way the Daughter of Night had shed her connection to her cage. I told Swan, Then you gather up some men and drag that cage up to the Shadow Gate. We'll make her follow us. The warning horn sounded again. Soulcatcher had crossed the summit. She was on our side of the Donda Presh. There were hints of light in the east. It was time to leave. Chapter 69 A brutal argument was underway aboard Soulcatcher's carpet as she approached her destination, skimming the rocks, the sun's blinding fires behind her. Part of her wanted to forget about assuming a disguise and infiltrate the enemy. That part wanted to arrive as a killing storm, destroying everything and everyone that was not Soul Catcher. But by doing that, she would expose herself to the counter-efforts of people who had shown themselves very resourceful in the past. Innovation was one of the more irksome traditions of the Black Company. She grounded the carpet and stepped off, concealing it using a minor spell. Then she crept toward the company encampment a few yards at a time until she found a good hiding place where she could undertake the illusion creations and modest shape changes that would render her unrecognizable. That work required total concentration. Back in the brush, not far from where she had sat down, Uncle Doge crept forward, and after having used his small wizard skills to make sure there were no booby traps, demolished Soulcatcher's flying carpet in a straightforward, no-nonsense manner using a hatchet. He might be old and a step slower, but he was still very quick and very sneaky. He was almost all the way back to the Shadow Gate when Soulcatcher appeared, 
looking the epitome of scruffy young manhood. A white crow, balanced precariously in a bit of rain-hungry brush, observed her passage. When she could no longer glance back and see anything damning, the bird flapped into the place where she had changed and started going through the clothing and whatnot she had left behind. The bird kept making noises like it was talking to itself. Soulcatcher entered the encampment where she had expected to find the remnants of the black company. It was empty. But up ahead, she saw a long column already beyond the shadow gate. One man with a sword across his back had not passed through the gate yet, but he was moving swiftly, and a number of people were waiting for him just on the other side. They did have the key, and they had used the damned thing. She should have gotten here faster. She should have attacked. Damn it. Everyone knew subtlety was no good with these people. Hey! They had to have known that she was coming. There was no other explanation for this. They had known she was coming, and they knew where she was now, and... The first fireball was so accurately directed that it would have taken her head off if she had not been getting down already. In another moment, the damned things were streaking in from several different sources. They set brush afire and shattered rocks. She got down on her stomach and crawled. Before she worried about her dignity, she had to get away from the focal point of the fire. Unfortunately, her efforts did not seem to matter. The assassins seemed to know exactly where she was, and her disguise did not fool them for an instant. As a swarm of fireballs closed in, she flung herself into a deep hole that had been a cesspit not that long ago. No matter. Right now, shelter was priceless. Now the snipers could not get her without coming out of hiding and coming to her. She took advantage of the respite to engineer, prepare, and launch a counterattack. That involved a lot of color and fire and boiling, oily explosions, none of which did much harm because her surviving attackers had fled through the shadow gate as soon as she went into the pit. She climbed out. Nothing happened. She glared up the hill. So, even the snipers were beyond the shadow gate now. Nearly a dozen people were standing around there, waiting to see what she would do. She calmed herself. She could not let them goad her into doing something stupid. The shadow gate was in extremely delicate shape. One angry, thoughtless move on her part might damage it beyond repair. She conquered the rage that threatened to conquer her. She was ancient in her wickedness. Time was an intimate ally. She knew how to abide. She limped uphill, urging her anger to bleed off in movement, with an ease no normal being could manage. The slope immediately below the shadow gate was covered with swaths and patches of colored chalk, a carefully marked safe path passed through. Soulcatcher did not yield to temptation and try to follow it. There was a chance that they had forgotten that she had gone this way before. Or perhaps they refused to believe she could recall that in those days. The safe path had entered the shadow gate eight feet farther west, just beyond that rusty, twisted iron cage lying on its side as though it was exhausted and dying. She waved a finger. Naughty, naughty. Willow Swan, damn his treacherous, should-be-dead bones, and the Nguyen Bo family stared back impassively. The pale-faced little wizard goblin smirked, obviously remembering whose fault it was that she could no longer walk normally. And the ugly little woman smiled evilly. She said, I wasn't trying to suck you in, sweet stuff. I did suck you in. She lifted a hand and raised a middle finger in a sign obviously learned from a northerner, Water sleeps, protector. What the hell did that mean? Chapter 70 No human being can jump as high as Soulcatcher did. Nevertheless, she managed to get her heels ten feet off the ground, a gnat's breath, before the fireball ripped through the air where she had stood. I should have kept my big darned mouth shut. Gloating will do you in every time. 
How many stories and sagas are there where the hero survives because his captor insists on wasting time bragging and gloating before the execution? Add another one to the role, where company analyst Sleepy does the incredibly dumb deed and leaves the target not quite relaxed enough. Of course, she was fast. Epically fast. Poor old Kusavir Pete only got off two more fireballs before Soulcatcher got to him, where we had left him chained. It did not play out the way I hoped, only the way I expected. Now Kusavir Pete would have a hard time repaying any debt he still owed us. I caught a glimpse of motion, the white crow plunging like a striking hawk. It pulled out and glided away. I murmured to myself, Sister, sister. I was beginning to read the messages. Come here, Tobo. He was carrying the key. He had supposed to be up at the head of the column, but had hung back so he could watch the fireworks. He was the only one of us who did not have the sense to be frightened, because he was not up where he belonged. All progress had come to a halt above us. He wore a hand dog look as he approached. He expected to be chastised, and he would be later. Hold up the key. But won't that... The company isn't a debating club, Tobo. Show her the key. Today... He hoisted the key overhead angrily. The morning sunlight blazed off the golden pick. Soulcatcher did not show much excitement. But I had not meant the demonstration for her benefit, really. I wanted Narayan Singh to know what he had let slip through his fingers. It was the key, of course, but it was also some ancient and holy relic of Kina's strangler cult. In their glory days, every deceiver company priest had carried a replica. I muttered, you win some, you lose some, Narayan. In the excitement, you got the girl back. But I've got this, and I can carry it. You've got the daughter of night, and you can take her anywhere you want to, if you can carry her and her cage. Goblin and One-Eye had crafted a masterpiece of wicked sorcery. She could not even escape by destroying the cage. Whatever happened to it would happen to her. I was not pleased about having to leave the cage behind, but the shadow gate had been decidedly stubborn in resisting its passage. That could have been overcome by sheer muscle power, but I had not been able to get enough men onto it fast enough to force it through before the fireballs started flying. Good luck, baby darkness, dragging all that iron around whilst you pursue your wickedness. I hoped Singh had left the Book of the Dead hidden on the other side of the Dondepresh, so it would be a long time before the girl and it embraced one another. Long enough for me to get where I wanted to go and accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. That's good, Tobo. Now get back up front and get this mob moving. Swan, tell me about the camping circles and give me your best guess about how soon we're likely to run into trouble because of breaks in the protection of the road. I don't remember them ever being more than a few hours apart. And although we used them as camping places, I think that they were actually crossroads. That's easier to tell at night. Ominously, he added, You'll see. Everything is different at night. I did not like the sound of that. I was still in the rear guard and only halfway to the crest when Soulcatcher found out what had happened to her flying carpet. The sound of her anger reached us despite the dampening effect of whatever barrier stood between us and the rest of the world. The earth shivered at the same time. Uncle Doge was not far away, standing at the edge of the road, watching for evidence of his success. I said, She seems displeased with the prospect of having to walk home. My friend the horse stood behind me, looking over my shoulder. It made a sound that could have passed for a snicker if it had not been a horse making it. Doge indulged in a rare smile. He was thoroughly pleased with himself. Willow Swan asked me, What did you do now? Not me. Doge. He totally obliterated her means of transport. She's on her own two hooves now. She's a hundred miles from her only friend, 
and Goblin's already fixed up one of her feet so she can't run or dance. What you're telling me, then, is that you've created another Lemper. He was old enough to remember that nemesis of the company. I could not contradict him. I did lose my smile. I had read those annals often because they had been recorded by the captain himself when he was young. Nah, I don't think so. Soulcatcher doesn't have the concentrated venom and nearly divine malice that possessed the limper. She doesn't get obsessed the way he did. She's more chaos walking, while he was malevolence incarnate. I showed Swan my crossed fingers. I'd better dash up front and pretend that I know what I'm doing. Tobo? He went ahead without you, Doge said. You upset him. I noted that the column had resumed moving, which meant that Tobo was on the plane already, carrying the key like a protective talisman. I needed to give a lot of thought to the fact that that artifact, evidently considered a holy of holies by the Stranglers, may actually have been brought off the plane into my world by the ancestors of the Nguang Bo. I had to spend some thought on what the key might mean to the last informed priest of the Nguang Bo. Chapter 71 Something beside the road caught my attention just before I reached the crest and got my first close look at the glittering plain. It was a small frog, mostly black but with stripes and whorls of dark green upon its back. It had eyes the color of fresh blood. It clung to a slightly tilted slab of gray-black rock. It wanted to go somewhere, anywhere, but its right hind leg was injured, and when it tried to jump, it just sort of spun around in place. Where the heck did that come from? There isn't supposed to be anything alive up here. I had been looking forward to having the clouds of flies that followed the animals get thinned out when they buzzed out beyond the safe zones and encountered killer shadows. Swan said, It won't be alive for long. The white crow dropped it. I think it was bringing it along for a snack. He pointed. At the white crow. Bolder than ever, the bird had made itself at home on the back of my friend the mystic stallion. The horse seemed content with the situation, perhaps even a little smug when it looked at me. I just remembered, Swan said, for what it's worth. Last time we came up here, Croker made everybody who belonged to the company touch their badges and amulets to the black stripe that runs down the middle of the road. Right after he touched the stripe with the lance head on the standard, Maybe none of that amounts to anything, but I'm a superstitious kind of guy, and I'd be more comfortable. You're right. So be quiet. I recently reread everything Mergen had to say about his trip, and he thought it might be a good idea, too. Tobo, hold up. I did not believe the boy would actually hear me over the clatter generated by the column, but did expect that people would pass the word. I looked at the hapless frog once more and marveled that the crow was smart enough to let it go. Then I hastened to overtake our fledgling wizard. The column stopped. Tobo had gotten my message. He had chosen not to ignore it. Maybe he had caught something from the white crow. His mother and grandmother both were right there with him where he waited, making sure he did sensible things. He was exasperated by the delay. He was already far ahead of everyone but Sara and Goda. Ah, as I recalled, Mergen had had the same trouble with the Lance of Passion. My first glimpse of the plain awed me. Its immensity was indescribable. It was as flat as a table forever. It was gray on gray on gray, with the road just barely darker. There was no doubt whatsoever that this was all one vast artifact. Hang on, Tobo. Don't go any farther, I called. We almost forgot something. You need to take the key and touch it to the black stripe that runs down the middle of the road. What black stripe? Swan said. It doesn't show up nearly as well this time, but it's there if you look. It was. I found it. Come back this way. You can see it back here. Tobo backtracked reluctantly 
Maybe I should have Gota carry the key. She could not move fast enough to outrun the rest of us. I stared on, beyond Tobo feeling a faint touch of that passion to hurry myself. I was getting close to my brothers now. Dark gray clouds were beginning to gather down there. Mergen had mentioned a nearly permanent overcast that, nevertheless, did not always seem to have been around during his nights. I could make out no hint of the ruined fortress that was supposed to be a few days ahead of us. I did see plenty of the standing stones that were one of the outstanding features of the plain. I see it, Tobo shouted, pointing downward. The little idiot swung the pickaxe, burying the point in the road surface. The earth shuddered. This was no devastating quake like those some of us recalled from years ago, when half the Shadowlands had been laid waste. It was just strong enough to be sensed and set tongues wagging and animals protesting. The morning sun must have touched the plain oddly somehow, because all the standing stones began to sparkle. People oohed and awed. I said, I guess this is why they call it glittering stone. Swan demurred. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Don't forget what I said about the company badges. I haven't forgotten. Tobo pried the pick out of the road's surface. The earth shifted again, as gently as before. When I joined him, he was staring downward, baffled. It healed itself, Sleepy. What? When I hit it, the pick went in sort of like the road was soft. And when I yanked it back out, the hole healed itself. Swan remarked. The center stripe is getting easier to see. He was right. Maybe that was because of the brightening sunlight. The ground trembled again, behind me. Voices changed tone, becoming frightened as well as awed. I glanced back. A huge mushroom of dark rouge dust with black filigree highlights running through it boiled up from whence we had come. Its topmost surface seemed almost solid, but as it rose and moved, the pieces of junk riding on it fell off. Goblin burst into laughter so wicked it must have carried for miles. Somebody got into my treasure trove. I hope she learned a really painful lesson. I was close enough for him to add a whisper. I wish it could be fatal, but there's not much chance of that. Probably not. I'll settle for crippling her other leg. I said, Sara, there's something I need you to do. You remember Mergen telling us how he kept getting ahead of everyone when he came up here? Tobo has been doing the same thing. Try to slow him down. Sara sighed wearily. She nodded. I'll stop him. She seemed apathetic, though. I don't want him stopped. I just want him slowed down enough so everyone else can keep up. This could be important later. I decided the two of us needed to have a long talk in private, the way we used to do before everything got so busy. It was obvious that she needed to get some things out, where they could be lined up and swatted down and pushed away from her long enough for her heart to heal. She did need healing. And for that, she had no one to blame but herself. She did not want to accept the world as it was. She seemed worn out from fighting it. And in those ways, she had begun to look very much like her mother. I told her, Put a leash on him, if that's what it takes. Tobo glowered at me. I ignored him. I made a brief speech suggesting anyone who carried a black company badge should press it to the road's surface right where Tobo had wounded it. The public readings aloud I had been doing had included Mergen's adventures on the plane. Nobody questioned my suggestion or refused to accept it. The column began moving again, slowly, as we found ways to bless, if only secondarily, the animals and those who did not have company badges. I stayed in place and said something positive to everyone who passed by. I was amazed at the number of women and children and non-combatants in general who had managed to attach themselves to the band without me really noticing. The captain would be appalled. Uncle Doge was last to go by. That troubled me vaguely. 
a Nguyen Bo to the rear, more Nguyen Bo to the front, with the foremost a half-breed. But the whole company was a miscegenation. There were only two men in this whole crowd who had belonged to the company when it had arrived from the north. Goblin and One-Eye. One-Eye was almost spent, and Goblin was doing his determined best, quietly, to pass on as many skills as he could to Tobo before the inevitable began to overhaul him as well. I walked past the slow-moving file, intent on getting back up near the point so I could be among the first to see anything new. I did not see or feel any particular mission in anyone I passed. It seemed that a quiet despair informed everyone. These were not good signs. This meant the euphoria of our minor successes had collapsed. Most of these people realized that they had become refugees. Swan told me, We have an expression up north. Going from the frying pan into the fire? Seems like about what we've done here. Really? We got away from Soul Catcher. But now what? Now we march on until we find our buried brothers. Then we break them out. You're not really as simple as you pretend, are you? No, I'm not. But I do like to let people know that things aren't always as difficult as they want to make them. I glanced around to see who might overhear. I have the same doubts everyone else has, Swan. My feet are on this path as much because I don't know what else to do as they are out of high ideals. Sometimes I look at my life and it seems pretty pathetic. I've spent more than a decade conspiring and committing crimes so I can go dig up some old bones in order to find somebody who can tell me what to do. Surrender to the will of the night. What? Sounds like something Narayan Singh would say, doesn't it? In my great-grandfather's time, it was the slogan of the ladies' supporters. They believed that peace, prosperity, and security would result inevitably if all power could be concentrated in the hands of the right strong-willed person. And it did turn out that way, more or less, in principalities that did surrender to the will of the night, particularly near the core of the empire. There were generations of peace and prosperity. Plague, pestilence, and famine were uncommon. Warfare was a curiosity going on far, far away. Criminals were hunted down with a ferocity that overawed all but the completely crazy ones. But there was always bad trouble along the frontiers. The ladies' minions, the ten who were taken, all wanted to build some empires of their own, which never lacked for external enemies. And they all had their own ancient feuds with one another. Hell, even peace and prosperity create enemies. If you're doing all right, there's always somebody who wants to take it away from you. I never pictured you as a philosopher, Swan. Oh, I'm a wonder after you get to know me. I'm sure you are. What are you trying to tell me? I don't know. Killing time, jacking my jaw, making the trip go faster or maybe just reminding you that you shouldn't get too depressed about the vagaries of human nature. I've been getting my roots ripped out and my life overturned and a boot in my butt propelling me into an unknown future, blindfolded, for so long now that I am getting philosophical about it. I enjoy the moment. In a different context, I do surrender to the will of the night. Despite my religious upbringing, I have never cherished a fatalistic approach to life. Surrender to the will of the night? Put my life in the hands of God? God is great. God is good. God is merciful. There is no God but God. This we are taught. But the Bodhi philosophers may be right when they tell us that homage to the gods is best served when seconded by human endeavor. Going to get dark after a while, Swan reminded me. That's one of those things I've been trying to avoid thinking about. I confessed. But Narayan Singh was right. Darkness always comes. And when it did, we would find out just how wonderful a talisman our key was. Have you noticed how the pillars keep on glittering even though the sky has started to look like it's going to rain? I have. Mergen never mentioned this one phenomenon. 
I wondered if we had not done something never done before. Did this happen last time you were up here? No. There was a lot of glitter when we had direct sunlight, but none that seemed like it was self-generated. Um, and was it this cold? It had been getting chillier all day. I recall a sort of highland chill, nothing intolerable. Whoa, sounds like party time. A whoop and holler had broken out at the head of the column. I could not determine a cause visually, being of the short persuasion. What is it? The kid stopped. Looks like he's found something. Chapter 72 What Tobo had found were the remains of the Nar, Sindawe, who had been one of our best officers in the old days and, possibly, the villain Mogaba's brother. Certainly those two had been as close as brothers until the siege of Jekor, when Mogaba chose to usurp command of the company. Clear away from him, people, I growled. Give the experts room to take a look. The experts being Goblin, who dropped to his knees and scooted around the corpse slowly, moving his head up and down, murmuring some sort of cantrips, touching absolutely nothing until he was certain there was no danger. I dropped to one knee myself. He got a lot farther than I would have expected, Goblin said. He was tougher than Rawhide. Was it Shadows? The body had that look. Yes, Goblin pushed gently. The corpse rolled slightly. Nothing left here. He's a dried out mummy. A voice from behind me said, Search him, you retard. He might have been carrying a message. I glanced back. One eye stood behind me, leaning on an ugly black cane. The effort had him shivering. Or maybe that was just the cold air. He had been riding one of the donkeys, tied into place so he would not fall if he dozed off, which he did a lot these days. I suggested, move him over to the side of the road. We need to keep this crowd moving. We have about eight more miles to go before we stop for the night. I pulled that eight out of the air, but it was a fact that we needed to keep moving. We were better prepared for this evolution than our predecessors had been, but our resources remained limited. Swan, when a mule with a tent comes along, cut it out of line. Um, we need to make a travoy to bring the body. Every face within earshot went blank. We're still the Black Company. We still don't leave our own behind. Which was never strictly true, but you do have to serve an ideal the best you can, lest it become debased. A law as ancient as coinage itself says bad money will drive out good. The same is true of principles, ethics, and rules of conduct. If you always do the easier thing, then you cannot possibly remain steadfast when it becomes necessary to take a difficult stand. You must do what you know to be right, and you do know. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, you do know, and you're just making excuses because the right thing is so hard, or just inconvenient. Here's his badge, Goblin said, producing a beautifully crafted silver skull in which the one ruby eye seemed to glow with an inner life. Sindawe had made that himself. It was an exquisite piece from talented hands. You want to take it? That was the custom, gradually developed since the adoption of the badges under Soulcatcher's Susan Tree, back when the captain was just a young tagalong with a quill pen. The badges of the fallen were passed down to interested newcomers, who were expected to learn their lineage and thus keep the names alive. It is immortality of a sort. I jumped. Sara made a startled noise. I recalled that something similar had happened to Mergen last time, although in that case, only he had sensed it, I thought. 
Maybe I ought to consult him. An entire squad of soldiers had been assigned to tend and transport the mist projector as delicately as was humanly possible. Even Tobo was under orders to match his pace to that manageable by the crew moving our most valuable resource. Tobo had not done a good job of conforming. Carts creaked past. Pack animals shied away from Sindawe's remains, but never so far they risked straying from the safety of the road. I had begun to suspect that they could sense the danger better than I could, because I had to rely entirely upon intellect for my own salvation. Only the black stallion seemed unmoved by Sindawe's fate. The white crow seemed very much interested in the corpse. I had the feeling Sindawe was someone it knew and mourned. Ridiculous, of course. Unless that was Mergen inside there, as someone had suggested, trapped outside his own time. Master Santaraxita came along, leading a donkey. Baladitya, the copyist, bestrode the beast. He studied a book as he rode, completely out of touch with his surroundings. Perhaps that was because he could not see them, or he did not believe in the world outside his books. He had the lead rope of another donkey tied to his wrist. That poor beast staggered under a load consisting mostly of books and the tools of the librarian's trade. Among the books were some of the annals, on loan, including those that I had salvaged from the library. Centaraxita pulled out of line. This is so absolutely exciting, Dorabi, having adventures at my age, being pursued through ancient eldritch, living artifacts by terrible sorcerers and unearthly powers. It's like stepping into the pages of the old Vedas. I'm glad you're enjoying it so much. This man used to be one of our brothers. His adventure caught up with him about fourteen years ago. And he's still in one piece? Nothing lives on the plane unless it has the plane's countenance, even including the flies and carrion eaters you'd expect to find around a corpse anywhere. But there are crows here. He indicated birds circling at a distance. I had not noticed them because they were making no sounds, and there were only a few of them in the air, as many as a dozen more perched atop the stone columns. The nearest of those were now just a few hundred yards ahead. They're not here to feast, I said. They're the protector's eyes. They run to her and repeat whatever we do. If they touch down after dark, they'll end up just as dead as Sindawe did. Hey, Swan, right now, up and down the column, pass the word. Nobody does anything to bother those crows. It might break holes in the protection the road gives against the shadows. You're determined to put me on Ketcher's shit list, aren't you? What? She doesn't know I'm not dead, does she? Those crows are going to put the finger on me. I laughed. Soul Catcher's displeasure shouldn't worry you right now. She can't get to you. You never know. He went off to tell everybody I wanted those watch crows treated like favored pets. A strange and intriguing man, Centaraxita observed. Strange, anyway, but he's a foreigner. We are all foreigners here, Dorabi. That was true. Very true. I could close my eyes and still be overwhelmed by the strangeness of the plane. In fact... I felt that more strongly when I was not looking at it. When my eyes were closed, it seemed as aware of me as I was aware of it. Once we got Sindawe loaded, I continued walking beside Master Santoraxita. The librarian was every bit as excited as he claimed. Everything was a wonder to him, except the weather. Is it always this cold here, Dorabi? It's not even winter yet. He knew about snow only by repute. Ice, he knew, as something that fell from the sky during the ferocious storms of the rainy season. It could get a lot colder. I don't know. Swan says he don't recall it being this chilly the last time he was up here. But that was at a different time of the year, and the circumstances of the incursion were different. 
I was willing to bet that seldom in its history had the plane ever experienced the crying of a colicky baby or the barking of a dog. One of the children had sneaked the dog along, and now it was too late to change anyone's mind. How long will we be up here? Ah, the question nobody's had the nerve to ask. You're more familiar with the early annals than I am anymore. You've had months and months to study them, while I haven't had time to keep my own up to date. What did they tell you about the plane? Nothing. Not who built it? Not why? By implication, Kina is involved somehow. So are the free companies of Katavar and the golem demon Shvetya. At least we think the thing in the fortress up ahead is the demon who's supposed to stand guard over Kina's resting place. Not very effectively, apparently, because the ancient king Rajernak drove the deceivers of his time into the same caverns where Soulcatcher trapped the captured. And we know that the books of the dead are down there somewhere. We know that Uncle Doge says, without offering any convincing evidence, the Nguyen Bo are the descendants of another free company, but we also know that Uncle and Mother Goda sometimes mention things that aren't part of the usual lore. Dorabi? Centaraxita, I found, wore that expression he always put on when I surprised him. I grinned, told him. I rehearse all this every day, twenty times a day. I just don't usually do it out loud. I believe I was hoping you would add something to the mix. Is there anything? By direct experience, we know that it takes three days to get to the fortress. I assume that stronghold is located at the heart of the plain. We know there's a network of protected roads and circles where those roads intersect. Where roads exist, there must be some place to go. To me, that says there must be at least one more shadow gate somewhere. I looked up. You think? You bet our survival on the possibility that there's another way off the plane? Yep. We didn't have anywhere left to run back there. There was that look again. Suvren, plodding along and listening in silence, had that look too. I said, Although I've been surrounded by Goonie all my life, I'm still unfamiliar with the more obscure legendary. And I know even less about that of the older, less well-known, non-proselytizing cults. What do you know about the land of unknown shadows? It seems to be tied in with aphorisms like All evil dies there in endless death, and calling the heaven and the earth and the day and the night. The last one is easy, Dorabi. That's an invocation of the supreme being. You might also hear it as the formula calling the earth and the wind and the sea and the sky, or even calling yesterday and today and tonight and tomorrow. You spout those off thoughtlessly because they're easy and you have to deliver a certain number of prayers every day. I'm sure Vedna, who actually keep up with their prayers, take the same shortcuts. Twinges of guilt. My duties of faith had suffered abominably the past six months. Are you sure? No. But it sure sounded good, didn't it? Easy. You asked about Guni. I could be wrong in a different religious context. Of course. How about Bone Warrior, Stone Soldier, or Soldier of Darkness? Excuse me? Durabi? Never mind. Unless something related occurs to you, I'd better trot up the line and get Tobo slowed down again. As I passed the Black Stallion and White Crow, the latter chuckled and whispered that, Sister, sister, phrase again. The bird had heard the entire conversation. Chances were that it was not Mergen, nor was it Soulcatcher's creature, but still, it was extremely interested in the doings of the Black Company to the point of trying to give warnings. It seemed quite pleased that we were headed south and were unable to turn back. Behind me, Master Centaraxita's group paused. He and Baladitya studied the face of the first stone column, where golden characters still sparked occasionally. It is immortality of a sort. 
Chapter 73 The people of the former Shadowlands clung to the best cover available, while they watched Nemesis cross their country in a slow and angry progression toward the pass through the Don de Presh. In more than one place, Soulcatcher's appearance gave rise to the rumor that Kadi had been reborn and was walking through the world again. She always did love a good practical joke. What the witnesses saw seemed to be the goddess in her most terrible aspect. She was naked, except for a girdle of dried penises and a necklace of baby's skulls. Her skin was a polished mahogany black. She was hairless everywhere. She had vampire fangs and an extra pair of arms. She seemed about ten feet tall. What she did not seem was happy. People stayed out of her way. She was not alone. In her wake came an equally naked woman as white as Soulcatcher was dark. She was five and a half feet tall. Even covered with cuts and bruises and dirt, she was attractive. Her face was empty of all expression, but her eyes burned with patient hatred. She wore only one item of ornamentation, a shoulder harness to which a cable ten feet long had been attached. That cable connected her to the rusty iron cage floating in the air behind her. The cage enclosed a skinny old man who had suffered several severe injuries, including a broken leg and some bad burns. The girl was compelled to tow the cage. She never spoke, even when the monster encouraged her with a switch. Possibly she had lost the faculty. Narayan Singh had been the unfortunate who triggered Goblin's booby trap, not its beloved intended. The deceiver shared the cage with the large bound book. He was too weak to keep it closed. Wind toyed with its pages. Once in a while, the breeze showed its vicious side and yanked a page away from the book's tired binding. Sometimes delirious, Narayan thought he was in the hands of his goddess, either being punished for some forgotten transgression or transported to paradise. And perhaps he was right. It did not occur to Soulcatcher to wonder what use she had for him alive, not that she was taking any special trouble to keep him that way. Nor did the Daughter of Night seem particularly concerned about his fate. Chapter 74 I managed to overtake Tobo before he sped through the crossroads circle. We're stopping here, I told him, hanging on to his shoulder. He looked at me like he was trying to remember who I was. Back up to the circle. All right. You don't have to be so pushy. Good. The real you is back. Yes, I do. No one else seems to be able to restrain you. As we stepped into the circle, I told him, There should be a... Yes, right here. There was a hole in the roadway surface, four inches deep and as big around as my wrist. Put the handle of the pickaxe in that. Why? If the shadows can get inside the protected areas, that's the direction they'll come from. Come on, do it. We've got a ton of work to do if we're going to set up a safe camp. There were too many of us to get everyone inside the circle. That meant some would have to overnight on the road. Not a practice encouraged by Mergen. I wanted only the calmest personalities back there. Mergen guaranteed that every night on the plane would be some kind of adventure. Suvran found me trying to get Iqbal and his family moved toward the heart of the circle. The animals were hobbled there, and I had a feeling that the plane really did not like being trampled upon by things with such hard feet. What is it, Suvran? Master Santorokita would like to see you at your earliest convenience. He grinned like he was having a wonderful time. Suvran? Have you been getting into the ganja or something? I'm just happy. I missed the protector's state visit. Therefore, I'm all right until some time that's still far off yet. I'm on the greatest adventure of my life, going places no one of my generation would have thought possible, even a few weeks ago. 
it won't last. It just plain won't last. The way my luck runs. But I'm for damned sure having fun now. Except my feet hurt. Welcome to the Black Company. Get used to it. Bunyan should be our seal, not a fire-breathing skull. Did anyone learn anything useful today? My guess would be that Master Santa Rakita might have come up with something. Else why would he bother to send me to find you? You got bold and sarky fast once you got up here. I've always thought I'm more likable when I'm not afraid. I glanced around. I wondered if stupid ought not to be in there somewhere, too. Show me where the old boy is. Suvran had the chatters. Bad for him. He's a wonder, isn't he? Centaraxita? I don't know about that. He's something. Keep an eye out that you don't accidentally find his hand fishing around in your pants. Suvran had made camp for himself, and the older men right at the edge of the circle, on its eastern side. Centaraxita had to have picked the spot. It was directly opposite the nearest standing stone. The librarian was seated, Goonie style, cross legged, as near the edge as he dared get, staring at the pillar. Is that you, Dorabi? Come sit with me. I overcame a burst of impatience, settled. I was out of shape for that. The company continued its northern habits, using chairs and stools and whatnot even though we now had only two old crew souls left. Such is inertia. What are we looking for, master? It was obvious he was watching the standing stone. Let's see if you're as bright as I believe you are. There was a challenge I could not ignore. I stared at the column and waited for truth to declare itself. A group of the characters on the pillar brightened momentarily. That had nothing to do with the light of the setting sun, which had begun creeping in under the edge of the clouds. That was painting everything bloody. After a while, I told Centaraxita, It seems to be illuminating groups of characters according to some pattern. Mainly in reading order, I think. Down? And to the left? Reading downward in columns isn't uncommon in the temple literature of antiquity. Some inks dried quite slowly. If you wrote in horizontal lines, you sometimes smeared your earlier work. Writing downward in columns, right to left, suggests to me left-handedness. Possibly those who placed the stelae were mostly left-handed. It struck me that writing whatever way was convenient for you personally could lead to a lot of confusion. I said so. Absolutely, Dorabi. Deciphering classical writing is always a challenge, particularly if the ancient copyist had time on their hands and were inclined to play pranks. I've seen manuscripts put together so that they could be read both horizontally and vertically, and each way tells a different story. Definitely the work of someone who had no worries about his next meal. Today's formal rules have been around for only a few generations. They were agreed upon simply so we could read one another's work. And they still haven't penetrated the lay population to any depth. Most of that I knew already, but he needed his moments of pedantry to feel complete. They cost me nothing. And what do we have here? I'm not sure. My eyes aren't sharp enough to pick up everything. But the characters on the stone closely resemble those in your oldest book, and I've been able to discern a few simple words. He showed me what he had written down. It was not enough to make sense of anything. Mostly, I think we're looking at names, possibly arranged in a holy scripture sort of way, maybe a roll call of the ancestors kind of thing. It is immortality of a sort. Perhaps. Certainly you can find similarly conceived monuments in almost every older city. Iron was a popular material for those who considered themselves truly rich and historically significant. Generally, though, they were erected to celebrate individuals, 
notably kings and conquerors, who wanted following generations to know all about them. And every one of those I've ever seen was a complete puzzle to the people living around it now, thus a feeble immortality of a sort. And there's the point. We'll all achieve our immortality in the next world, however we may conceive that. But we all want to be remembered in this one. I suppose so that when the newly dead arrive in heaven, they'll already know who we are. And yes, even though I am a devout, practicing guni, I am very cynical about what humanity brings to the religious experience. I'm always intrigued by your thinking, Master Centaraxita. But in today's circumstances, I just don't have time to sit around musing on humanity's innumerable foibles, nor even those of God, or the gods if you prefer. Centaraxita chuckled. Do you find it amusing to see our roles thus reversed? A few months in the real world had done wonders for his attitude. He accepted his situation and tried to learn from it. I considered accusing him of being a Bodhi fellow traveler. I fear I'm much less of a thinker than you like to believe, Master. I've never had time for it. I'm probably really more of a parrot than anything. And I suspect that surviving in your trade eventually leaves everyone more philosophical than you want to admit, Dorabi. Or more brutal. None of these men were ever sterling subjects. Centaraxita shrugged. You remain a wonder, whether or not you wish to be one. He made a gesture to indicate the standing stone. Well, there you have it. It may say something. Or it may just be remembering the otherwise unheralded whose ashes nourished weeds. Or it may even be trying to communicate, since some of the characters seem to have changed. His tone became one of intense interest as he completed his last sentence. Dorabi, the inscription doesn't remain constant. I must have a closer look at one of those stelae. Don't even think about it. You'd probably be dead before you got to it, and would get the rest of us dead too. He pouted. This is the dangerous part of the adventure, I told him. This is the part that leaves us no room for innovation or deviation or expressing our personalities. You've seen Sendawe. No better or stronger man ever lived. That was nothing he deserved. Whenever you feel creative, you just go look on that travoy. Then take another look. Gah! It smells like the inside of a stable here already. A little breeze wouldn't hurt, as long as it blew away from me. The animals were all crowded together and surrounded, so they could not do something stupid like wander out of the protective circle. And herbivores tend to generate vast quantities of byproduct. All right, all right. I don't make a habit of doing what's stupid, Dorabi, he grinned. Really? What about how you got here? Maybe it's a hobby. He could laugh at himself. They're stupid and stupid. None of those boulders is going to make my pebble turn into a standing stone. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or an insult. Just keep an eye on the rock and let me know if it says anything interesting. It occurred to me to wonder if these pillars were related to the pillars the company had found in the place called the Plain of Fear long before my time. Those stones had even walked and talked, unless the captain exaggerated even worse than I thought. Whoa! Look there! Right along the edge of the road! That's a shadow being sneaky. It's already dark enough for them to start moving around. It was time I started moving around, making sure everyone remained calm. The shadows could not reach us if no one did anything stupid but they might try to provoke a panic, the way hunters will try to scare up game. Chapter 75 Despite the numbers and the animals and my own pessimism, nothing went wrong. 
Goblin and I made repeated rounds of the circle and the tailback running north up the protected road. We found everyone in a mood to be cooperative. I suppose that had something to do with the shadows clinging to the surface of our invisible protection and oozing around like evil leeches. Nothing focuses the attention like the proximity of a bad death. There are other ways in and out of this circle besides the one we came in, and the one we're going to use tomorrow, I told Goblin. How come we can't see them? I don't know. Maybe it's magic. Maybe you ought to ask one eye. Why him? You've been around long enough that you should have discovered the truth. He knows everything. Just ask. He'll tell you. Evidently, he was less worried about his friend. He was back to picking on one eye. You know, you're right. I haven't had much chance to talk to him, but I did notice that he's going all out to be a pain. Why don't we go wake him up, tell him he's in charge, and get ourselves some shut-eye? Which is what we did, with slight modifications. After we made sure there was a watch rotation for every potential entry into the circle, whether it could be seen or not. With help from Goda and Uncle Doge, one eye was still capable of contributing a little something to his own protection. Not that he was willing to admit that. I believe Goblin went off and whispered something to Tobo, too, after we went our respective ways. I had just gotten comfortable on my nice rock bed when Sara invited herself over for a chat. I really was tired and uncharitable. When I sensed her presence, I just wanted her to go away. And she did not stay long. She said, Mergen wanted to talk to you, but I told him you were exhausted and needed to rest. He wanted me to warn you that your dreams may be particularly vivid and probably confusing. He said, just don't go anywhere and don't panic. I have to go tell Goblin and One-Eye and Uncle and some others and have them spread the word to everyone else. Rest easy. She patted my hand, letting me know we were still friends. I grunted and closed my eyes. Mergen was right. Night on the glittering plain was another adventure entirely. The landmarks were similar but seemed to be ghosts of their daytime selves, and the sky was not to be trusted. The plain itself was still all shades of gray, but now with some sort of implied illumination that left all the angles and edges clearly defined. Once when I glanced upward, I saw a full moon and the sky crowded with stars. Then, only moments later, the overcast was back and there was nothing to be seen at all. The characters inscribed on the standing stones all seemed busy, which was not something Mergen had noted during his own visit. I watched for a moment, recognizing individual characters, but no words. Nevertheless, I had an epiphany. I would have to pass on to Master Centaraxita in the morning. The inscriptions on the pillars did begin at the upper right and read downward. For the first column, the second column read from the bottom upward, then the third read back down, and so on. I became more interested in the things moving amongst the pillars, though. There were some big shadows out there, things with a presence potent enough to terrify and scatter the little shadows radiating hunger as they crawled over the surface of our protection. The big ones would not come closer. They had about them an air of infinite, wicked patience that left me convinced they would be out there waiting if it took a thousand years for one of us to screw up and open a gap in our protection. In dream, all roads leading into the circle were equally well-defined. Each was a glimmering ruler stroke running off to glowing domes in the distance. Of all those roads and domes, though, only those on our north-south trace seemed to be fully alive. Either the road knew what we wanted to do, or it knew what it wanted us to do. In an instant, I was amazed, bewildered, terrified, exultant, having realized that in order to see what I was seeing, I would have to be at least a dozen feet above my normal height of eye. 
which meant that I had to go outside my skin, the way Mergen did. And while I had wished for the ability a thousand times and the view was engrossing, the risks were none I cared to face when the opportunity was real. I sped a prayer heavenward. God needs to be reminded. I was totally, ecstatically happy being sleepy, without one shred of mystical talent. Really. If it was necessary that somebody in my gang do this sort of thing, Goblin or One-Eye or Uncle Doge, or almost anyone else could have the magic, sparing only Tobo, despite him being the prophesied future of the company. Tobo was still a little too short on self-discipline to be handed any more capabilities. The presence of the small shadows was kind of like that of a flock of pigeons. They were not silent on the ghost world level, but they did not try to communicate unless with one another. It took me only moments to shut them out. The skies above were more troublesome. Each time I lifted my gaze, I saw that some dramatic change had occurred. Sometimes there was an impenetrable overcast, sometimes a wild star field and a full moon. Once there were fewer stars and an extra moon. Once a distinct constellation hung right over the road south. It conformed exactly to Mergen's description of a constellation called the Noose. Hitherto, I had always suspected the Noose to have been a fabrication on Mother Goda's part. Then, just beyond the golden pickaxe, I spied a strapping trio of the uglies Mergen had reported meeting in that very spot his first night on the glittering plain. Were they Yakshas? Rakshasas? I tried to shoehorn them into Guni or even Kina's mythology, but just could not make them fit. There would be plenty of room, though, I did not doubt. The Guni are more flexible in matters of doctrine than are we Vedna. We are taught that intolerance is our gift of faith. Guni flexibility is just one more reason they will all suffer the eternal fires. The idolaters. God is great. God is merciful. In forgiveness, he is like the earth. But he can become a tad mean-spirited with unbelievers. I tried desperately to recall Mergen's report of his encounter with these dream creatures. Nothing came forward despite the fact that I had been the one who had written it all down. I could not for certain recall if his night visitors had been identical to these. These were humanoid and human size, but definitely lacking human features. Possibly they wore masks in the guise of beasts, judging from their frenetic gestures. They wanted me to follow them somewhere. I seem to recall something similar having happened during Mergen's episode. He had refused. So did I, although I did drift toward them and did attempt to engage them in conversation. I did not, of course, have a knack for generating sound without a body or tools, and they did not speak any language I knew, so the whole business was an exercise in futility. They became extremely frustrated. They seemed to think that I was playing games. They finally stamped away, obviously possessed by a big anger. Mergen, I don't know where you are, but you're going to have to spend some time cluing me in here. The ugly people were gone. No skin off my nose. Now maybe I could get some sleep, some real sleep, without all these too real dreams and awful, improbable skies. It started to rain, which told me which sky was the true sky and paramount above the me that lay twitching fitfully as the cold drops began to make themselves felt. There was no way to get in out of it. There was no way to erect tents or other shelters on the plain. In fact, the matter of weather had not arisen during our planning sessions. I do not know why, though it seems that there is always something big that you overlook, something to which every planner on the team turns a blind eye. Then, when the breakdown or failure comes, you cannot figure out how you overlooked the obvious. Somehow, we must have concluded that there was no weather on the plane. Maybe because Mergen's annals did not recall any. But somebody should have noticed that the captured made this journey at a different time of year. Somebody should have realized 
that that was sure to have some impact. Somebody probably named me. It had been cool already when the rain began to fall. It grew chillier fast. Crabbily, I got up and helped cover stuff to protect it. Helped get out means for recovering some of the water, then confiscated a piece of tenting and another blanket, rolled up and went back to sleep, ignoring the rain. It was only a persistent drizzle, and when you are exhausted, nothing but sleep matters much. Chapter 76 I found Mergen, waiting when I got home to Dreamland. You seem surprised. I told you I'd see you on the plane. You did, but I don't need it to be right now. Right now I need to sleep. You are. You'll wake up as refreshed as if you hadn't dreamed at all. I don't want to be drifting around loose from my body either. Then don't. I can control it? You can. Just decide not to do it. It's pretty basic. Most people manage it instinctively. Ask around tomorrow. See how many of these people even recall being loose from their flesh. It's something everybody does? Up here. It's something everybody can do, if they want. Most don't want it so emphatically that they don't even recognize that the opportunity is there. Which doesn't matter. It's not why I'm here. It matters a bunch to me. That stuff is scary. I'm just a simple low-class city brat. Cancel the old wine and toe shuffle, Sleepy. You're wasting time. I probably know as much about you as you know about yourself. There are things you need to know. I'm listening. Till now, you've dealt with the plane well enough by letting the annals guide you. Stick with the rules you've already made, and you won't have any trouble. Don't dawdle. You didn't bring enough water. Even if you slaughter your animals as you go, the way you planned. There's ice here that you can melt, but if you waste time getting here, you'll end up having to kill more animals than you want, and take good care of them while they're still alive. Don't let them get so thirsty they start charging around, looking for water, and go busting through your protection. That'll heal itself, but it does take time. The shadows won't give you time. Then we're safe from the break that killed Sindawe and some of the others? Yes. You'll find Bucket tomorrow. I warn you now, so you'll have time to prepare yourself. I was prepared already. I had been prepared for a long time. Actually, seeing Bucket dead would be difficult, but I would get past it. Tell me what I should do now that I'm here. You're doing it. Just don't do it slowly. Should I split the group? Send a strike force forward? That wouldn't be wise. You wouldn't be able to manage whichever group you weren't with. And that'll be the one where somebody screws up and gets us all killed. You too? There's nobody else who can get me out if you fail. There isn't even anyone else out there who knows that we're alive. The daughter of Night and Narion Singh, though. Probably. They had overheard enough to figure it out, certainly. Which means Soulcatcher does, too, now. But you know... I don't really see those people developing an interest in raising the dead, not to mention that now the Shadow Gate can only be opened from this side. This is the last cast of the dice, Sleepy, and it's for everything. I did not remind Mergen that Narion Singh and his ward had a very strong interest in resurrecting someone who was practically his grave mate. He was right about the Shadow Gate, assuming there were no more keys outside. How did I know you were going to say something like that? He gave me the smile that probably won Sarah's heart. I told him, You should go see Sarah. I already have. That's why I was so late getting around to you. What can I say? Oh, I saw those creatures. The... I did not know what they were called, so I tried to describe them. 
the Washane, the Washene, and the Washone, collectively referred to as the Neff. They're dreamwalkers, too. Two? I'm a dreamwalker. You can see me, but only with your mind's eye, in some way that you remember me. The Neff are out here all the time. They may be trapped, or they may no longer have bodies to go back to. I've never been able to tell. They want to communicate so badly, because they want something badly. But don't seem capable of learning how. They're from one of the other worlds. If they no longer have bodies, they may even be skinwalkers. So be very careful around them. The... the... What are you blathering about? Oh, we haven't talked about any of that yet, have we? Any of what? I really thought you'd figure most of it out by reading between the lines. The company has had to come from somewhere, and it would be hard to scratch out a living on a tabletop of bare stone. So they must have come from somewhere else, somewhere very else. Since the plane isn't so big, you can't walk around it and discover that there's nowhere for armies to come from. The land just gets colder and more inhospitable. I'm real thick, boss. You should have drawn me some pictures. I wasn't keen on having anyone outside, no. I didn't want anybody getting scared to come get me. You're my brother. He ignored me. I haven't slept here, so I have a lot of time on my hands. I've used some of it exploring. There are sixteen shadow gates, Sleepy and fifteen of them open onto places that aren't our world. Or did at one time. Most of them are dead now, and in my state. I can't see what used to be on the other side without actually going out there. And I don't have the eggs to do that. Because I like my own world just fine, and I don't want to take a chance of getting trapped any farther away from it than I already am. Only four of the gates are still alive, and the one to our world is so badly hurt that it probably won't last many generations more. I was lost. Completely. I was prepared for none of this. And yet he was right when he hinted that there were bells I should have heard ringing. What does all that have to do with Kina? It isn't in her legend anywhere. In fact, what does it even have to do with us? It's not in our legend anywhere. Yes, it is, Sleepy. The truth is just so old that time has totally distorted it. Examine Goonie mythology. There's a lot there about other planes, other realms of reality, different heavens and whatnot. Those stories go way back before the coming of the free companies a thousand years or more. Near as I've been able to find out, when the first free company came off the plane almost 600 years ago, that event marked the first time our shadow gate had been used in at least eight centuries. That's a lot of time for truth to mutate. Whoa. Whoa. You're starting to imply things I can't quite get my mind around. You'd better open it up and spread it out wide, Sleepy, because there's a whole lot more. And I doubt I've discovered even a tenth of it. I have a dark, cynical, untrusting side that at times even doubts the motives of my closest friends. Why is it that none of this ever got mentioned until now? This isn't fresh news to you, is it? No, it isn't. But I told you, I want out of here, badly. I chose not to pass on any information that might handicap you. Handicap me? What the heck are you talking about? Kina and the captured aren't the only things sleeping up here. There's also a lot of truths that would shake the foundations of our world. Truths I have no trouble imagining wholesale slaughters and holy wars arising to suppress. Truths I have no trouble seeing getting my family and the company obliterated. They're so threatening. I'm trying to open my mind, but I'm having trouble. I feel like I'm about to plunge into an abyss. Just hang on. I've been out here forever, and I still have trouble with it. 
I think the way to start is, I should outline the history of the plane. Yes, why don't you do that? That might be interesting. You still have that edge on your tongue, don't you? Maybe Swan is right, and what you really need is a good... All right. All right. Listen closely. The plane was created so far back in antiquity that nobody on any of the worlds has any idea who built it, how or why. But you have to believe that it was meant to be a pathway between the worlds. Why the shadows and standing stones and... I can't tell you anything if I'm not the one doing the talking. Sorry. In the beginning, there was the plane, just the plane, with its network of roads that have to be walked a certain way to get to other worlds. For example, every traveler has to enter the great circle at the center of the plane before he can leave the plane again. Back then, there were no shadows, no shadow gates, no standing stones, no great fortress inside the great circle, no caverns beneath the stone, no sleeping gods no captured, no books of the dead. There was nothing but the plane, the crossroads of worlds, or possibly of time. One rogue school of thought insisted the gates all open into the same world, but at times, which are separated by tens of thousands of years. At some time still, in unimaginable antiquity, human nature asserted itself, and would-be conquerors began to charge back and forth across the plain. During a period of exhaustion, the wise men of a dozen worlds combined to make the first modifications to the plain. They built a fortress in the great circle and garrisoned it, with a race of created immortal guardians, whose task it would be to prevent armies from passing from world to world. Then we pass to the edge of proto-history, the age now recalled poorly, as it is distorted in Goonie myth. Those driven to conquer will try to do so, whatever the obstacles. Kina, apparently, started out as your run-of-the-mill Dark Lord type that arises every few centuries, as Lady's first husband was. Only she was another in a line and association of many such, some of whom are now recalled as gods because of the impact they had on their times. The whole cabal decided to beef Kina up until she could overcome the demons on the plain. In the process, she did become what, for want of a better descriptive, we would have to call a god. And she behaved every bit as badly as her associates should have expected, with results more or less like those recalled in the mythology. Once Kina was asleep, her associates opened the maze of caverns under the plain and buried her way down deep somewhere. Then they created Shivetya, the steadfast guardian, to keep watch. Or they conscripted a surviving demon of the same name and strengthened him and bound him to do the job, if you prefer a less common version of the story. Then, apparently too exhausted to recover their greatness, they faded away. So Kina came out on top, even if she ended up imprisoned. Why didn't they just kill her? That's something I've never understood about these squabbles amongst the gods. There's only one version of the Kina myth where her enemies do anything but just tuck her in. And in that one, even after she's all chopped up and scattered around, they leave the pieces alive and trying to get back together. My guess would be she had some kind of dead man spell that entwined the fates of the other gods with her own. Those people wouldn't have trusted one another for a second. All of them would have had some protective mechanism like Longshadow used when he tied his fate into the well-being of the Shadow Gate. But the Shadow Gate doesn't depend on his health anymore. Not as long as he stays inside. I was just posing an example, Sleepy. Let's stick to the history of the plane. What followed Kina's downfall isn't documented at all. But more conquerors came and went, and further efforts were made to dissuade them, while keeping the plane open for commerce. The gates and keys were created. One world gathered its sorcerers, 
and had them steal the souls of millions of prisoners of war, creating the shadows and endowing them with a bitter hatred of everything living. They meant to close down the plane entirely, which naturally led some other race to create shields that protect the circles and roads. Nobody knows for sure how or when the standing stones began to appear. But they're the most recent addition to the plane. Probably put out by the precursors of the multiple worlds religious movement that produced the free companies. I understand that the stones aren't quarried. They're created things. They're immune to the shadows and indifferent to the protective shields. But they're attuned to the various keys carried away during the free company's age. It's too much to grasp. It'll take a long time to digest. Kina is real, though? Absolutely. Buried right down here under me somewhere. I've never been tempted to go look for her. I wouldn't want to accidentally cut her loose. I don't know how I could manage that, but I definitely don't want to find out the hard way. What about Radranak and the Books of the Dead? Where do they fit? Radranak's war on the cult of Kina antedated the appearance of the Free Companies by several centuries, supposedly. Yet there were scary similarities suggesting shared origins. The rise of the Free Companies is actually one of the least well-known, despite its being closest in time. There were many companies over several hundred years. They came from several different worlds and went off into several more, representing almost as many different sects of Kina worshippers. Most seem to have been sent out to explore, not conquer, or to serve as mercenaries, or even to bring on the Year of the Skulls. What their true mission seems to have been was to determine which world should be awarded the honor of being sacrificed in order to bring on the Year of the Skulls. Then a bunch of worlds decided to gang up on ours? Kina spanned many worlds. Her devil tree was almost universal, apparently. And we lost the toss and got to bury her in ours. You're not in our world anymore, Sleepy. This is the in-between. Where you are depends on what gate you walk out. And these days, you have only one choice. Its shadow gate lies straight ahead, on the far side of the plain. It's as if the plain itself is closing down the alternate ways. I don't get it. Why would it do that, and how? Sometimes it seems like the plain itself is alive, Sleepy. Or at least that it can think. Is it where we came from? Is it where the captain spent most of his life trying to go? No. The company can't go back to Katavar. Croker will never reach the promised land. The Shadow Gate is dead. The world where you're headed is very much like our own. To other worlds, it's known by a name that translates into Taglian somewhat vaguely as the Land of Unknown Shadows. Without thinking, I responded, All evil dies there in endless death. What? Startled. Yes. How did you know? They were the people who committed the murders that produced the shadows. I heard it somewhere. From a Nguang Bo. Yes. Nguang Bo de Duang. In current Nguang Bo usage, that means something like the chosen children, colloquially, and nothing whatsoever that's sensible, literally. And the days when their forebears were sent out from the land of unknown shadows, it meant roughly the children of the dead. You've been busy, I observed. Hardly, considering how long I've been trapped here. Try it for a decade, Sleepy. You won't have to put up with any of the distractions you complain about when you aren't getting everything you want to do done. No kidding? Seems to me I'm all of a sudden having to work even while I'm sleeping. Not for long. Whoever has control of that mist-making thing is trying to get me to answer him. 
Why don't you sneak around there and smash that sucker so I don't have to get dragged into it every time somebody wants my view on how to crack a walnut, or whatever else the crisis of the moment happens to be? Not hardly, former boss. I'm carrying a whole bag of nuts myself. You would. Mergen departed as though yanked away. I could have sworn I heard the laughter of an eavesdropping white crow. Chapter 77 How come you're so crabby? Willow Swan demanded when I snapped at him for no good reason. Ragtime again already? I blushed. Me, after twenty years among the crudest men on two hooves. No, jerk. I didn't sleep very well last night. What? It exploded out of him like the shriek of a stomped rat. I didn't sleep well last night. Oh, yeah. Not our sweet little sleepy. Guys, anybody, Roe, River, whoever you want to step up and remind us about the roar and the rain last night? Riverwalker told me. Boss, your snoring made more noise than a tiger in heat. We had people get up and move back up the road toward home to get away from the racket. There were people who wanted to strangle you, or at least put your head in a sack. I bet if anybody else knew what the hell we were doing and where we were going, you'd be on that travoy with General Sendaway. But I'm such a sweet, delicate flower. I couldn't possibly snore. I had been accused of the crime before, but only jokingly, never with such passion. River snorted. So on decided not to marry you. I'm stricken. I'll see if one eye doesn't have a cure. A cure? The man can't even take care of himself. I scrounged up something to eat. It was barely worth the effort and definitely not filling. We would be on short rations for a long time. Before I finished what morning preparations were possible for me, the forward elements were already moving. The general mood was more relaxed. We had survived the night, and yesterday, we had shoved it to the protector real good. The relaxation ended when we found Bucket's remains. Big Bucket, real name, Kato Dahlia, once a thief, once an officer of the Black Company, was almost a father to me. He never said, and I never asked, but I suspect he knew I was female all along. He was very unpleasant to some of my male relatives way back when. You did not want to be the object when Bucket got angry. I managed not to break down. I had had a long time to get used to the idea that he was gone. Though there was always some small irrational hope that Mergen was wrong, that death had overlooked him, and he was buried with the captured. The men put Bucket on the travoy with Sindawe without having to be told. I tagged along and became entranced by one of those unaccountably irrelevant trains of thought that often take shape at such times. We had left a truly nasty mess where we had spent the night, particularly in the line of animal waste. Likely the captured had done the same during their passage along this same road. However, other than the odd corpse, there was no sign that they had passed through. There were no dung piles now, no gnawed discarded bones, no vegetable waste, no ashes from charcoal braziers, nothing. Only human bodies lasted, and they became thoroughly desiccated. I would have to take it up with Mergen. Meantime, it was a mental exercise that would keep me from dwelling upon Bucket. We trudged on southward. The rain came and went, never more than a drizzle, though sometimes the wind brought it stinging in from a sharp angle. I shivered a lot and worried about it getting cold enough to sleet or snow. No other evil found us. Eventually I spied the vague silhouette of our initial destination, that mysterious central fortress. The wind began to blow steadily. Some of the men complained about the cold. Some complained about the wet. Quite a few complained about the menu and a handful insisted on complaining about all the complaining. 
I sensed few positive feelings concerning what we were doing. I felt very much alone, almost abandoned. The whole day long, despite well-meant efforts from Swan, Sara, and quite a few others. Only Uncle Doge did not bother, because even at this late date, he remained piqued, because I would not enlist as his apprentice. He continued his emotional machinations. Several times I caught myself retreating into my away place and had to remind me that I did not need to go there now. None of those people could hurt me anymore. Not if I did not let them. I controlled their reality. They survived only in my memory. Even that is immortality of a sort. We Vedna believe in ghosts, and we believe in evil. I wondered if the Guni might not be on to something after all. For them, the pain inspired by the departure of loved ones is less personal and far more fatalistic, and is accepted as a necessary stage of life that does not end with this one transformation. If the Guni, by some bizarre and remote practical joke of the divine, happened to be in possession of a more accurate theology, I must have been a bad, bad girl in a previous life. I sure hope I had fun. Forgive me, O Lord of the hours, who art merciful and compassionate. I have sinned in my heart. Thou art God. There can be no other. Chapter 78 There were flakes of snow in the air whenever the wind took to loafing. Then each time it found renewed ambition, it hurled tiny flecks of ice that stung my face and hands. Though it sounded fearful, the level of grumbling never reached suggestions of mutiny. Willow Swan trotted up and down the column, gossiping and dropping reminders that we had nowhere to go but straight ahead. The weather did not hamper him at all. He seemed to find it invigorating. He kept telling everyone how wonderful it would be once we got some real snow, say four or five feet. The world would look better then. Yes, sir, he guaranteed it. He grew up in stuff like that, and it made a real man out of you. With equal frequency, I overheard some advice, the fulfillment of which was physically impossible for anyone not some select variety of worm. As often the people cried out, offering up impassioned pleas to One-Eye, Goblin, even Tobo, to fill Swan's mouth with quick-setting mortar. Are you having fun? I asked him. Oh, yeah. And they're not blaming you for anything, either his boyish grin, told me he was not being some kind of unwanted hero. He was playing games with me, too. All Northerners seem to have that capacity for play. Even the captain and lady sometimes had shown signs with one another. And one eye and goblin. The little black wizard's stroke may have been a godsend. I could not imagine those two missing an opportunity for screwing up as grand as this one was, if they were both in excellent health. When I suggested something of the sort to Swan, he failed to understand. Once I explained, he observed, You're missing the point, Sleepy. Unless they're extremely drunk, those two won't do anything dangerous to anybody but themselves. I'm on the outside, and I recognized that 20 years ago. How could you miss it? You're right. And I do know that. I'm just looking for things to go wrong. I get gloomy when I try to prepare myself for the worst. How come you're so cheerful? Right up ahead, another day, two maximum. I get to say hi to my old buddy's accordion blade. I looked at him askance. Could he be the only one of us more excited than frightened by the possibility inherent in releasing the captured? Only one of those people had not spent the past fifteen years trapped inside his own mind. And I was not convinced that Mergen was not working overtime to maintain a false facade of sanity. The others, I did not doubt that quite a few would come forth stark raving mad. Nor did the rest. Nowhere was that fear more evident than in the Radisha. Tajik. 
had remained almost invisible since she had rejoined us this side of the Danda Presh. Though Riverwalker and Runmust stayed close, she needed no watching and made few demands. She stayed to herself, cloaked in brooding. The farther we moved from Taglios, the nearer we approached her brother, the more withdrawn she became. On the road after the Grove of Doom, we had become almost sisterly. But the pendulum had been swinging the other way ever since Jaycourt, and we had not exchanged a hundred words a week this side of the mountains. That did not please me. I enjoyed her company, conversation and slashing wit. Even Master Centaraxita had had no luck drawing her out lately, though she had developed an affection for his scholarly drollery. Between them, the pair could gut and flints a fool's argument faster than a master butcher ever cleaned a chicken. I mentioned the problem to Willow Swan. I'll bet it's not her brother that's bothering her. He wouldn't be the biggest thing anyway. I guess she's down about not being able to go back, ever since she realized we're probably on a one-wayer here. She's been in a black depression. Um, it's Raja Dharma. That's not just a handy propaganda slogan for her, Sleepy. She takes being the ruler of Taglio seriously. You got her strolling on down here month after month, seeing what the protector did in her name. You have to understand that she's going to be upset about the way she let herself get used. And then she has to face the fact that she'll probably never get a chance to do anything about it. She's not that hard to understand. But he had been close to her for 30 years. We're going back. Oh, sure. And on the one chance in a zillion that we really do, who's going to have an army waiting? Can you say soul catcher? Sure. And I can also say she'll forget us in six months. She'll find a more interesting game to play. And can you say water sleeps? So can soul catcher, sleepy. You don't know her. Nobody does. Except maybe lady, a little. But I got closer than most for a while. Not exactly by choice, but there I was. I tried to pay attention for what good it would do me. She isn't entirely inhuman, and she isn't as vain and heedless as she might want the world to think. Bottom line, you need to keep one critical fact firmly in mind when you're thinking about Soul Catcher. And that is that she's still alive in a world where her deadliest enemy was the Lady of the Tower. Remembering that in her time, Lady made the Shadow Masters look like unschooled bullies. You're really wound today, aren't you? Just stating the facts. Here's one of your own right back. Water sleeps. The woman who used to be the lady of the tower will be back on her feet in another few days. You'd better ask Mergen if he thinks she'll want to bother getting up. I'll bet you it's not this cold where she's at. The breeze on the plane had begun to gnaw both deeply and relentlessly. I did not disagree, even though he knew the truth. He might not remember, but he must have helped Soul Catcher move the captured into the ice caverns where they lay imprisoned. A murder of crows appeared from the north, fighting the wind. They had very little to say to one another. They circled a few times, then fought for altitude and rode the breeze toward Mama. They would not have much to report. We began to find more bodies, sometimes in twos and threes, a fair number of the captured had not been caught at all. I recalled Mergen's report that almost half the party made a break for the world after Soulcatcher got loose. Here they were. I did not remember most of them. They were Taglian or Jakuri, rather than old crew. Mostly. Which meant they had enlisted while I was up north on Mergen's behalf. We came upon Suyin Din Duk, Bucket's Nguangbo bodyguard. Duke's body had been prepared neatly for ceremonial farewells. That bucket had paused in the midst of terror to honor one of the quietest and most unobtrusive of the Nguyen Bo companions spoke volumes about the character of my adopted father and that of Duke. Bucket had refused to accept protection. He did not want a bodyguard, and Suyen Din Duke had refused to go away. He had felt called by a power far superior to Bucket's will. 
I believe they became friends when nobody was looking. I began to shed the tears that had not come when we had found Bucket himself. Willow Swan and Suvrin tried to comfort me. Both were uneasy with the effort, not quite knowing if hugging would be acceptable. It sure would have been, but I did not know how to let them know without saying it. That would have embarrassed me too much. Sara provided the comfort as the Nguyen Bo gathered to honor one of their own. Swan woofed. The white crow had landed on his left shoulder and pecked at his ear. It studied the dead man with one eye and the rest of us with the other. Uncle Doge observed, Your friend was supremely confident that someone would come this way again, Annalise. He left Duke in the attitude called In Respect of Patient Repose, which we do when a proper funeral has to be delayed. Neither gods nor devils disturb the dead while they lie so disposed. I sniffled. Water sleeps, uncle. Bucket believed. He knew we'd come. Bucket's belief had been stronger than mine. Mine barely survived the Keel and A wars. Without Sarah's relentless desire to resurrect Mergen, I would not have come through the times of despair. I would not have become strong enough to endure when Sarah's own time of doubt came upon her. Now we were here, with nowhere to go but forward. I dried my eyes. We don't have time to stand around talking. Our resources are painfully finite. Let's load him up, Doge interrupted. We would prefer to leave him as he is, where he is till we can send him off with the appropriate ceremonies. And those would be? What? I haven't seen many dead Nguyen Bo since the siege of Jaikur. You people do a good job of dancing around death. But I have seen a few of your tribe dead, and there wasn't any obviously necessary funeral ritual. Some got burned on the gats, as though they were goony. I saw one man buried in the ground, as if you were Vedna. I've even seen a corpse rubbed with bad-smelling unguents, then wrapped like a mummy and hung head down from a high tree branch. Doge said, Each funeral would have been appropriate to the person and situation, I'm sure. What's done with the flesh isn't critical. The ceremonies are intended to ease the soul's transition to its new state. They are absolutely essential. If they're not observed, the dead man's spirit may be compelled to wander the earth indefinitely. As ghosts or dreamwalkers? Doge seemed startled. Uh, ghosts. A restless spirit that wants to finish tasks interrupted by death. They can't, so they just keep going. Although Vedna ghosts are wicked spirits cursed to wander by God himself, I had no trouble following Doge's notion. Then we'll leave him here. You want to stand beside him? To make sure he stays safe from traffic? Bucket had placed Duke at the edge of the road so he would not be disturbed by the terrified fugitives back then. How did he die? Swan asked. Then he squawked. The white crow had nipped his ear again. Everybody turned to stare at Swan. What do you mean? I asked. Look. If a shadow got Duke, and somebody tried to lay him out proper, that layer-outer would be here dead as a wedge, too, right? So he must have died some other way before. A dim lamp seemed to come alive inside his head. Catcher did it, the crow said. It was crow call, but the words were clear. Ah, ah, Catcher did it! The Nguyen Bo began to press in on Swan. Catcher did it, I reminded them. Probably with a booby trap spell. By the time Duke reached this point, she would have been ten miles ahead of anybody on foot. She was mounted, remember? From what I remember about Duke, he probably saw the trap as Bucket tripped it and jumped in the way. Goda pointed out. The protector could not have left a booby trap to kill Duke if she had not been released. Her taglion was the best I had ever heard it. 
The anger in her eyes said she wanted no mistake to be made. Sara whispered, Suyin Din Duke was a second cousin to my father. I said, We've been through this before, people. We can't exonerate Willow Swan, but we can forgive him if we recall the circumstances he faced. Do any of you really think you can get the best of the protector face to face? No hands? But some of you think so in your heart. Fu Nguyen Bo lacked for arrogant self-confidence. Here's your challenge. Run back and prove it. The Shadow Gate will let you out. Soul Catcher is on foot. She's crippled. You can catch up fast. Can you ask for any more? I paused. What? No takers? Then lay off Swan. The white crow cawed mockingly. I saw a few thoughtful, sheepish faces, but Goda's was not one of them. Goda had never been wrong in her life, except that one time when she had thought she might be wrong. Swan let it roll off, as he had done for years. He had learned from the strictest instructress. He did suggest, You said we need to keep rolling, Sleepy although I guess we meat-eaters can start on the vegetarians after their stories run out. Carry the key, Tobo. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah turned away. Mother, stay with Tobo. Don't let him walk any faster than you do. Kaigota grumbled something under her breath and turned away from us. She followed Tobo. Her rolling waddle could be deceptive when she was in a hurry. She overhauled the boy, grabbed hold of his shirt, off they went, the old woman's mouth going steadily. No gambler by nature. Still, I would have bet that she was fuming about what foul mortals the rest of us be. I observed, Kai Goda appears to have found herself. Not one of the Nguyen Bo found any reason to celebrate that eventuation. A mile later, we came across the only animal remains that we would ever find from the earlier expedition. They were piled in a heap, bones and shredded dry flesh, so intertangled there was no telling how many beasts there had been, or why they had gathered together in life or in death. The whole grim mess appeared to have been subsiding into the surface of the plain slowly. Given another decade, it would be gone. Chapter 79 the ugly dreamwalkers returned after dark. They were more energetic in their efforts tonight. The rain returned, too. It was more energetic and was accompanied by thunder and lightning that made sleeping difficult. As did the cold rainwater, all of which seemed determined to collect inside the circle where we were camped. The stone did not appear to slope, but water sure behaved as though it did. The animals drank their fill. Likewise, the human members of the band. Runmust and Riverwalker directed everyone to fill water bags and top off canteens. And as soon as someone raised his voice to bless our good fortune, the first snowflakes began to fall. What sleep I did manage was not pleasant. A full-blown tumult was underway in the ghost world, and it spilled over into my dreams. Then Iqbal's daughter decided this would be a wonderful time to cry all night. Which got the dog started howling, or maybe that happened the other way around. Shadows swarmed over the face of our protection. They were more interested in us than they had been in the interlopers of Mergen's time. He told me so himself. The shadows remembered ages past. I was able to eavesdrop on their dreams on their nightmares. All they remembered were horrors from a time when men resembling Yuang Bo tortured them to death in wholesale lots, while sorcerers great and small spanked the demented souls until, when they were released eventually, they were so filled with hatred of every living thing that even a creature as slight as a roach was subject to instant attack with great ferocity. Some shadows, already evilly predatory by nature, became so wicked they even attacked and devoured other shadows. There had been millions so victimized, and the only virtue in their creators 
was that they manufactured the horrors from invaders who arrived in countless waves from a world where an insane sorcerer king had elevated himself to near godhood. Ben had set out to take full mastery of all the sixteen worlds. Uncounted tens of thousands of corpses littered the glittering plain before the shadows stemmed that tide. Scores of the monsters escaped into neighboring worlds. They spread terror and havoc until the gates could be modified to prevent their passage. For centuries, no traffic crossed the plain. Then came another age of half-hearted commerce, once some genius devised the protection now shielding the roads and circles. The shadows saw everything. They remembered everything. They saw and remembered the missionaries of Kina, who had fled my own world at the pinnacle of Raedranach's fury. In every world they reached, the goddess's dark song fell upon a few eager ears, even amongst the children of those who had created the shadows. Commerce on a plane so constrained and dangerous per force remained light, it took determined people to hazard the crossing. Traffic peaked when the world we recalled as Katavar launched a flurry of expeditions to other worlds to determine which would be best suited to host the cosmic ceremony called the Year of the Skulls. Followers of Kina from other worlds joined that quest. Companies marched and countermarched. They argued and squabbled. They accomplished very little. Eventually, a consensus took shape. The sacrifice ought to be the world that had treated the children of Kina so abominably in the first place. Raedranach's descendants should reap what he had sown. The companies sent out were not swarms of fanatics. The plain was dangerous. Few men wanted to cross it. Most of the soldiers were conscripts or minor criminals under the rule of a few dedicated priests. They were not expected to return it became the custom for the conscripts' families to hold a wake for their bone warriors or stone soldiers before they departed, even though the priests always promised they would be back in a matter of months. The few who did return usually came back so drained and changed, so bitter and hard, they came to be known as soldiers of darkness. Kina's religion was never popular anywhere it took root. Always a minority cult, it lost what power it did have as generations passed and the early fervor faded into the inevitable, tedious rule of functionaries. One world after another abandoned Kina and turned away from the plain. Dark ages took shape everywhere. One gate after another failed and was not restored. Those that did not fail fell into disuse. The worlds were old, worn, tired, desperately in need of renewal. The ancestors of the Nguyen Bo may have been the last large party to travel from one world to another. They seemed to have been Kina worshippers fleeing persecution at a time when the rest of their people had become insanely xenophobic and determined to expunge all alien influences. The ancestors of the Nguyen Bo, the children of the dead, had vowed to return to their land of unknown shadows in blazing triumph. But of course, because they were safe on the far side of the plain, their descendants soon forgot who and what they were. Only a handful of priests remembered, not entirely correctly. A voice that did not speak aloud tickled my consciousness. Sister, sister, it said. I saw nothing, felt only that featherweight touch. But it was enough to spin my soul sideways and toss it into another place where, when I caught my spiritual breath, the stench of decay filled my nostrils. A sea of bones surrounded me. Unknown tides stirred its surface. There was something wrong with my eyes. My vision was warped and doubled. I raised a hand to rub them and saw white feathers. No, impossible. I could not be following Mergen's path. I could not be losing my moorings in time. I would not stand for it. I willed myself. Ah! 
not from my beak. A black shape popped into sight in front of me, wings spread, slowing. Talons reached toward me. I spun, hurled myself off the dead branch where I had been perched, and was sorry instantly. I found myself just yards from a face five feet tall. It boasted more fangs than a shark does teeth. It was darker than midnight. The odor of its breath was the stench of decaying flesh. The triumphant grin on those wicked ebony lips faded as I evaded the swat of a gigantic clawed hand. I, sleepy, was in a trousers soiling panic, but something else was inside the bird with me. And it was having fun. Sister, sister, that was close. The bitch is getting sneakier. But she will never surprise me. She cannot. Nor will she understand that she cannot. Who is me? The exercise was over. I was in my body on the plane, in the rain, shuddering while my mind's eye observed the capering dreamwalkers. I examined what I had experienced and concluded that I had been given a message, which was that Kina knew we were coming. The dreaming goddess had been pretending quiescence of recent decades. She knew patience intimately, by all its secret names and I may have been given another message as well. Kina still was the mother of deceit. Quite possibly nothing I had learned recently was entirely or even partially true if Kina had found a way to wander the shadowed reaches of my mind. I had no doubt that she could. She had managed to inform entire generations and regions with a hysterical fear of the black company before the advent of the old crew. I swear I sensed her amusement over having quickened in me a deeper and more abiding distrust of everything around me. Chapter 80 Suvran wakened me early. He sounded glum. I could not see his face in the darkness. Trouble, sleepy, he whispered. And I have to give him credit. He was first to realize the implications of the fact that it was snowing. But then, he had seen more of the white stuff than any of us but Swan. And Willow had been away from it long enough to turn into an old man. I wanted to moan and groan, but that would have done no good, and we needed to get a handle on the situation right away. Good thinking, I told him. Thanks. Go around in that direction and wake up the sergeants. I'll circle around to the left. Despite my nightmares, I felt rested. The snowfall in no way recognized the presence of the protection shielding our campsite, which meant the boundaries were no longer obvious. I sensed a heightened killing lust amongst the shadows. They had seen this before. It would be snack time if anyone started running around nervously. We had one eye and goblin on our side. Tobo, too. They could winkle out the whereabouts of the boundaries. But they needed a little light to do the job. One by one, I made sure everyone wakened and understood the gravity of the situation, especially the mothers. I made sure everyone understood that no one should move around until daylight. Wonder of wonders, nobody did anything stupid. Once there was light enough, the wizard started drawing lines in the snow. I arranged for teams to enforce the boundaries. Everything went so well I was feeling smug before it turned time to go. Then I discovered that it was going to be a long day. Which, of course, I should have known instinctively. This next leg of the journey had taken the captured only a few hours. It would take us far longer. The shattered fortress could not be discerned behind the falling snow. The old, old men would have to mark out every step before it could be taken, walking to either side of Tobo and the key, keeping him centered on the road, but never getting ahead of him, just in case. A quarter mile along, I was worrying about time already. 
We had too many mouths and too few supplies. Harsh rationing was in place. These people had to be gotten across the plain fast, excepting those of us who would bring out the captured. This is getting out of hand, Goblin yelled. If it gets any heavier, we're up shit creek. He was right. If this snowfall turned into a blizzard, we were going to have no other worries. If it worsened much, we were going to die out here and make Soul Catcher the happiest girl in the world. She probably was anyway, now that she had had time to reflect on the fact that there was no one left able to dispute her in any whim she cared to indulge. Water sleeps? So what? Those days were over. Not while I was still standing, they were not. Swan joined me for breakfast. How's my wife this morning? Frigid. Darn. Open mouth insert boot with manure veneer. Swan grinned. I've known that for years. Isn't this something? There's more than an inch already. It's something, all right. Unfortunately, I don't encourage myself to use the kind of language needed to describe it. Most of these people have never seen snow. Watch out for somebody to do something stupid. In fact, you might stick close to the Radisha. I don't want her getting hurt because somebody doesn't use his head. All right. Did you dream last night? Of course I did. I got to meet Kina right up close, too. I saw lights on the road to the east of us. That got my attention. Really? In my dream. They were just witch lights. Maybe the plane's own memories or something. There wasn't anything there when I went to look. Getting bold in your old age, are you? It just sort of happened. I wouldn't have done it if I thought about it. Did I snore again last night? You solidified your grasp on the all-time women's championship. You ready to compete at the next level? Must have something to do with the dreaming. Sara drifted up. She looked grim. She did not like what was happening even a little, the snow or the way we had to cope with it. But she bit her tongue. She understood that it was now too late to be a fussy mom. Like it or not, her boy was carrying us all right now. One eye limped along using a staff somebody had made for him from one of the smaller bamboo weapons. I did not know if it was still armed. Very likely so, he being one eye, he told me, I'm not going to last at this, little girl, but I'll go as long as I can. Show Tobo what to do and let him take over as soon as he's got it. Let Gota carry the pickaxe and you get up on the horse. Advise from there. The old man just nodded instead of finding some reason to argue, betraying his true weakness. Goblin scowled at me, though, assuming he was going to get a large ration of unsolicited counsel. But he shrugged off the temptation to debate. Tobo, hold up. You really understand what we have to do today? I've got it, Sleepy. Then give your grandmother the key. Where's that horse buddy of mine? Get up here, you. Carry one eye. I noted that the white crow had left the beast's back. In fact, the bird was nowhere to be seen. Up you go, old man. Who you call an old little girl? When I drew himself up as tall as he got. You, so old you've gotten shorter than me. Get your tail up there. I really want to get there today. I offered Goblin a hard look just in case he got a notion to try poking sticks in the spokes. He just looked back blankly, or maybe blandly. Spoiled brat me. I got my way. The ruined fortress loomed out of weakly falling snow around what felt like noon. Once Tobo got the hang of discovering the boundaries well enough to keep up with Goblin, the band began moving at a pace limited only by Mother Goda's capacities and she seemed taken by a sudden urge to hasten toward whatever destiny awaited whoever arrived with the key. My natural pessimism went almost entirely unrewarded.
Had Eekball's boys not discovered the wonders of snowballs, I would have had nothing to complain about at all. Even then I would have been entertained had not a few wild volleys of missiles not strayed my way. We arrived at the chasm Mergen had mentioned, a tear in the face of the plain rent by powers almost unimaginable. The earthquake responsible had been felt as far away as Taglios. It had flattened whole cities this side of the Don Depreche. I wondered if it had wrought as much destruction in the other worlds connected to the plain. I also wondered if the quake had been natural in origin. Had it been caused by some premature effort of Kina's to rise and shine? Swan! Willow Swan! Get up here! Mother Goda had halted at the lip of the chasm simply because there was no way for her to go forward. The rest of the mob crowded up behind the leaders because, naturally, everyone wanted to see. I snapped. Make a hole, people, make a hole. Let the man get up here. I stared at the wrecked fortress. Shattered was too strong a description, but its state of disrepair went way beyond neglect, too. I supposed if the original golem garrison were still around, it would be in perfect condition, and right now the whole crew would be outside dusting off the snow patches attached to every little roughness of the stone. Swan grumbled. You need to make up your mind, darling. You want me to look out for the radish or? Never mind, I don't have time. I'm cold and I'm cranky and I want to change that. Look at this crack. Is this the way it was before? Because even though it's pretty impressive, it's nowhere as huge as Mergen made me think it would be. Everybody but Iqbal's baby can skip across this. Swan studied the gap in the plain. Immediately evident to any eye was the fact that there were no sharp edges. The stones seemed to have softened and oozed like taffy. No, it wasn't like this at all. It looks like it's been healing. It's not a quarter as wide as it was. I bet in another generation, there won't even be a scar. So the plane can heal itself. But not so things that were added later. I indicated the fortress, except for the spells protecting the roads. Apparently. Start moving across. Swan, stick with Tobo and Gota. Nobody else has any idea where to go from here. There you are. I answered an impatient caw from above. If I kind of squinted and looked sideways, I could make out the white crow perched on the battlements looking down still muttering to himself, though somewhat good-naturedly. Swan stepped across the crack, slipped, fell, skidded, got up exercising a string of out-of-shape northern expletives. Everyone else laughed. I summoned Runmust and Riverwalker. I want you two to figure out how to get the animals and carts across. Draft Suvern if you want. He claims he's had some minor experience in practical engineering and keep reminding everyone that if they remain calm and cooperative, we'll all get to sleep in a warm, dry place tonight. Well, maybe dry. Warm was probably too much to expect. Uncle Doge and Tobo helped Mother Gota across. Sara followed. Several other Nguangbo followed her. That made an awful lot of Nguangbo concentrated in one place suddenly my paranoia began to quiver and narrow its eyes suspiciously. I said, Goblin, one eye. Come along. Slink? Where are you? Come with us. Slink I could count on to be quick and deadly and as morally reluctant as a spear when I pointed and said kill. Uncle Doge did not fail to note the fact that even now I trusted him only incompletely. He seemed both irked and amused. He told me, There isn't anything for our people here, analyst. This is all for Tobo's benefit. That's good. That's good. I wouldn't want the future of the company to be placed in the slightest risk. Doge frowned, disappointed by my sarcasm. I have not won your heart yet, stone soldier. How could you? 
You keep calling me names and won't even explain. All will become clear. I fear. Of course. Once we reach the land of unknown shadows, right? You'd better hope there aren't any half-truths or outright cover-ups in your doctrine. All evil dies there in endless death. It could still be true. Doge responded with a baleful look, but it seemed neither angry nor calculating. I said, Swan, show us the way. Chapter 81 I think this is as far as I can take you, Swan told me. He spoke slowly, as though having trouble sorting out his thoughts. I don't get it. Stuff keeps going away. I know I was farther inside than this. I know all the things we did. But when I try to remember anything specific, I lose everything between the time I got to this point until sometime during the gallop back. Stuff comes to me all the time when I'm not trying. I do remember that. Maybe Catcher messed up my brain somehow. There's an all-time understatement, Goblin muttered. Swan ignored Goblin. He complained. We were actually off the plane before I realized that we were the only ones who would be coming out. I was not sure I believed that, but it did not matter now. I grunted, suggested. How about you make a guess? Maybe your soul will remember what your brain can't. First you need to get some light in here. What do I have wizards for? I asked the gloom. Certainly not anything useful or practical like providing a light. They wouldn't need one. They can see in the dark. Goblin muttered something unflattering about the sort of woman who indulges in sarcasm. He told Swan, Sit down and let me look at your head. Let me, Tobo enthused at the same time. Let me try to make a light. I can do this one. He did not wait for permission. Filaments of lemon and silver light crawled over his upraised hands, swift and eager. The darkness surrounding us retreated, I thought reluctantly. Wow, I said. Look at him. He has the strength and the enthusiasm of youth, one eye conceded. I glanced back. He was still astride the black stallion, wearing a smug look but obviously exhausted. The white crow was perched in front of him. It studied Tobo with one eye while considering our surroundings with the other. It seemed amused. Then one eye began to chuckle. Tobo squealed in surprise. Wait! Stop! Goblin! What's happening? The worms of light were snaking up his arms. They would not respond to his insistence that they desist. He started slapping himself. One eye and goblin began to laugh. Meantime, the two of them had done something to Swan to clarify his mind. The man looked like he had just sucked down a tall, frosty mug of self confident recollection. Sara saw nothing funny in Tobo's situation. She screamed at the wizards to do something. She was almost incoherent, which betrayed how much stress she inflicted upon herself. Doge told her, He isn't in any danger, Sarah. He just let himself get distracted. It happens. It's part of learning. Or words to that effect, several times, before Sarah calmed down and began to look defiant and sheepish at the same time. Goblin told Tobo, I'll take it till you get your concentration back. And in a moment, there was light enough to see the walls of the huge chamber. Someone who is skilled at something always makes it look easy. The little bald wizard was no exception. He told one eye, Help Swan keep his head clear. I thought the place looked like a nice change from sleeping out in the weather. I wished there was fuel we could burn to heat it. Whither now? I asked Swan. For some time I had been silently regretting not having caught Mergen while I was dreaming, so I could have gotten reliable directions. 
The white crow squawked and launched itself, leaving one eye cursing because it had swatted him in the face with its wings. I was starting to understand the beast. Somebody see where it goes? One of you sorcerer geniuses want to send a light with it? Tobo had received control of his light again and had it working in good form, but it took all his attention to manage it. I hoped he outgrew his more confidence than sense stage before he took a really big bite of disaster. Uncle Doge trailed the crow at a dignified pace. I supposed I ought to contribute something more than executive decisions, so I followed him. A ball of leprous green light from behind overtook me and made a nest in my tangled hair. My scalp began to itch. I had a suspicion one eye might be sneering at my personal hygiene, which, I confess, sometimes became the victim of a negligent attitude. Sort of. This'll teach me to take my darn helmet off, I grumbled. I refused to allow him to flash me his smug, toothless grin by not looking back. I had not been wearing an actual helmet. God save me, that would have been cold. I had been wearing a leather helmet liner, which had been keeping my ears from getting frostbitten. Barely. Winter. It was one of those things the planning team had not foreseen. I hurried past Doge, who was startled when he saw my hair. Then he grinned as big as ever I had seen him do. I tossed him a bloodthirsty scowl. Unfortunately, to do so I had to turn around far enough to see one eye and goblin suddenly stop exchanging hand slaps and snickers. Even Sara turned slightly sideways to conceal her amusement. All right. So suddenly I am the clown princess of the company, eh? We would see. Those two would... I realized that they had lured me into accepting their system of thought. Before long, I would be setting traps so I could get even first. The crow cawed. It was down on the cold stone floor. It danced back and forth, suddenly impatient. Its talons clicked softly. I dropped to my knees. It let me get almost within touching distance before it flopped farther into the darkness. More light took life behind us as people and animals came inside, making the predictable racket. Every new arrival had to know what was going on. The crow became a silhouette if I lowered my head and looked at it with my cheek against the floor. I told Doge, There's light coming from somewhere. This must be where the captured got into the inner fortress. I got down on my belly. There was a definite gap in a wall of stone so dark it seemed unseeable, even in the available light. I could not make out anything on the other side. Doge got down and placed his own cheek on the floor. Indeed. I called. We need some more light over here, and maybe some tools. River, run must. Have those people start setting up some kind of camp and see what you can do about shutting out the cold. That would be difficult. There were several large gaps in the outside wall. Goblin and One Eye stopped grinning like fools and came forward dressed in their business faces. They kept Tobo right there with them, determined to teach him their trade quickly, hands on. With more light, it was easier to see what the bird meant me to see, which had to be the crack Soulcatcher had sealed after working her wicked spells on the captured. There any spells or booby traps here? I asked. The little girl's a genius, one eye grumbled. His speech had grown a little slurred. He needed rest badly. The bird strutted through and didn't go up in smoke, right? That suggest anything? No spells, Goblin said. Don't mind him. He's just cranky because him and Goda haven't had no privacy for a week. I'm gonna fit you out for all the privacy you'll need for a couple of aeons, runt man. I'm gonna plant your wrinkled old ass. Enough. Let's see if we can make the hole any bigger. The crow made impatient noises on the other side. 
It had to have some connection with the captured, even if it was not Mergen operating from some lost corner of time. Certainly I hoped it was not Mergen from the future. That would imply a less than successful effort on our part now. I grumbled and snarled. I stamped back and forth while half a dozen men expanded the hole, every one of them grousing about the shortage of light. I did not contribute much as a human candle either. Maybe the thing in my hair was goblin and one eye offering commentary on how bright I was. Though I doubted that after only two hundred years, they could yet have developed that much cleverness and subtlety. A larger and larger crowd piled up behind me. River, I growled. I said you should have these people do something useful. Tobo, get back from there. You want a boulder to fall on your head? A voice behind me suggested, You ought to get more light on it so you can see if you need to do any shoring. I turned. Slink? There were miners in my family. Then you're as near an expert as we've got. One I jabbed a thumb at Goblin. The dwarf here has sapper experience. He helped undermine the walls at Timber. His face split in an ugly grin. Goblin squeaked a definite clue that Timber was an episode he did not recall fondly. I did not remember any mention of a Timber in the annals. Reason suggested that the referenced event must have taken place long before Croker became analyst which he had done at an early age. Two of Croker's more immediate predecessors, Milo Ladora and Kanwa Scar, had been so lax in their duties that little is known about their time. Other than what their successors have reconstructed from oral tradition and the memories of survivors. It was during that era that Croker, Otto, and Hagope joined the band. Croker says little about those days himself. Am I to take it, then, that I shouldn't invest unlimited faith in Goblin's engineering skills? One eye cawed like a crow. As an engineer, our bitty buddy makes a wonderful lumberjack. Things fall down wherever he goes. Goblin growled like a mastiff issuing a warning. See? This here skinny little bald egg genius sold the old man the notion of sneaking into his berg timber by tunneling under its walls, deep down. Because the earth was soft, it'd be easy. One eye snorted as he talked, his laughter barely under control. And he was right. It was easy. When his tunnel caved in, the wall fell down and the rest of us charged through the gap and sorted them timberinos out. Goblin grumbled. And about five days later, somebody remembered the miners. Somebody was just plain damned lucky he had a friend as good as me to dig him out. The old man just wanted to put up a gravestone. Goblin growled some more. Not so. And the real truth is, the tunnel never would have collapsed if this two-legged, overripe dog turd hadn't been playing one of his stupid games. You know, I almost forgot. I never did pay you back for that. You should have never brought it up, you human prune. Damn. You almost went and died on me before I got you paid off. I knew you were up to no good. You had that stroke on purpose, didn't you? Of course I did, you nitwit. Every chance I get, I try to die just so's you can't backstab me no more. You want to be that way? I saved your ass, and you want to be that way? Ain't no fool like an old fool. Bring it on, you hairless little toady frog. I may be slowed down a step the last couple years, but I'm still three steps faster and ten torches brighter than any lily white. Boys? I snapped. Children! We have work to do here. They must have driven the whole company crazy when they were young and had the energy to keep it up all the time. As of this moment, all the slates are clean of anything that happened before I was born. Just open me a hole so I can go see what we have to do next. 
The two wizards did not stop growling and muttering and threatening and trying to sabotage one another in small ways. But they did lend their claimed expertise to the effort to open the gap. Chapter 82 Once the opening had been expanded enough to use, there was a brief debate about who would use it first. The accord was universal. Not me. But when I squatted down to duck walk forward into the shadows, in hopes I could get a look at what might eat me a few seconds before its jaws snapped shut, several gentlemen turned all noble and chivalrous. I suspect it was significant that two of them, Swan and Suvran, were not company brothers. Goblin grumbled, All right, all right. Now you're making us look bad. All of you get out of the way. He bustled forward. He did not have to duck. I did, just slightly, as I followed him through. I did not need anyone to be noble or chivalrous or to go in before me. There is no God but God, I muttered. His works are vast and mysterious. I was five steps inside and had just bumped into Goblin, who had stopped to stare as well. I presume that's the golem demon Shevetya. Or his ugly little brother. Mergen had not kept me posted on the golem's state. At last report, it had been just a single earth tremor short of plunging into a bottomless abyss, still nailed to a huge wooden throne by means of a number of silver daggers. I observed, It appears the plane has been healing itself in here, too. I eased forward. There was still a vertiginous abyss. I had to close my eyes momentarily while I regained my equilibrium. Shivetya remained poised over it, but the gap clearly was narrower than Mergen had described. In closing, the surface had pushed the wooden throne upward somewhat. Shivetya was no longer in momentary peril of falling. It looked like a few decades would see him lying there with his nose pressed into healed stone the overturned throne on top of him still. Willow Swan invited himself to join me. He said, That thing hasn't moved since last time. I countered. Thought you couldn't remember anything. Whatever the short farts did, it seems to be working. I recognize things when I see them. Goblin told Swan, Considering what could still happen if Shivetya starts jumping around, holding still seems like a pretty good idea. Don't you think? Could you hold still for 15 years? I said. He's held still a lot longer than that, Swan. He's been nailed to that throne for hundreds of years. Or even thousands. He has to have been nailed down since before deceivers fling Radranak came here on their way to other worlds and hid the books of the dead. That observation got me some looks, particularly from Master Centaraxita. I had not yet shared the tales I had gleaned from Mergen. Else he would have stomped them good at the time. They would have looked like the kind of thing he was put here to guard against. I think. Who nailed him down? Goblin asked. I don't know. Might be a handy piece of information. You'd want to keep an eye on a guy who could do that kind of thing. I would, Swan agreed. He grinned nervously. It's listening, I said. I moved along the edge of the abyss several steps, squatted. From there I could see the demon's eyes. They were open a crack. I could also see that there were three of them instead of two, the third being in the center of the forehead, above and between the other two. This point had not come up before though it was the sort of thing you would expect of a Goonie-style demon. The oversight became self-explanatory as soon as the demon sensed my scrutiny. The third eye closed and vanished. I asked Swan, That throne look like it's solidly wedged? Yeah, why? Just wondering if we could move it without losing it down that crack. I'm no engineer, but it looks to me like you'd really have to work at it to dump it down there now. Obviously, it could go. One really stupid move? 
It's a hell of a deep hole, but... The curious kept piling up behind us. Their chatter was becoming annoying. Every single whisper turned into a gaggle of echoes that made the place seem more haunted than it was. Everybody be quiet. I can't hear myself think. I must have sounded nastier than I intended. People shut up and gawked. I asked, Does anyone see a way to get that thing turned right side up and pushed back away from the gap? How come you'd want to do that? One I asked. Quit shoving, Junior. Suvran asked. Using equipment we have on hand? Yes. And it would have to get done today. I want the majority of these people back on the road south at first light tomorrow. That means using brute force. Right now, some of us would have to get on the other side of the fissure and lift the top of the throne through so people and animals on this side could get the leverage to pull it on up using ropes. Swan said, You try to stand it up the way it is there, the bottom end will just slide off the edge. Then it's a grand ride off to the entrails of the earth. How come you'd want to do that? One eye demanded again. I ignored him again. I concentrated on the argument spreading outward from Suvern and Swan. I let it run for several minutes. Then I announced, Suvern seems to be the only one here with a positive view, so he's in charge. Suvern, draft anybody you want. Help yourself to any resources you need. Sit Shivetya back up for me. You hear that, steadfast guardian? Gentlemen, if you have any ideas, feel free to share them with Mr. Suvren. Suvren said, I can't. I don't. I shouldn't. I guess the first thing we'd better do is get a solid idea of how much weight we're dealing with. And we'll have to rig up some way to get across the gap. Mr. Swan, you handle that. Young Mr. Tobo, I understand you're skilled at mathematics. Suppose you help me calculate how much mass we're dealing with here. Tobo grinned and headed for the throne, not at all intimidated by the demon. One adjustment, I said. I need Swan with me. He's been here before. Runmust, you and Iqbal figure out how to get across. Willow, come with me. Out of earshot of the others, Swan asked, What's going on? I didn't want to remind anybody that the company got this far once before. Somebody might recall a grudge against the man who made it impossible for our predecessors to go any farther. Oh, thanks. I guess. He glanced at the clot of Nguyen Bo. Mother Goda continued to nurture her grudge. She had a son somewhere down under this stone. I may just have a strange perspective. I do believe all of us should accept responsibility for our actions, but I'm not sure we ever understand why we do some things. Do you know why you cut Soulcatcher loose? I bet you've spent the odd minute here and there trying to figure that out. You'd win. Except it'd be more like the odd year here and there. And I still can't explain it. She did something to me somehow, just with her eyes all the way across the plain, probably manipulating my feelings about her sister. When the time came, it seemed like the right thing to do. I never had a doubt until it was all over and we were on the run. And she kept her word. He understood. She gave me everything her eyes promised, everything I could never have from the sister I really wanted. Whatever her failings, Soulcatcher keeps her word. Sometimes we get what we want and find out that it wasn't what we needed. No shit. Story of my life, Sleepy. Around 50 people came onto the plane. Two of you got away. Thirteen died on the road trying. The rest are still out here somewhere. And you helped put them where they are. So I'm going to need you to show me. Are you still blind in the memory, or have you started to remember? Oh, those spells took. It's coming back. But not necessarily organized the same way that it happened. So bear with me when I seem a little confused. I understand. 
I kept an eye on the others as we talked. Sarah seemed to be putting herself under a lot of unnecessary stress. Doge looked ferociously ready to seize the day, should an opportunity pop up. Goda was nagging one eye about something, while keeping one grim eye aimed Swan's way. Goblin was trying to get the mist projector set up amidst a jostling crowd. I noted, There seems to be more light than Murgan reported. Tons more, and it's warmer too. If I was allowed to guess, mine would be that it had something to do with the healing that's going on. I did feel overdressed for the indoor weather. It was not hot, but it was warmer than the plain outside, and there was no wind biting. Where are the captured? There was a stairway over there. We must have gone a mile down into the earth. You carried 35 unconscious people down there and got back in time to get away from the evening shadows? Without killing yourself? Ketcher did most of it. She has a spell that makes things float through the air. We roped the people together and pulled them along like a string of sausages. She did the pulling, actually. I stayed on the uphill end, more or less, at first. Because the stair has some twists and turns. We had trouble getting them around the corners. But a lot less trouble than if we'd carried them one at a time. I nodded. I knew of other instances when Ketcher had used the same sorcery. Seemed like a handy one to have. We could use it right here, right now, to hoist my future buddy Shivetya. Curious. Once upon a time, Mergen said that name meant deathless. Although more recently, I had been given the meaning steadfast guardian. But I had been provided with whole new sets of creation myths and whatnot, too. I fought off an urge to charge off and plunge down the stairway right then. I hustled back to talk it over with the others. Most of the crowd were preoccupied with an effort to get Shivetya's throne turned right side up by the power of talking about it. Suvrin told me, It's a way to keep warm. And a way to work off some tension, no doubt. I heard plenty of traditional-style grumbling, questioning, the intelligence of any leader who wanted to play around with something like that great ugly thing over there on that throne. I gathered everyone interested. Swan knows the way down to the caverns. His memory is getting better all the time. Goblin and one eye preened. I gave them no chance to congratulate themselves publicly. I'm going down there to scout. I want the rest of you to get camp set up. I want you to work out specifically how we'll divide up tomorrow so the majority can scoot on across the plain to safety. We had discussed this time and again, how we could break up the party, leaving the minimum number of people with the maximum stores to bring out the captured while the rest moved on to, it was hoped, a more congenial climb. Doge's position so perfectly rational was that we should ignore the captured until we had crossed the plain and gotten ourselves established in the land of unknown shadows, and were capable of mounting a more thoroughly prepared and supplied expedition. But none of us knew what we would face at that end of this passage, and way too many of us were emotionally incapable of walking away from our brothers again now that we were this close. I should have gotten more information out of Mergen while we still had some flexibility. Time was winnowing our options rapidly. Sarah's response to Uncle's repeating his suggestion was blistering enough to melt lead. She might be reluctant to have her husband back, but she was not going to delay any crisis. Swan leaned over my shoulder and whispered, If you hang around here waiting for all these people to agree on something, we're going to get very old and very hungry before anything happens. The man had a point. A definite point. Chapter 83 I got my daily constitutional in before we reached the stairway. I began to appreciate just how vast the hall at the heart of that fortress was. My party dwindled into the distance. I observed, This thing has got to be a mile across. Almost exactly. 
It's a few yards under, according to Soul Catcher. I don't know why. I wish we had a torch. I saw patterns in the flooring last time I was here, when there wasn't quite so much dust. But she wouldn't let me waste time looking at them. There was a lot of dust. There had been none outside. The plane tolerated nothing alien except the corpses of invaders, evidently. Even here, we had yet to discover any sign of the animals or equipment that had accompanied the captured South. How much farther? Almost there. Watch for a drop-off. A drop-off? A step down. It's only about 18 inches, but you could break a leg if it surprises you. I turned an ankle last time. We found the drop-off. I stopped to look back once I stepped down. All sorts of genius was being invested in the assignments I had given. Closer, Sara and the Radisha and several others to whom I had not given specific assignments had decided to follow me. I said, You're right. It does look like there are some kind of inlays. If we have time, maybe we can take a closer look. I considered the edge of the stone. This curves and it's polished. That part of the floor is a circle, and it's almost exactly one-eightieth of the diameter of the plane, according to Soul Catcher. The raised part where the demon's throne used to sit is one-eightieth the size of this. That's probably got to mean something. It have anything to do with the captured? Not that I'm aware of. Then we'll worry about it later. The stairs start over here. They did indeed, right next to the wall. The crack in the floor had extended clear through that. The wall's partial collapse had filled the gap there. Then the material from the wall had been pushed back up as the fissure healed itself. The stairs simply started. There was a rectangular hole in the floor. Steps went down, roughly paralleling the outer wall, away from the crack in the floor, which had healed almost completely. There was no handrail. Twenty steps down, we reached a landing eight feet by eight. The descending steps led off from our right. This flight appeared to go downward forever. Faint light crept up it, just strong enough so you could see where to put your feet. Sara and the Radisha had caught up close enough that I could hear them talking without being able to pick up specific words. Both women sounded frightened by the immediate future. I could sympathize. I was nervous about achieving my life's ambition myself. Just a little. You want to go first? Swan asked. He lacked considerable enthusiasm, I thought. Are there booby traps or something? No. She probably wanted to. Just in case somebody passed this way someday, just for the sheer mean fun of it. But there wasn't enough time. She piddled around so much for so long. I didn't really believe we'd ever get away. I'm sure we wouldn't have if she hadn't been who she was. She spun spells that chased the shadows away. She'd been in there before. And she'd practiced. There it is. What? Nothing. Just remembering something. Stupid me. All those years, I wondered how Swan and Soulcatcher had found time to bury the captured without getting gobbled up by shadows. And I had overlooked the obvious. The fact that Soulcatcher was a major sorceress and already had some experience manipulating shadows. You can be screamingly blind to the obvious if you don't realize that you have not opened up all the doors of your mind. Forgive me, O Lord of the Hours. Be merciful. Be compassionate. I shall close the borders of my soul as soon as my brothers are free. At this point, Swan had no incentive to steer me into danger. I started downstairs. The architects, engineers, and stonemasons responsible had not been determined to achieve geometric perfection. Though this portion of the stairwell continued downward in a specific general direction, it tended to meander from side to side of a straight line. Nor were the steps of a uniform height. The builders had been thoughtful enough to provide landings every little way, though. 
I had a feeling those would seem to be miles apart once I started climbing up again. If we have to bring one eye down here, we're going to have to carry him back up. He won't survive the climb otherwise. You might want to organize what you're going to do before we go down there, then. I can't decide what has to be done until I see what I'm dealing with. You might call up your genie in a bottle. Get him to tell you. He's never said much about the place where he's at. Not since he's been in there himself. It's like he's constrained against that. I dreamed about it a few times, but I don't know how accurate my dreams were. Swan groaned. I really didn't want to make this trek. Will it be that bad? Not going down, but heading the other way is likely to change your attitude. I don't know. I'm beginning to get a little winded just going in this direction. Then slow down. A few minutes isn't going to make a difference. Not after all these years. He was right. And wrong. There was no rush for the captured, but for us, with our limited resources, time was destined to become critical. Swan continued, You need to slow down, Sleepy. Really. It's going to get a little bit hairy in a minute. He was absolutely right. But he understated the case dramatically. The stairwell did a meander to the right. It caught up with the chasm caused by the earthquakes that had occurred during the reign of the Shadow Masters. There was only half a stairway there. It clung to the face of a cliff. That left a whole lot of down on my right-hand side and it was down that was entirely too well illuminated by a reddish-orange light that may have come from the stone itself, since there seemed to be no other obvious source. Though I did have trouble opening my eyes wide enough to look, wraith-like wisps of vapor wobbled upward from somewhere down below. The air seemed warmer. I asked, We're not heading into hell itself, are we? Some Vedna believe Al-Shiel is a place where wicked souls will burn for all eternity. Swan understood. Not your hell. But I'd guess it's hell enough for them that are trapped down there. I stopped on the remains of a landing. The steps narrowed to two feet just below me. By leaning out slightly, I could see clearly that the stairwell had been constructed inside a larger bore at least twenty feet in diameter. The shaft had been filled with a stone darker than that through which it had been cut. Maybe the bore had needed to be that big so Kina could be dragged down below. I asked, Can you imagine what an engineering project this must have been? People with plenty of slaves aren't daunted by big projects. What's the matter? I have a problem with heights. This next part is going to take a lot of prayer and some outside encouragement. I want you to go first. I want you to go slow, and I want you to stay where I can touch you. I believe in meeting my fears eyeball to eyeball, but if it gets bad and I feel like I might freeze up, I want to be able to close my eyes and keep going. I was astounded by how calm and reasonable my voice sounded. I understand. The real problem, then, is, who's going to keep his eyes open for me? Whoa! Don't panic, Sleepy. I was joking. I can handle it. Really. It was not the worst thing I ever dealt with. I never abandoned rational thought. But it was difficult. Even when Swan promised me that an unseen protective barrier existed on the abyssal side and demonstrated its presence... The animal inside me wanted to get the heck out of there and go someplace where the ground was flat and green. There was a sky overhead, and there might even be a few trees. Swan assured me that I was missing one heck of a view, especially as we approached the lower end of the gap, where the light was brighter, revealing churning mists way below, mists that concealed the depths of the abyss. I kept my eyes closed, until we were back into a closed cavern again. I had started counting steps up top so I could get an idea of how deep we went, but I lost count 
while I was pretending to be a fly crawling on a wall. I was too busy being terrified, but it did seem like we had traveled a long way horizontally as well as downward. Almost immediately after I had that thought, the stair turned left, then left again. The orange-red light faded away. The stair made a couple more quick turns into a total darkness, which aroused whole new species of terrors. But nothing bit me, and nothing came to steal my soul. Then there was light again, growing so subtly I was never really aware of first noticing it. It had a golden cast to it, but was extremely cold. And as soon as I was aware of it, I knew we were approaching our destination. The stairwell passed right through a natural cavern. At one time, that had been sealed off, but the quakes had toppled the responsible masonry walls. I asked, We here? Almost. Careful climbing over the stones. They aren't very stable. What's that? What? That sound. We listened. After a while, Swan said, I think it's wind. Sometimes there was a breeze when we were down here before. Wind? A mile underground? Don't ask me to explain it. It just is. You want to go first this time? Yes. I thought you would. Chapter 84 Golden caverns where old men sat beside the way, frozen in time, Immortal but unable to move an eyelid. Madmen they. Some covered with fairy webs of ice as though a thousand winter spiders had spun threads of frozen water. Above, an enchanted forest of icicles grew downward from the cavern roof. So Mergen described it once upon a time, decades ago. The description remained apt though the light was not as golden as I expected, and the delicate filigrees of ice were denser and more complex. The old men seated against the walls, caught up in the webs, were not the wide-eyed men of Mergen's visions, though. They were dead, or asleep. I did not see one open eye, nor did I see one face I recognized. Willow, who are these people? The bitter wind continued to rush through the cavern, which was a dozen feet high and nearly as wide, with a relatively flat floor, side to side. It sloped with the length of the cavern. It looked like ancient, frozen mud covered with a pelt of fine frost fur. Water had run through the cavern in some epoch before the coming of men. These ones? I don't know. They were here when we came down. I leaned closer, but was careful not to touch. These caves are natural. They have that look. Then they've been down here all along. They were here before the plane was built. Possibly. Probably. And whoever buried Kena knew about them. So did the deceivers chased here by Radranak. Huh. This one is definitely deceased. Naturally mummified, but definitely gone. The corpse was all dried out. Bare bones showed at a folded knee and tattered elbow. These others? Who knows? Maybe the right sorcery could get them up and running around like Iqbal's kids. Why would we get them up? We're here to get the guys that me and Ketcher buried, right? They're on up there. He pointed upslope where the light was even less golden, becoming almost an icy blue. The light was not bright, not nearly so much so as in the vision I had experienced. Maybe it was more a psychic witch light than a physical one, more suited to the dreamwalker's eye. I mused. They might be able to tell us something interesting. I'll tell you something interesting, Swan muttered to himself in a normal voice, for my benefit, he said. I don't think so. At least I don't think it would be anything any of us would want to hear. Ketcher took extreme pains to avoid even touching them. Getting the captives passed without disturbing them was the hardest work we did. 
I bent to examine another of the old men. He did not look like he belonged to any race I knew. They must be from one of the other worlds. Maybe. There's a saying where I grew up. Let sleeping dogs lie. Sounds like exquisitely appropriate advice. We don't know why they were put down here. I have no intention of releasing any devil tree but our own. These men here aren't the same as those. There were several different groups last time. I doubt that that's changed. I got the feeling that they were dumped here at different times. See how much less ice there is around these guys? Makes me think it takes centuries to accumulate. Ow! What? I banged my head on this damned rock icicle thing. Hmm. I must have overlooked it somehow. Get smart and I'll punch you in the kneecap, Lofty. Does it feel like it's colder in there than it ought to be? It was not my imagination, and not the icy wind either. Always. His grin had gone away. It's them, I think. Starting to realize somebody's here. It keeps building up. It can get on your nerves if you pay any attention to it. I could feel the growth of whatever it was. Insanity becoming palpable, I suppose. That was the impression, anyway. How come we're able to move around in here? I asked. Why aren't we frozen? We'd probably end up that way if we stayed long enough to fall asleep. These people all had to be unconscious when they were brought down here. Really? We were up where there was less ice. The frost on the floor still betrayed the tracks left by Soulcatcher and Willow Swan years ago. The old men here were different. They resembled Yuang Bo, except for one, who had been tall, thin, and extremely pale. But they don't stay asleep? Several pairs of open eyes seemed to track me. I hoped it was my imagination, stimulated by the spookiness of the cave. I never actually saw any movement. Footsteps. I jumped hip-high to a short elephant before I realized that it had to be Sara and the Radisha, and whoever else had decided not to participate in all those exciting projects that were underway upstairs. Go keep those people from stomping in here and messing everything up. I'll get an idea of the layout and try to figure out what we'll have to do. Swan scowled and growled and grunted, then minced carefully back down the slight slope toward the stairwell. He talked to himself all the way. And I did not blame him. Even I thought nothing ever went right for him. I took a step in the direction the old footprints led. My boots went out from under me. I hit hard, then slid downhill until I caught up with Swan, who did a convincing job of acting amused after he stopped me. You all right? Bruised my side. Hurt my wrist. I should have told you. That floor can be pretty slippery, where there's a lot of frost. You're lucky I don't swear. Um, you forgot on purpose. You're as bad as one eye or goblin. Did I just hear my name taken in vain? One Eye's voice, punctuated by rasping panting more suitable to a lunger, came from the shadows down where the stair intercepted the cavern. God is great. God is good. God is the all-knowing and all-merciful. His plan is hidden but just. And save me from the mystery of his plan, because all I ever get is the misery of his plan. What is he doing down here? I asked Swan. I know. I'll leave him behind. I know I'm definitely not going to carry him up out of here just so he doesn't suffer another stroke from the effort. Hit him over the head when he isn't looking. I began moving deeper into the cave again. I'm going to try this one more time. Beneath my breath, I continued my conversation with God. As usual, he did not trouble himself to defend his works to me. My fault for being a woman. I nearly missed the transition from the ancient Nguyen Bo types to company men because the first few modern bodies belonged to Nguyen Bo bodyguards. 
I halted only when I reached and recognized a Nguyenbo bodyguard named Pham Quang. I studied him for a moment. I backed up carefully. When you looked for it, the boundary was evident. My brothers and their allies had several centuries less frost accumulation upon them. They had only just begun to develop the delicate webbings that encased the older bodies. That seemed awfully fast, actually, considering how long some of the others must have been buried. Possibly Soulcatcher had indulged in a little artistry during her visit. Interspersed with my brothers were several bodies so ancient that they had become completely cocooned. I intuited them as bodies only because the chrysalises slumped just like the captured did. I thought, it might be worthwhile having one eye along after all. Down here, Soulcatcher might have taken time to set a trap or two, just for the devil of it. The Nar generals Isi and Okiba sat against the cave wall opposite Pham Quang. Okiba's eyes were open. They did not move, but did seem fixed on me. I hunkered down, got as close as I could without touching him. Those brown pools were moist. There was no dust on their surfaces, nor any frost. They had opened quite recently. A chill crawled down my spine. A very creepy feeling came over me. I felt like I was walking among the dead. In the far north, whence Swan came carrying travelers' tales, some religions supposedly pictured hell as a cold place. My imagination, running with the terror that my brother's situation sparked, had no trouble picturing this cave as a suburb of hell. I rose carefully and moved away from Okiba. Now the cave floor was almost perfectly level. My brothers were not crowded together. The rest seemed to be scattered along the next several hundred feet, not all immediately visible because of a turn in the cave. A few old cocoon men were interspersed with them. I see the lance, I announced, which was wonderful. Now we could split into two parties and have both retain their capacity for accessing the plane. My voice echoed like there was a chorus of me all talking at the same time. Hitherto, Swan and I tried to speak softly. The echoes had been little more than ghostly whispers, although extremely busy even at that level. Keep it down, one eye said. What are you doing, little girl? You don't have any idea what you're dealing with here. He had gotten past Swan somehow and was headed my way. He was awfully damned spry for a 200-year-old stroke victim. This business had him truly excited. That left me suspicious, but I had no time to try reasoning out what angle the man might have. I looked into another pair of eyes, these belonging to a long, bony, pallid man who had to be the sorcerer Long Shadow. Long Shadow was a prisoner of the company. He had been brought along because neither Croker nor Lady trusted anyone else to guard him, and he could not be exterminated because the health of the Shadow Gate insofar as they had known, was dependent upon his continued well-being. And well that they had been so distrustful. It would be a much different and more terrible world if the Shadow Master had been left behind to tinker at whatever wickedness took his fancy. Soulcatcher's evil was capricious and unfocused. Long Shadow's malice and insanity were deep and abiding. That insanity stared out of his eyes right then. On my mental checklist, I made a tick that meant this one would stay right where he was. Others might have plans for him, but they were not in charge. If we could work out how to strengthen our world's shadow gate, maybe we could even execute him. I continued moving, working my silent triage, constantly bemused because there were so many faces that I did not recognize. A lot of men who had enlisted while I was away from the center of the action. Oh, darn! What? One eye was only a few steps behind me, gaining ground fast. His voice seemed to rattle as it echoed. 
It's Weezer. The stasis didn't take for him. One eye grunted, evidently indifferent. Old Weezer came from the same tribe one eye did, although Weezer was more than a century younger than the wizard. There had never been any affection between them. He had a better run than he deserved. Weezer had been old and dying of consumption when he joined the company during its passage southward decades ago. And he had continued to survive despite his infirmities and despite all the trials the company had endured. Here's Candles and Cletus. They're gone too. And a couple of Nguyen Bo and two Shadar I don't recognize. Something happened here. This makes seven dead men all in a clump. Don't move, little girl. Don't touch anything before I have a chance to look it over. I froze. It was time to acknowledge his expertise. Chapter 85 I haven't found them yet, I snapped at Sarah and the Radisha. I don't want to go any farther if one eye can't assure me that I'm not going to kill somebody just by being here. Against all advice, those two had pushed as far forward as I would let them go. I could understand that they wanted to see their husbands and brothers and boyfriends, but they ought to have sense enough to restrain themselves until we knew what we could and could not do without risking harm to those very husbands and brothers and boyfriends. Sara gave me a sharp, hurt look. Sorry, I said insincerely. Come on, think. You can see that the stasis down here didn't work for everyone. Swan, how far up this tunnel do we have to go? I could see a scatter of eight recumbent forms between myself and the curve, none of whom were immediately recognizable as the Captain, Lady, Mergen, Ty Day, Cordy Mather, or Blade. From where we stand now, roughly eleven people still aren't accounted for. I don't remember, Swan grumped. Base echoes chased one another around the cavern. They were worse with my higher-pitched voice, though. Memory spell wearing off? I don't think so. This feels more like something I never knew. I'm still a whole lot confused about what went on down here. One big problem was that none of us really knew exactly how many captured there were. Swan was the best witness because he had ridden with them, but he had not kept track, other than of key people. Mergen never had been any help, because after he had become one of the captured, he had apparently become unable to explore the immediate vicinity where he was confined. We need to get Mergen awake first thing. Nobody else will know all the names and faces. It seemed probable that some of the people I did not recognize just were not part of the company. One Eye, figure out how to wake these people up. As soon as I find Mergen, I want to get him into talking condition. Can I go ahead? Squabbling echoes reminded me to keep my voice down. Crabbly, One Eye responded, Yes, just don't touch anybody, or even anything that you don't recognize, and stop trying to rush me. Can you bring them out of stasis? I don't know yet, do I? I've been too damned busy answering dumb questions. Leave me alone long enough, and I might figure it out, though. Tempers were getting short and manners were becoming frayed. I sighed, rubbed my forehead and temples because I had begun to develop a headache, listened to the sounds of more people descending the stair. Willow, see if you can keep those fools out of here till one eye's ready. I looked ahead without eagerness. Not only did the cavern turn to the right, it steepened. The water-polished floor was covered with frost. The footing was going to be treacherous. Ah! The white crow was up there somewhere. It had been announcing itself repeatedly, sounding more impatient every time. 
I moved forward carefully. When I reached the steeper floor, I knelt and brushed the frost away to improve the footing. I told Sara and the Radisha, If you have to follow me, you'd better be even more careful than I am. They insisted. They were careful. Not one of us slipped and went flailing back down the slope. Here's Longo and Sparkle, I said. And that wad definitely looks like the Howler. In fact, that wad definitely was that crippled little master sorcerer. He had been one of the lady's henchmen in the far north, then our enemy down here. He had become a prisoner of war along with his ally Longshadow, and Lady must have foreseen some use for him or she would not have kept him alive. But he was not likely to get released while I was in charge. In his way, he was crazier than Soul Catcher. The crow chided me for taking so long. The howler was awake. His will was such that he could move his eyes, though nothing more was within his capacity. One glimpse of the madness within those dark orbs, and I knew that this man could not be permitted to make it back to the world. Be very careful around this one, I said, or he'll nail you as surely as Soul Catcher nailed Swan. One eye. Howler is awake. He can move his eyes. One eye repeated my warning absentmindedly. Don't get too close to him. The crow began to nag. Its voice gave birth to a particularly annoying generation of echoes. Ah, Radisha, here's your brother, and he seems to be in pretty good shape. No, don't touch. That's probably what contaminated the stasis spells protecting the dead men. You'll just have to be patient, same as the rest of us. She made a sound like a low growl. The icy cave ceiling above us made creaking sounds that added to the volleys of echoes. I continued. It's hard. I know it's hard. But right now patience is the best tool we have for getting them out of here safely. Once I was sure she would restrain herself, I resumed inching forward. The white crow cawed impatiently. Out loud, I thought, I do believe I'll wring that thing's neck. The Radisha reminded me, You'll build bad karma. You might come back as a crow or parrot in your next life. One of the beauties of being Vedna is that you don't have a next life to worry about. And God, the all-powerful, the merciful, has no love at all for crows, except to use as plagues upon the unrighteous. Does anybody know if Master Centaraxita planned to come down here? My organizational skills had vanished because of my own eagerness to reach the captured. It occurred to me only now that the scholar's knowledge might prove especially useful here. If he could connect anything in this cave to known myth... I got no answer. I'll send for him if I have to. Ah, Sara, here's your honey. Don't touch! I said that a little too loudly. The echoes got very boisterous. Several small icicles broke loose from the ceiling. They shattered with an almost metallic twinkle when they struck the floor. The crow spoke very distinctly. Come here. And I, having finally figured it out, told it, If your manners don't improve dramatically, you might not get out of here at all. The bird was strutting back and forth nervously in front of Croker and Lady. Soul Catcher had left those two snuggled up together, arranged so that the captain had one arm around Lady's waist, while she held his other hand with both of hers in her lap. Additional delicate touches suggested that Soul Catcher's wicked sense of play had peaked for this bit of still life. If Catcher had left any booby traps at all, this was where they would be. One eye, I need help. Any traps that existed were beyond me. Lady's eyes were open. 
There was no dust on them. She was angry. And the white crow wanted to tell me all about it. Patience, I counseled, close to becoming impatient myself. Swan, one eye, come on up here. Swan arrived first, despite coming from farther away. I asked, You recall anything special she did with these two? Any little bit of sneakiness? No, I wouldn't worry about it. By the time she laid them out, she was worried about what might happen next. That's the way she is. When she's starting something, it's her whole world, and she has no doubts about any part of it. But the closer she comes to getting finished, the more trouble she has keeping her confidence up. Nice to know that she's human. I did not mean a word of that. One eye, look for booby traps around here. And make up your mind. Tell me if you can bring these people back, darn it. My headache had not gotten any better. But, thank the God of mercies, it had grown no worse. Another icicle fell. I know, I know, I heard you the first time you asked. He grumbled something about wishing he knew a way to charm me up a better love life. I stared past Croker and Lady. The cavern went on. Pale light barely illuminated it. There was no gold in that at all now. A touch of silver, a touch of gray, a lot of blue ice. In fact, the sedimentary rocks seemed to give way to actual ice now. Ahead. Willow, did Ketcher go up there when you were here? He checked where I was looking. No, but she could have during an earlier visit. Someone had traveled in that direction recently in cavern scales of time. There were still clear tracks in the frost, and I suspected that I would not enjoy the journey once I began to follow them. But I would do so. I had no choice. I had failed elsewhere by letting Narion and the Daughter of Night get away. That Kina undoubtedly supplied them with a subtle boost did not sufficiently signify... I should have been better prepared. One Eye, talk to me. Can you resurrect these people or not? If you'd stop barking for five minutes, I could probably figure that out. Take your time, sweetness. It'll take us a while to starve. That ice up there must have been what Swan had meant when he mentioned ice on the plain. You've had all the fool around time I'm willing to give you, I told One Eye. Can you do it, yes or no, right now? The ship I'm in. I need more rest. His speech was slow and slurred and had taken on an odd rhythm that made following him difficult. He was right, of course. All of us needed rest but we also needed to finish our business and get off the plane. Hunger was a reality already. It was not going to go away. I feared it might become a companion as intimate and dreaded as it had been during the siege of Jaikur. I had decided, already, that I would adopt Uncle Doge's suggested strategy. We would recover only a few people now. We would return for the others later, but that meant making cruel choices. Somebody would end up hating me no matter what I did. If I was really clever, I would find some good old-fashioned goblin-like way of spreading the blame all around me. Those tagged to wait could not hate everybody. And there went some good old-fashioned wishful thinking, Sleepy. We were talking about human beings. If there is any way to be contrary, unreasonable, and obnoxious, Human beings are sure to find and pursue it, with verve and enthusiasm at whatever might be the most inconvenient time. Chapter 86 Is anybody at all still up topside? I demanded. I had settled down for a short nap when the timing had seemed appropriate, and that had turned into a long nap that might have become a permanent nap 
had not so many people been around to keep me from drifting too far away. I dreamed while I was out. I knew that, but I remembered none of it. The smell of Kina remained strong in my nostrils, so I knew where I must have gone, though. One eye was seated beside me, apparently assisting me with my snoring. A worried goblin appeared, checking to make certain his best friend did not drift too far into sleep. Beyond me, Mother Goda had become engrossed in a protracted debate with the white crow. That must have been a classic dialogue to disinterested listeners. Goblin murmured, From now on, don't make any sudden movement, Sleepy. Always look around you. Always make sure that you're not going to damage any of our friends. I heard Tobo talking rapidly, softly, in a business-like voice. I could not distinguish his words. Somewhere Uncle Doge rattled away, too. What's happening? We've started waking them up. It's not as complicated as we feared it might be, but it takes time and care, and the people we bring out aren't going to be any use to us after they waken. If you had any plans along those lines, one eye worked it all out before he collapsed. The little wizard sounded grimmer suddenly. Collapsed? One eye collapsed? Was it just exhaustion? I hoped. I don't know. I don't want to know. Yet. For now, I'm just going to let him rest. Right down on the edge of the stasis. Or even into it, if I think that's necessary. Once his body regains its strength, I'll bring him out and see how bad it really was. He did not sound optimistic. I said, If we had to, we could leave him here in stasis till we could give him proper treatment. Which reminded me, You're not just getting everyone up, are you? There's no way we can nurse and feed the whole crowd. Surely the captured would not be able to take care of themselves after fifteen years of just sitting around, stasis or not. They might even be as weak and unskilled as babies and have to learn everything all over again. No, Sleepy. We're going to do five people. That's all. Um, good. Hey, where the heck did the standard go? It was right over there. I'm the standard bearer. I have to keep track. I had it moved over by the gap to the stair. So somebody going that way can take it upstairs. We quit fussing. That's Sara's specialty. Speaking of Sara, Tobo, where do you think you're going? While I was talking with Goblin, the boy had slipped past and headed up the cave. I was just gonna go see what's up there. No. You're just going to stay right here and help your uncle and goblin take care of your father, the captain and the lieutenant. He gave me a black look. Despite everything, he still had those moments when he was just a boy. He put on a pouty face that made me grin. Willow Swan came up behind me. I've got a problem, Sleepy. Which would be? I can't find Cordy. Cordy Mather. Not anywhere. From the corner of my eye, I noted that the Radisha had overheard. She rose slowly from a squat in front of her brother, looked our way. She said nothing nor did anything otherwise that might betray an interest. It was not common knowledge that she and Mather had enjoyed an intimate relationship. You're sure? I'm sure. You did bring him down here? Absolutely. I grunted. There was one other absentee whose non-presence I had been willing to ignore until some rational excuse for her disappearance arose. The shapeshifter, Lisa Bowalk, unable to shed the guise of a black panther, had gone up onto the plain as a prisoner, but was not now to be found among the dead above or the captured down below. Lisa Bowalk had been possessed of a towering hatred for the company 
and particularly for one eye because it was one eye's fault that she had become trapped in the feline shape. I had to ask, What about the panther, Willow? It's not around here anywhere either. What panther? Oh, I remember. I don't know. He was looking around like he thought he might spot his old friend Mather hiding behind a stalagmite. I remember we had to leave her upstairs because we couldn't get her cage around the first turn in the stair. I mean, it would have gone if Ketcher and I didn't have anything else to mess with. But we couldn't manage it, and the rest of the string both. So Ketcher decided to leave the cage up there for later. I don't know what happened when later came. I don't remember much of anything that happened after we came down here. Maybe one eye should give me another dose of that memory spell. He tugged on and twisted the ends of his hair, girl style, and stared down the slope. I know I left Cordy right down there, just a little above Blade, where it seemed like the floor would be more comfortable. Right down there was the downhill edge of the clot of seven dead men. There had to be a connection. Goblin, what's the story? Are we going to wake these people up or not? Me ignoring everything he had said earlier, Goblin responded with a sneer that turned into one of his big toad grins. I've already got Mergen out. But I wanted him down here where I could ask questions. I mean, I've got him out of stasis, bimbo brain. He's right over there. I'm working on the captain and lady now. Tobo and Doge have been doing prelims on Thai Day and the Prabindra Dra. Exactly according to my expectations, with the latter two men included entirely for political reasons, neither was likely to contribute much to the company's glory or survival. I moved down to where Mergen lay snoring. The echoing racket and the melting ice webs were the only changes I saw. I squatted. Anybody think to bring blankets down? I had not. I am what you would have to call disorganized when it comes to present tense operations. It had not occurred to me to bring spare clothing or blankets or gear. But I sure can plan bloodshed and general mayhem real well. There were treasure chambers down here somewhere, though. I had glimpsed several in my dreams. There might be something useful there, if we could find them. My stomach growled. I was getting hungry. The rumble reminded me that it would not be long before our situation became desperate. Mergen's eyes opened. He tried to form an expression, a smile for Sarah. But the effort was too much for him. His gaze shifted to me. A whisper struggled through his lips. The books get the daughter. His eyes closed again. It was true. The captured were not going to jump up and dance tarantellas when they were liberated. Mergen's message was clear. The books of the dead were down here. Something had to be done before the Daughter of Night got another chance to begin copying them. And I had no doubt that she would manage that, despite Soulcatcher. She had Kina backing her up. I'll take care of it. I did not have a ghost of a notion how I would manage that, though. Chapter 87 The rescue was running smoothly, like a well-greased siege engine missing only a few minor parts. Goblin had Mergen and Croker headed toward the surface aboard makeshift litters. Croker had not said a word, nor had he made any effort to do so. Even though he had been awake and aware, he stared at me for a long time. I had no idea what was going on inside his head. I just hoped he was sane. Before he departed, Mergen did give my hand a small squeeze. I hoped that was an expression of gratitude or encouragement. I was not at all happy about his being unable to provide information or advice. I had not thought much about what role I would play after the captured were awakened. I had operated on the unspoken assumption, more or less, 
that I would retire to my annals, or even farther, to the standard bearer job, if Mergen wanted to be analyst again. More and more people kept coming downstairs, even though I had tried to send word up to warn everyone that they faced a horrible climb going in the other direction. The white crow continued to curse and jabber semi-coherently, until it lost its voice. I was concerned about Lady. She had managed that feathery spy quite well for a long time, never giving herself away, even when she did try to clue me in. But now she seemed to be losing control. Of herself. I assured her repeatedly that she would go upstairs as soon as I had bearers capable of getting her there. Doge, Sara, and Goda had tie day ready to travel. I gave them the go-ahead. One eye would follow him. Then Lady would go. The Prabrindra Dra would be the last this time. Tobo seemed fascinated by his father, apparently because he could not quite believe that the man was real in a fleshy sense. Circumstances had kept his parents separate almost since his conception. The boy started to tag along after the rest of the family. I called out, Tobo! Stay down here. You have a job to do. See about your dad after we get Lady and the Prince moved out. Hello, Suvran. Why are you down here? Curiosity. Sri Santaraksita's curiosity. He insisted that he had to see the caverns. He drove me crazy, reminding me how storied they are in religious legend. He couldn't be this close to something like that and not explore it personally. I see. I noticed the old librarian now. He was working his way up the line of old men, examining each and murmuring to himself. Occasionally, he would bounce up and down in excitement. Swan had gone back to make him keep his hands to himself. He wanted to finger and sniff every bit of ancient metal and cloth, he seemed to have trouble understanding that those old men were still alive but very vulnerable. Swan, bring him up here. I did want the benefit of his expertise just a while ago. In a softer voice, I told Suvran, You're the one who's going to carry him back upstairs if he can't make it on his own. And I'll be right behind you, giving encouragement by poking you with a spear. Suvran seemed to have thought about the climb already. He was not looking forward to it either. The man has no concept, I interrupted. What about Shivetya? He's back right side up and safely away from the pit. I can't say he seemed particularly grateful, though. He say or do something? No, it was his expression. And that was probably because we dropped him on his nose once. I think I'd have trouble being grateful for a pop in the snoot myself. Santaraxita was puffing when he joined us. He was excited. We're walking the actual roads of myth, Dorabi. I have begun begging the lords of light to let me live long enough to report my adventures to the Badralok. Who will call you a liar over and over again? Sri. You know the right people don't become involved in actual adventures. All of you, follow me now. We're going to have another actual adventure traveling into mythology. I headed on up the steepening slope. I soon discovered that someone had gone this way before me. At first, I suspected Tobo had gotten farther than I had thought. Then I decided that the disturbances in the frost were too old for that, so concluded that Soul Catcher must have gone back this way, just to see what she could see. Back there, small side caves entered the main cavern, few of them large enough to permit passage of an adult body. The main cave dwindled in diameter. We had to hunch down, then we had to crawl. Whoever had gone before us had done the same. Do you know what you're doing? Swan asked. Do you know where you're going? Of course I do. Leadership tip. Sound confident even when you have no idea. Just do not make a habit of it. They will find you out. I had been through here in my dreams. 
but only sort of, evidently, because every few feet I ran into some detail I did not recall from those nightmares. And then we stumbled onto something that was far more than a mere detail. The sole of a boot nearly smacked me in the face because I was concentrating on trying to decipher the story encrypted in the frost on the cave floor. That was the story of someone who had been moving wildly, maybe in a panic. Not only had the frost been rubbed away in places, the stone itself was bruised or chipped. I think I've found Mather, Willow. It was one of those odd moments when you discover the trivial. I noticed that Cordy Mather really needed to have his boots resold. I did not immediately wonder how a man's leg could stick out like that, with the toe pointing halfway upward above horizontal, while the man himself was lying on his stomach. We'd better stop right here and take a good look. I don't see the man doing this to himself. Swan said, I'll get Goblin. Don't do anything till he gets here. Don't sweat it. I'm fond of my hide. If I lose it, I'll miss out on our honeymoon. I drew my sword, for what good that might do. Then raised up slowly till the top of my head bumped the cavern roof. Cordy Mather had crawled over a hump in the floor, and something fatal had happened to him before he could get all of himself onto the downward side. Suvren eased up beside me. Inexplicably, I found myself painfully aware of him as a masculine presence. Luckily, he was even less interpersonally adept than I was. He failed to notice my flustered and uncomfortable reaction. Odd. The urge was not something I would pursue, certainly. I just wondered why I sometimes suffered these sudden, random impulses, some of which were extremely difficult to resist. Ninety-nine percent of the time, I did not so much as think about the possibility of combining myself, a man, and a bed in a search for adventure. Maybe I should not have been teasing Swan. Suvren said, That sure doesn't look very appetizing. What do you think happened? I'm not even going to guess. I'm just going to sit here and wait for the expert to show up. May I look? St. Araxita asked. Suvren scooted back. He discovered that the older man was too broad to pass by him there. So we all had to retreat twenty yards so St. Araxita could get past us, in turn. I admonished him repeatedly not to go farther forward than I had. I definitely don't want to have to drag you out of here. Though I will grant that the man was a great deal leaner now than when I had worked for him. And because you want to get home to tell the Badgerloke all about this. You were right about them, Doraby. They won't believe a word I say. And not only because they're the right people, but because Surendranath Santaraktita never had an adventure in his life. He never had the urge until this adventure had him. Rich men have dreams. Poor men die to make them come true. You persist in amazing me, Dorabi. Who are you quoting? VTC Ghosh. He was an acolyte of B.B. Mukherjee, one of the six Bomparan disciples of Sondel Ghosh, the Janaka. Santaraxita's face lit right up. Dorabi, you are a marvel indeed, a wonder of wonders. The pupil begins to exceed the master. What was your source? I don't recall ever having read of a Ghosh or a Mukherjee featured in the Janaka school. I snickered like a prankster kid. That's because I was pulling your leg. I made it up, Sri. And that seemed to leave him even more amazed. Goblin broke it up. Swan says you found a dead man. Yes. It looks like Cordy Mather from this end. I didn't see his face, though. I wasn't going to move anything anywhere until we had a good idea what happened to him. I'd rather it didn't happen to me. Goblin grunted. Pudge man, you want to get down here so I can get past you? This tunnel gets pretty tight, don't it? 
Watch out you don't let your chubby butt plug it up. For how come you don't want to go slithering around back here anyway, Sleepy? Because if I keep going this way far enough, I'll get to the place where the deceivers concealed the original books of the dead. Goblin gave me a funny look, but took my word for it. I talked to ghosts and mist machines. Birds talked to me. A talking bird was following me right now, at a distance. At the moment, it did not have much to say because its throat was sore. But it did manage to rip out a curse or two whenever it had to dodge somebody's flailing feet. That's interesting. I thought so. Ah, yeah. It's not sorcery, though. It's your basic mechanical booby trap. Spring-loaded. Stabs you with a poisoned pen. There are probably twenty more between here and where you want to go. What do you think Mather was trying to do? If he woke up and found himself down here and didn't know where he was or what had happened to him, he might have panicked and taken off and just went in the wrong direction. I bet it's his fault all those guys back there are dead. He probably tried to wake them up. Goblin grunted again. There, that's disarmed. I'd better go ahead and see what else is waiting. But first, we need to get Mather pulled back so you all can get past him. If you can weasel past him, so can I. Yeah, you can. But what about your boyfriend and your sugar daddy? They've got a little more pork on them. He grunted and cursed softly as he fought Mather's remains back over the hump in the floor. I noticed for the first time that the echoes were different in this more confined space, jammed with bodies. They were almost non-existent. Chapter 88 I do not believe it was miles to where the deceivers of antiquity concealed their treasures and relics, but my body believed that before we got there. Goblin disarmed another dozen traps and found several more that had fallen victim to time. The underground wind whimpered and whined as it rushed past us in the tight places. It sucked the warmth right out of me, but it did not dissuade me. I went where I wanted to go and was hungry enough to eat a camel when I got there. It had been a long, long time since breakfast. I had a dread feeling it could be longer still before supper. It feels like a temple, doesn't it? Suvran asked. He was less troubled than the rest of us, though raised nearer this place than anyone else. He was less intimate with the legends of the Dark Mother. He stopped staring at the three lecterns and the huge books they bore long enough to turn to me and whisper, Here. He offered me a bit of crumbling flax cake from the pouch he wore at the small of his back. You must have read my mind. You talk to yourself a lot. I don't think you realize you're doing it. I did not. It was a bad habit that needed breaking right now. I heard you when you were crawling through the tunnel. That had been a private discourse with my god, an internal dialogue I had thought. The subject of food had come up, and here was food. So maybe the all-merciful was on the job after all. Thanks. Goblin, you feel any tricks or traps in here? There were echoes again, though with a different timbre. We were inside a large chamber. The floor and walls were all ice that had been cut and polished by the flow of frigid water. I presumed the invisible ceiling was the same. The place did have a feel of the holy to it, even though that was the holiness of darkness. No traps that I can sense. I think they'd leave that sort of stuff outside, don't you? He sounded like he wanted to convince himself. You're asking me to define the psychology of those who worship devils and rakshasas? Vedna priests would guarantee you that there's nothing so foul or evil as to be beyond the capacity of those most accursed of unbelievers. I thought they would guarantee it. If they had heard of the Stranglers, I had not heard of them before I became attached to the company. 
Suvran said, Shri, I don't think you should... Master Santaraxita had recognized the ancient books as something remarkable and just could not resist going up for an up-close look. I agreed with Suvran. Master, don't go charging... The noise sounded something like someone ripping tent canvas for half a second, then popped like the crack of a whip. Master Santaraxita left the floor of the unholy chapel, folded around his middle, and flew at the rest of us in an arc that admitted only slight acquaintance with gravity. Suvran tried to catch him. Goblin tried to duck. Santaraxita bounced Suvran sideways and ricocheted into me. The lot of us ended up in a breathless tangle of arms and legs. The white crow had something uncomplimentary to say about that. You and me and a stew pot, critter, I gasped when I got my breath back. I snagged Goblin's leg. No more traps, eh? They'd leave that sort of thing out in the caverns, eh? What the devil was that, then? That was a magical booby trap, woman, and a damned fine example of its kind, too. It remained undetectable until Santa Raxita tripped it. Sri, are you injured? I asked. Only my pride, Doraby, he puffed. Only my pride. It'll take me a week to get my wind back, though. He rolled off Suvran, got onto his hands and knees. He had a definite green look to him. You've enjoyed a cheap lesson then, I told him. Don't rush into something when you don't know what you're rushing into. You'd think I'd know that after this last year, wouldn't you? You might think yes. Don't anybody ask how Junior is doing? Suvran grumbled. He couldn't possibly get hurt. We knew you'd be fine, Goblin told him. As long as he landed on your head. The little wizard limped forward. As he neared the point where Centaraxita had gone airborne, he became very cautious. He extended a single finger forward one slow inch at a time. A smaller piece of cloth ripped. Goblin spun around, his arm flung backward. He staggered a couple of steps forward. He fell to his knees not far from me. After all this time, he finally recognizes the natural order of things. Goblin shook his hand the way you do when you burn your fingers. Damn, that's smart. That's a good spell. It's got real pop. Don't do that. Suvran had decided to throw a chunk of ice. On its way back, the missile parted Suvran's hair. It then hit the cavern wall and showered the white crow with fragments of ice. The bird had a word to say about that. It followed up with a few more. I began to wonder if Lady had lost track of the fact that she was not, herself, the white crow, and in fact was just a passenger making use of the albino's eyes. Goblin stuck his injured finger in his mouth, squatted down and considered the chamber for a while. I squatted too after taking time out to keep Suvran and Master Centaraxita from making even greater nuisances of themselves. Swan slithered into the chamber, disturbing the crow. The bird said nothing, though. It just sidled away and looked put out about all existence. Swan settled beside me. Wow, kind of impressive, even though it's simple. Those are the original books of the dead supposedly almost as old as Kina herself. So why is everybody just sitting here? Goblin's trying to figure out how to get them. I told him what had happened. Damn, I always miss the best stuff. Hey, Junior, run up there and show us your flying trick again. Master Santaraxita did the flying, Mr. Swan. Suvran needed to work on his sense of humor. He did not own a proper black company attitude. I asked, Why not try it yourself, Willow? Take a run at the books. You promise to let me land on you? No, but I'll blow you a kiss as you fly by. It'd probably help if you people would shut up, Goblin said. He rose. 
but by being blindingly, blisteringly brilliant, I've worked it out anyway, already, in spite of you all. We get to the lecterns by using the golden pickaxe as a passkey. That was why Narion Singh was so upset when he saw what we had. Tobo still has the pick, I said. A minute later, I said, Don't everybody stumble all over each other offering to go get him. Let's just go together and all be equally miserable, Goblin suggested. That's what the Black Company is all about, sharing the good times along with the bad. You trying to con me into thinking that this is one of the good times? I asked, crawling into the cave right behind him. Nobody wants to kill us today. Nobody's trying. That sounds like a good time to me. He had a point, a definite point. Maybe my company attitude needed attention, too. Behind me, Shuvrin grumbled about starting to feel like a gopher. I glanced back. Swan had had an attack of good sense and decided to bring up the rear, thereby making sure that Master Centaraxita did not stay behind and tinker with things that might cause a change in Goblin's opinion about this being one of the good times. Where did he go? I mused aloud. People were still working in the cave of the ancients, getting Lady and the Prabindra Dra ready to go upstairs. But Tobo was not among them. He wouldn't just run upstairs, would he? He had the energy of youth, but nobody was so energetic they would just charge into that climb on impulse. While I tromped around muttering and looking for the kid, Goblin did the obvious and questioned witnesses. He got an answer before I finished building up a good mad. Sleepy. He left. Surprise, surprise. What? That was not all of it. The little wizard was upset. He turned right when he left, Sleepy. He... Oh. Now I did have a good mad worked up. A booming, head-throbbing, want-to-make-somebody-pay-real-bad mad. That idiot! That moron! That darn fool! Oh, cut his legs off! Let's see if we can catch him. Wright was downward. Wright was deeper into the earth and time, deeper into despair and darkness. Wright could only be the road to the resting place of the Mother of Night. As I started out, with intent to turn right, I collected the standard. The white crow shrieked approval. Goblin sneered. You're going to be sorry before you go down a hundred steps, sleepy. I was tempted to abandon the darn thing before we had gone that far. It was too long to be dragging around in a stairwell. Chapter 89 this stair has no bottom, I told Goblin. We were puffing badly despite the direction we were headed. We had passed openings into other caves the stairwell had pierced. Each appeared to have been visited by human beings sometime in the past. We discovered both treasures and boneyards. I suspected Sri Santaraxita, Baladitya, and I could not live long enough just to catalog all the mysteries buried beneath the plain and every darned unknown ancient thing I glimpsed in passing called to me like the sirens of legend. But Tobo was still ahead of us and seemed deaf to our calling. Perhaps just as we did not waste time and breath responding to Suvern and Centaraxita, who kept calling down to us from ever farther behind. It was my devout hope they would be smitten by good sense and abandon the pursuit. Goblin did not respond to my remarks. He had no breath left over. I asked, Can't you use some kind of spell to slow him down or knock him out? I'm worried. He really can't be so far ahead that he can't hear us. Darn. I had gotten tangled with the standard again. Goblin just shook his head and kept moving. He can't hear. Puff, puff. But he don't know that he can't hear. Enough said. There was a bottom to the stair. 
and the queen of deceit was napping down there. With just a whisper of awareness left for manipulating a cocky know-it-all boy who had a touch of talent and had taken possession of an instrument that could become a nasty weapon in the hands of those who would disarm her and have her slumber continue never-ending. After a while, we had to slow down. The unnatural light faded until it became too weak to provide a reliable forecast of our footing. The occasional breezes rising past us were no longer cold, and they had begun to bear traces of a familiar, repugnant odor. When Goblin caught that smell, he slowed way down, worked hard on regaining his breath before he had to suck that stench down in its full potency. Been a while since I've come face to face with a god, he said. I don't know if I've got what it takes to wrangle one anymore. And what would that be? I never realized that I was in the company of an experienced god wrangler. It takes youth. It takes confidence. It takes brashness. Most of all, it takes a huge ration of stupidity and a lot of luck. Then why don't we just sit down here and let those sterling qualities carry Tobo through? Though I confess I'm a little nervous about his supply of luck. I'm tempted, Sleepy. Sorely and sincerely. He needs the lesson. Troubled, perhaps even a little frightened, he continued. But he's got the pickaxe, and the company needs him. He's the future. Me and one eye are today and yesterday. He started picking up the pace again, which meant a rapid heightening of the intensity of my skirmish with the standard. What do you mean he's the future? Nobody lives forever, Sleepy. The burst of speed did not last. We encountered a mist that complicated the hazards of darkness. The visibility turned nil, and the footing became particularly treacherous for a short person trying to drag a long pole down a tight, and unpredictable stairway. The moist air was heavier than anything I'd experienced since the fogs above the corpse-choked flood that had surrounded Jaikur during the siege. A chilling shriek came from far back up the stair. My mind flooded with images of horrors pouncing gleefully upon Suvern and Master Centaraxita. The shriek continued, approaching faster than any human being could possibly descend that stairway. What the hell is that? Goblin snapped. I don't... The shrieking stopped. At the same time, I stepped down, and there was no more down to step. I staggered, betrayed by the darkness. The lance banged into overhead and wall. We had reached another landing. I assumed, until I felt around with my toes and the standard and could find no more edge. What do you have over there? I asked. Steps behind me. A wall to the right that goes forward about six feet, then ends. All level floor. I've got a wall on the left that just keeps going on, and a level floor. Gah! Something slammed into my back. I had only an instant of warning. The sound of wings violently flapping as a large bird tried to stop before it hit. The white crow cursed as it landed on the floor. It flopped around for a moment, then started climbing me. That would have been a sight, I am sure, had there been any light to reveal it. I fought down an impulse to bat the creature into the darkness. I hoped it was here to help. Tobo! My voice rolled away into the distance, then came back in a series of echoes. The heavy air seemed to load those up with despair. The boy did not answer, but he did move. Or something moved. I heard a rustle from less than twenty feet away. Goblin? Talk to me about this. We've been blinded by sorcery. There's light out there. I'm working on getting our sight back. Give me your hand. Let's stick together. The crow murmured. Sister, sister, walk straight ahead. Look bold. You will pass through the darkness. 
its diction had improved dramatically over the past year. Maybe that was because we were so much closer to the force manipulating the bird. I felt around for Goblin, grabbed hold, pulled, dropped the standard, picked it up and pulled again. All right, I'm ready. That crow knew what it was talking about. After a half dozen steps, we transited into a lighted ice cavern. Make that comparatively lighted. Dim gray-blue light leaked in through translucent walls, as though it was high noon, just on the other side of a few feet of ice. Much more light radiated from the vicinity of the woman asleep on a bier at the center of the vast chamber, some seventy feet away. Tobo stood halfway between us and it. Looking backward, completely surprised to see us there, and equally baffled as to where there might be. Don't you move, boy, Goblin snapped. Don't you even take a deep breath until I tell you it's safe to do so. The form on the beer was a little fuzzy, as though surrounded by heat shimmer. And in spite of that, I knew the woman lying there was the most beautiful creature in the world. I knew that I loved her more than life itself, that I wanted to rush over there and drink deeply of those perfect lips. The white crow sneezed in my ear. That certainly took the edge off the mood. Where have we seen all this before? Goblin asked, voice dripping sarcasm. She must be awfully weak, or she'd pluck something better from our minds than a replay of an old Sleeping Beauty fairy tale. There isn't a castle built like this anywhere south of the Sea of Torments. A castle? What? What castle? The word for castle did not exist in Taglian or Jekuri. I knew it meant a kind of fortress, only because I had spent so much time exploring the annals. We seem to be inside the keep of an abandoned castle. There are dormant rose creepers all over the place. There are tons of cobwebs. In the middle of everything is a beautiful blonde woman lying in an open casket. She just begs to be kissed and brought back to life. The part that always gets ignored, and that our ungracious hostess has overlooked here, is that the bitch in the story almost certainly was a vampire. That isn't what I see. Carefully, detail by detail, I described the ice cave and the absolutely not blonde woman I saw lying upon a bier at its center. While I spoke, Goblin finally worked some subtle spell on Tobo that kept him too confused to move. Goblin asked, Do you remember your mother, Sleepy? I vaguely recall a woman who might have been. She died when I was little. Nobody talked about her. We did not need to go into this. We had work to do right here, right now. I hoped he got that message from my tone and expression. What do you want to bet? That what you're seeing is an idolized vision of your mother charged up with a whole lot of sexual come hither. I did not argue. That might be. He knew the artifices of darkness. I did keep moving forward slowly, closing in on Tobo. Which would mean that up close and quickly, she doesn't have a real good connection with what's outside her. Two decades ago, it had become clear that Kina did not think or work well in real time, that she did best when she applied her influence over years rather than minutes. I'm too old to be snared by temptations of the flesh, and you're too unsexed and undefined, he grinned weakly. The kid, on the other hand, is at that age. I'd give a toe or two to see what he sees. Ruff! He gestured. Tobo collapsed like a wet sock. Grab the hammer. Hang on to it hard. Don't get any closer to her than you absolutely have to. Drag Tobo back to the doorway. He sounded old and hollow, and possessed by a despair that he did not want to share. What's going on, Goblin? Talk to me. This was a situation where we ought not to keep dangers to ourselves. We're face to face with the great manipulator who's been disfiguring our lives for 25 years. She's very slow 
but she's far more dangerous than anything we've faced before. I know that. But my reaction was elation. My spirit soared. All my hidden doubts, kept so carefully submerged for so long, now seemed trivial, even silly. This lovely creature was no god. Not like my god is god. Forgive me my weakness and my doubts, O Lord of hosts. The darkness is everywhere and dwells within us all. Forgive me now, when the hour of my death stares me in the face. In forgiveness, he is like the earth. I grabbed hold of Tobo's arm and yanked him upright. I clutched him as tightly as I gripped the standard. He would not break away easily. Disoriented, he did not struggle when I pulled him back from the sleeping form. I averted my eyes. She was beauty incarnate. To gaze upon her was to love her. To love her was to dedicate oneself to her will. To lose oneself within her. O Lord of the hours, watch over and guard me in the presence of the spawn of Al-Shil. I need the pickaxe, Tobo. I tried not to think about why I wanted that unholy tool. At this distance, Kina might be able to pluck that right out of my mind. Moving slowly, Tobo removed the pick from under his shirt and handed it over. Got it, I told Goblin. Then get going. As I started to do that, Suvern and Santaraxita, gasping violently, stumbled into the light. Both froze, staring at Kina. In soft awe, Suvern declared, Holy shit, she's gorgeous. Master Santaraxita seemed to be experiencing some confusion as he stared. Suvern started forward, drooling. I popped him in the funny bone with the dull end of the pick head, that only got his attention. It relaxed his overwhelming interest in Kina. Mother of deceivers, I told him. Mistress of illusion. Turn around. Get the boy out of here. Take him back to his mother. Shri, don't make me hurt you too. Something like a bit of mist rose from and hovered over the sleeping woman's mouth. For an instant, it seemed vaguely man-shaped which reminded me of the Afrits, the unhappy ghosts of murdered men. Millions of such devils could be at Kina's beck. Run, goddammit, Goblin said. Run! The crow told me. I did not run. I got hold of Centaraxita and started pulling. Goblin was talking to himself, something about wishing he had had the good sense to steal one eye's spear if he was going to get himself into something like this. Goblin! I heaved the standard. It was not my intent that it do so, but it stood straight up and bounced a couple of times on its butt before it tipped forward and fell into the little wizard's eager hands. He turned with it as the illusion surrounding Kina evaporated. Chapter 90 If Kina was ever human, if any of the countless forms of myth regarding her creation indeed resembled fact, a lot of work had gone into making her big and ugly. She is the mother of deceivers, Sleepy. The mother of deceivers. That great hideous form covered with pustules from which infant skulls separated could no more be the true aspect of Kina than the sleeping beauties had been. The stench of old death became powerful. I stared at the body, now lying upon the icy floor. It was the dark purple-black of the death dancer of my dreams, but it dwarfed Shivetya. It was naked. Its perfect female proportions distracted from the ten thousand scars that marred its skin. It did not move not even to breathe. Another feather of vapor rose from one huge nostril. Get the fuck out of here, Goblin shrieked. He jerked to the right suddenly, the lance of passion darting towards some target I could not see. The lance's head burned like it was covered by flickering alcohol flames. A huge, 
unheard scream tore at my mind. Suvran and Master Centaraxita moaned. Tobo squealed. The white crow unleashed a random stream of obscenities. I am sure I contributed to the chorus. As I kicked and punched the others to get them going, I realized that my throat was raw. Goblin whirled back to his left, thrusting at the wisp of mist that had left Kina's nostril a moment before. Once again, pale blue fire surrounded the head of the lance. This time it ran a foot up the shaft before it faded. This time the lance's head betrayed pinstrokes of dark ruby glow along its edges. Another wisp of the essence of Kina rose from her nose. There was no darkness or mist hiding the entrance now. Kina's focus was elsewhere. Suvran and Centaraxita were on the stair already, wasting breath babbling about what they had seen. I slugged Tobo upside the head with all the force I could muster. Get out of here! When he opened his mouth to argue, I popped him again. I did not want to hear it. I did not want to hear anything, not even a divine revelation. It could wait. Goblin! Get your sorry butt in motion! We're out of the way! The third wisp impaled itself upon the lance's head. This time the fire crept two yards up the shaft, though it did not seem to affect the wood directly. However, this time the lance's head became so hot that shaft of wood in contact with it began to smolder. Goblin started to back down, but another wisp rose and drifted faster than he moved, getting between him and the stair. He thrust at it a few times, but each time he did, it drifted out of reach. It continued to control his path of retreat. I am no sorceress. Despite a life spent in the proximity of wizards and witch women and whatnot, I have no idea how their minds work when they are involved with their craft. So I will never be clear on what thought process led Goblin to make his decision. But from having known the man most of my life, I have to conclude that he did what he did because he believed it was the most effective thing that he could do. Having failed to skewer the wisp, having noted that a second had appeared and had begun to circle him from the opposite direction, the frog-faced little man just whirled, lowered the head of the lance, and charged Kina. He let out a great mad bellow and drove the weapon through the flesh of an arm and into her ribs below her right breast. And just before the weapon struck home, one wisp flung itself in front, trying to block the thrust. The lance's head was ablaze when it pierced demonic flesh. The second wisp set Goblin aflame. Even screaming, telling me to get out, Goblin continued to heave against the lance, driving it deeper into Kina, possibly in some mad wild hope of penetrating her black heart. The blue flame feasted on Goblin's flesh. He let go of the lance, threw himself to the icy floor, rolled around violently, slapping at himself. Nothing helped. He began to melt like an overheated candle. He screamed and screamed. On that psychic level where I had sensed her moments earlier, Kina also screamed and screamed and screamed. Suvran and Santaraxita screamed, Tobo screamed, I screamed and staggered into the stairwell, retreating despite the urging of that mad part of me that wanted to go back and help Goblin. And there could have been no greater madness than that. The destroyer ruled the cavern of her imprisonment. Goblin had struck a fierce blow, but in truth, its impact was no greater than the nip of a wolf cub at the ear of a dozing tiger. I knew that, and I knew that the cub caught was trying to buy time for the rest of its pack. I gasped. Tobo, go ahead as fast as you can. Tell the others. He was younger. He was faster. He could get there long before I could. He was the future. I would try to keep anything from coming up the stair behind him. The screaming continued down below from both sources.
Goblin was being more stubborn than ever he had been with one eye. We climbed as fast as Master Centaraxita could manage. I stayed behind the other two, already ready to turn and put the unholy pickaxe between us and any pursuit. I was convinced that the power of that talisman would shield us. Darkness no longer inhabited the stair. Visibility was much better than it had been when we came down. So good, in fact, that had there been no landings to break up the line of sight, we would have been able to look up the stairs for a mile. I was gasping for breath and fighting leg cramps before the screaming stopped. Suvran had collapsed once already, losing what little his stomach contained. Master Santaraxitas seemed the hardiest of us now, without a complaint to his name. Though he was so pale, I feared his heart would betray him before long. As we fought for breath, I stared downward, listening to the ominous silence. God is great, gasp. There is no God but God, gasp. In mercy he is like the earth, gasp. He walks with us in all our hours, gasp. O oh Lord of creation, I acknowledge that I am your child. Master Santaraxida had enough spare breath to chide. He's going to get bored and find something else to do if you don't get to the point, Doraby. How's this? Gasp. Help. Better. Much better. Sovereign, get up. The white crow arrowed up the stairwell, nearly bowled me over landing on my shoulder. I did make the process more difficult by trying to duck the arriving bird. It lashed my face with flapping wings. Climb, it said. Slowly, without panic. Steadily. I will watch behind you. We climbed for five or ten days. Hunger nagged me. Terror and lack of sleep made me see things that were not there. I did not look back for fear of seeing something terrible closing in. We moved slower and slower as the effort devoured our energies and will and our capacity for recovery. It became a major trek and an act of ultimate will to climb from one landing to the next. Then we began resting between landings, though neither Suvran nor Santaraxita ever suggested it. The crow told me, Stop and sleep. No one argued. There are limits to how far and hard terror can drive anyone. We found ours. I collapsed so fast I later claimed I heard my first snore before I hit the stone of the landing. I was only vaguely aware of the crow launching itself into the darkness, headed downward again. Chapter 91 Sleepy? My soul wanted to leap up and flail around in terror. My flesh was incapable and quite possibly indifferent. I was so stiff and I hurt so much that I just could not move. My mind still worked fine. It ran as sparkling swift as a mountain stream. Huh? I continued trying to get the muscles unlocked. Easy, it's Willow. Just open your eyes, you're safe. What are you doing way down here? Way down where? Uh, you're one landing downstairs from the cave of the ancients. I kept trying to get up. Muscle by muscle, my body gradually yielded to my will. I looked around, vision foggy. Suvran and Master Centaraxita were still asleep. Swan said, They were tired, guaranteed. I heard you snoring all the way up in the cave. Twinge of fear. Where's Tobo? He went on up top. Everyone went. I made them go. I stayed in case. The crow told me not to come down. But what's one landing? You think you can get moving again? I can't carry anybody. I can barely keep going myself. 
I can manage one flight. Up to the cave. That's far enough for now. The cave? I still have something to do there. Are you sure you want to go out of your way? I'm sure, Willow. I could tell it was a matter of life or death. For a whole world. Or maybe for multiple worlds. But why be melodramatic? Can you get these two moving again? And headed toward the top? I did not think Master Centaraxita could bear seeing what I intended to do next. I'll get them moving. But I'm sticking with you. That won't be necessary. Yes, it will. You can hardly stand up. I'll work it out. You go right ahead and talk. It'll get the kinks out of your jaw. But I'm staying. I stared at him hard for some time. He did not back down. Neither did he betray any motive but concern for a brother he suspected of failing to be in her right mind. I closed my eyes for half a minute, then opened them to peer down the stairs. God was listening. Swan was working on Suvren. The Shadowlander officer had his eyes open, but seemed unable to move. He murmured, I must be alive. Otherwise, I wouldn't hurt so much. Panic flooded his eyes. Did we get away? I said, we're getting away. We've still got a long way to climb. Goblin's dead, Swan said. The crow told me when it came up to get something to eat. Where is that thing? Down there, watching. I felt a chill. Paranoia touched me. There had been a connection between Lady and Kina ever since Narayan Singh and Kina had used Lady as a vessel to produce the Daughter of Night. That had created a connection, a connection Lady had hammered into place cleverly, unbreakably, so that she could steal power from the goddess indefinitely. Forgive me, O Lord. Drive these infidel thoughts from my heart. Swan said, Huh? Nothing. Part of the ongoing dialogue between me and my god. Suvren, sweetie, you ready to do some jumping jacks? Suvren offered me an old-fashioned storm cloud glower. Smack her, Swan. At a time like this, cheerful ought to be against the laws of heaven and earth. You'll be cheerful in a minute, too, as soon as you figure out that you're still alive. Humph. He began to help Swan waken Master Centaraxita. Upright now, I did a few small exercises to loosen up even more. Ah, Doraby, Centaraxita said softly. I have survived another adventure with you. I've got God on my side. Excellent. Do keep him there. I don't think I can survive another of your adventures without divine assistance. You'll outlive me, Shri. Perhaps. Probably, if I do get out of this and I don't tempt fate ever again, you, you'll probably graduate to snake dancing with cobras. Shri? I've decided... I don't want to be an adventurer anymore, Doraby. I'm too old for it. It's time to wrap myself up in a cozy library again. This just hurts too much. Ow! Young man! Swan grinned. He was not that much younger than the librarian. Let's get going, old-timer. You keep lying around here and whatever adventure you found down there is going to catch up and have you all over again. A possibility that posed a fine motivation for us all. When we finally got moving again, I brought up the rear. Swan wrangled my companions. I gripped the golden pickaxe so tightly my knuckles ached. Goblin was dead. That did not seem possible. Goblin was a fixture, a permanent fixture, a cornerstone. 
Without its goblin, there could be no black company. You are mad, Sleepy. The family will not cease to exist simply because one member unexpectedly has been plucked out by evil fortune. Life would not end because of Goblin's absence. It would just get a lot harder. I seem to hear Goblin whisper, He is the future. Sleepy, snap out of it. Huh? Swan said, We're at the cave. You too. Keep climbing. We'll catch up with you. Suvran started to ask. I shook my head, pointed upward. Go, now, and don't look back. I waited until I saw Suvran actually guide Master Santa Raxita over the tumbled stones and onto the stairs. We'll catch up. What's that? Swan asked. He cupped an ear. I don't hear anything. He shrugged. It's gone now. Something from upstairs. We entered the cavern of the ancients. The wonder had been polished off it by the trampling about of a horde of company people. I was amazed that they had managed without damaging any more of the sleepers. As it was, almost all the wondrous ice webbing and cocooning had broken up and collapsed. A few stalactites had fallen from the ceiling. How did that happen? Swan frowned. During the earthquake. Earthquake? What earthquake? You didn't... There was one hell of a shake. I can't say exactly how long ago. Probably when you were all the way down. It's hard to tell time in here. No lie. Oh, yuck. I had discovered why the white crow had all that energy. It had been dining on one of my dead brothers. Some evil part of me tossed up the thought that I could follow the bird's example. Another part wondered what would happen if Croker found out. That man was obsessed with the holy state of company brotherhood. You never know what you'll do until you're in the ring with the bull, do you? What? A proverb from back home means that actually facing the reality is never quite like preparing to face the reality. You never really know what you'll do until you get there. I passed the rest of the captured, not meeting any open eyes. I wondered if they could hear. I offered up some reassurances that sounded feeble even to me. The cavern shrank. When it came time to get down and crawl, I crawled. I told Swan, Maybe it's good you being here after all. I'm starting to have little dizzy spells. You hear anything? I listened. This time I did hear something. Sounds like somebody's singing. A marching song? Somebody full of yo-ho-hos. What the devil? Down here? We have dwarfs, too? Dwarfs? Mythical creatures. Like short people with big beards and permanent bad tempers? They live underground like Nagas, only supposedly big on mining and metalworking? If they ever did exist, they died out a long time ago. The singing was getting louder. Let's get this handled before somebody interrupts. Chapter 92 The pessimist in me was sure I would not be able to pull it off. If nothing else, the earthquake Swan mentioned would in some way have sealed the chamber of unholy books off from the rest of the world. If the chamber was not sealed off, then I would trip the only booby trap that Goblin had overlooked. If Goblin had not overlooked any booby traps, then the pickaxe would not be a protective key. It would be a trigger igniting the thousand secret sorceries protecting the books. Sleepy. Do you know you talk to yourself when you're worried about stuff? What? You're crawling along there muttering about all the bad things that are going to happen. You keep on and you're going to convince me. That was twice. I had to get that under control. I did not use to do that. The place where the books of the dead were hidden had not changed visibly. The pessimist in me worked hard to find a dangerous difference, though. Swan finally asked, 
Are you going to study on it till we pass out from hunger? Or are you going to go ahead and do something? I always was a better planner than a doer, Willow. I sucked in a peck of frigid air, took the pickaxe out of my waistband, intoned, O Lord of heaven and earth, let there be no password that has to go with this. Right behind you, boss, Swan said, making a joke as he nudged me forward. Don't be shy now. Of course not. That would be little goblin sacrifice and memory. I realized that my breathing had turned to rapid, shallow panting as I reached the point where Master Centaraxita had achieved flight. I held the pick in front of me with both hands, muscles protesting its weight, squeezing it so tight I feared I would leave my fingerprints etched upon it permanently. A tingling began in my hands. It crept up my arms as I eased forward. My skin crawled, and I developed severe goosebumps. I said, You'd better hold on to me, Willow, in case I needed yanking back. In case you need the connection to the pick. The shield was not rejecting me. Not yet. Swan rested his hands on my shoulders an instant before the tingling reached my body. I began to shiver. Suddenly I had the chills and shakes of an autumn sickness. Ooh, Swan said. This feels weird. It gets weirder, I promised. I've got one of those agues where the chill goes all the way to the marrow. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there too. Toss in some joint aches too. Come on, let's get that fire started and warm ourselves. Would fire be enough? Once we moved forward another ten feet, the miseries stopped getting worse. The tingling on the outside faded. I told Swan, I think it's safe to let go now. You should have seen your hair. It started dancing around when we were halfway through. It lasted only a couple of steps, but it was a sight. I'll bet. My hair was a sight anyway, usually. I did not offer it nearly enough attention, and I had not had it trimmed in months. Got anything to start a fire with? You don't? You didn't prepare for this? You knew it had to be done, and you didn't bring... All right, we'll use mine. I just don't have much tinder left. Didn't want to use mine up when I could use yours. Thanks a lot. You're getting as bad as those two nasty old men. Chagrined, he recalled that one of the nasty old men he meant had just completed his tenure with the company. I learned from the best. Listen. I've been thinking about this. Even if we are past all the traps, the books themselves might be dangerous. Considering the way the brains of wizards work, it's probably not a smart thing to peek inside at the pages. One look at the writings, and you're likely to spend the rest of your life standing there reading, even if you don't recognize a word. Out loud. I recall reading about a spell that worked that way once. So what do we do? You notice that all three books are open? We'll have to come at them from underneath and tip the covers shut, so that they end up face down. Even then, we might want to handle them with our eyes shut when we go burn them. I've read about grimoires that the Rakshasas bound into their covers, although nothing as exciting as that ever turned up in the library where I had worked. A talking book that can read itself to me. That's what I need. I thought Soulcatcher made you learn how to read when you were the king of the greys. She did. That don't mean I want to read. Reading is bloody hard work. I thought managing a brewery was hard work. You never shied away from that. Being shorter, I took the job of sneaking up on the three lecterns. I used extreme caution. They might have been great actors, but I was soon convinced that they could not see me coming. I like making beer. I don't like reading. He should have been the one getting ready to burn books then. I was suffering a crisis of conscience as troublesome as any of my crises of faith. I loved books. I believed in books. 
As a rule, I did not believe in destroying books because their contents were disagreeable. But these books contained the dark, secret patterns for bringing on the end of the world. The end of many worlds, actually. For if the Year of the Skulls successfully sacrificed my world, others connected to the glittering plane must follow. This was not a crisis that needed immediate resolution. I had my answers worked out already, which was why I was on hands and knees under the lecterns while suffering verbal abuse from an infidel who had no use for my God or for the deceiver's merciless destroyer. I tipped the covers of the book shut while wondering if there was still some way the children of night could get to me. The covers appear to be blank, Swan said. You're looking at the backs of the books. I'm closing them so they're face down, remember? Hold it, he held up a finger, cocked an ear. Echoes. Um, somebody's out there. I listened harder. Singing again. I wish they wouldn't sing. Nobody in the band but Sara can carry a tune in a bucket with a lid on it. You can come on up here now. I think it's safe. You think? I'm still alive. I don't know if that's necessarily a recommendation. You're too sour and bitter for the monsters to eat. I, on the other hand... You, on the other hand, are plain lucky that my god forbids me to reveal that the only thing interested in eating you would be the kind of beetle that flourishes on a diet of livestock byproduct. Right there looks like a good place to start a fire. Swan was up beside me now. There was some kind of large, brazier-looking thing that still had a few charcoal remnants in it. It was made of hammered brass in a style common to most of the cultures of this end of the world. You want me to tear a few pages out for tender? No, I don't want you to tear pages out. Weren't you listening when I told you the books might make you want to read them? I was listening. Sometimes I don't hear very well, though. Like most of the human race. I was prepared. In minutes, I had a small fire burning. I lifted one of the books carefully, making sure it faced away from Swan and me. I fanned its pages out slightly and set it down in the flames, spine upward. I burned the last volume first, just in case. Something might interfere. I wanted the first volume destroyed to be one the Daughter of Night had not yet seen. The first book, which she had copied parts of several times, and might have partially memorized, I would burn last. The book caught fire eventually, but did not burn well. It produced a nasty-smelling dark smoke that filled the cavern and forced Swan and me to get down on our stomachs on the icy floor. The underground wind did carry some of the smoke away. The rest was no longer overwhelming when I consigned the second book to the flames. While waiting to add the final book to the fire, I brooded about why Kina was doing nothing to resist this blow to her hopes for resurrection. I could only pray that Goblin's sacrifice had hurt her so badly she could not look outside herself yet. I could only pray that I was not a victim of some grand deceit. Maybe these books were decoys. Maybe I was doing exactly what Kina had planned for me to do. There were doubts, always. You're muttering to yourself again. Ah. I possessed not so much as the faintest hope that Goblin's death had put Kina out of the misery of the world permanently. This feels so nice, I said. I could go to sleep right here. And I did so promptly. Good old Willow's sense of duty, or self-preservation, or something, kept him going. He got the last book of the dead into the fire for me before he too settled down for a nap. Chapter 93 The singing soldiers proved to be Runmust, Iqbal, and Riverwalker. They had come to rescue the rest of us when Tobo reached them with news of the disaster that had befallen us down below. They had found us by following the smoke. 
At the risk of finding myself goaded into employing unseemly language, how is it that I find anyone singing? How is it that you haven't taken the road to the land of the unknown shadows? I believe I was pretty insistent on the necessity for that. Runmust and Iqbal giggled like they were younger than Tobo and knew a dirty joke. Riverwalker managed to maintain a more sober demeanor. Barely. You're tired and hungry, so we don't blame you for being cranky sleepy. Let's do something about that. Settle down and have a snack. He could not restrain a big, goofy grin as he rummaged in his pack. I exchanged glances with Swan. I asked, You have any clue what's going on here? Maybe there's a stage of starvation where you get lightheaded and sleepy. I suppose j could have been an exception. Riverwalker produced something the shape and color of a puffball mushroom, but a good eight inches in diameter. It looked heavier than a mushroom that size ought to be. What the hell is that? Swan asked. River had several more in his pack, and his henchmen had brought packs too. Riverwalker produced a knife and began slicing. A gift from our demon friend, Shivetya. Evidently, after a day of reflection, he decided we deserved a payoff for saving his big ugly ass. Eat. He offered me an end slice, an inch thick. You like it? Swan started eating before I did. I had an ounce of paranoia left. He leaned my way. Tastes like pork. <laughs> then he had no time for joking. He began wolfing the material, which looked exactly the same all the way through. It had a heavy, almost cheesy texture. When I surrendered to the inevitable and bit into it, my salivary system responded with a flood. The experience of taste was so sharp it was almost painful. There was nothing comparable in my memory. A touch of ginger, a touch of cinnamon, lemons, sweetness, the scent of candied violets. After the first shock, a sense of well-being gradually spread outward from my mouth and again from my stomach soon after the first mouthfuls hit bottom. More, Swan said. Riverwalker surrendered another slice. More, I agreed, and bit into another slice myself. It might be poison, but if it was, it was the sweetest poison God ever permitted. Shivetya really gave you this? About a ton, almost literally. Fit for man and beast. Even the baby likes it. Iqbal and Runmust found that news hilarious. Swan snickered too, though he could not possibly have any idea what the joke might be. In fact, I found that assertion rather amusing myself. Heck, everything was amusing. I had begun to feel relaxed and confident. My aches and pains no longer formed the center of my consciousness. They had become mere annoyances, way out on the edge of awareness. Continue. Iqbal squealed. He grew them. These nasty lumps developed all over him, like big-ass boils. Only when they popped, out came these things. Under more normal circumstances, that idea and the images it engendered would have seemed repulsive. I grunted, took another wonderful mouthful, pictured the creation process, caught myself in the midst of a fit of giggles. I regained control, though that took an effort. So it finally decided to communicate? Sort of. When we left, it was trying to manage some kind of dialogue with Doge. It didn't seem to be working all that well, though. Swan sighed. I haven't felt this relaxed and positive since Cordy and I used to go fishing when we were kids. This is the way we felt lying beside the creek in the shade, never really caring if we got a bite while we shared our daydreams or just watched clouds scoot overhead. Even the recollection of his friend's fate did not break his mood entirely. I understood what he was trying to communicate, even though I had had no special friend with whom to share the rare, golden moments of childhood. I had had no childhood. I felt really good myself. I said, This whatever it is is great stuff. 
River, you seen any side effects yet? It's damn near impossible to stop yourself if you get the giggles. I'll try not to get started. Wow, I feel like I could whip twice my weight in wolves right now. Why don't we get going? Nobody took the opportunity to mention that me whipping twice my weight in wolves might entail me fighting only the back half of one of the monsters. Iqbal and Runmust continued to giggle over some shared joke of long ago. Boys, I said, pointing. That way. Don't touch anything. Keep going. We're going to go back upstairs. Dang me. I kept getting silly ideas and every one of them made me want to start laughing. Riverwalker told me, We found out that if we sing it helps us keep our minds on business. A big grin spread across his face. He began humming one of the filthier marching songs. It concerned the business that seems to be on the minds of most men most of the time. I hummed along and got everybody started moving. Foul-smelling smoke from roasted books filled the cavern. It seemed even stronger in the stairwell. Some of it drifted downward. Kino was not yet aware, I was sure. She would have done something if she had known. But she would not remain ignorant forever. I hoped we could get ourselves well on the road before she recovered enough to assimilate the truth. Her dreams were deadly enough. Chapter 94 I settled my behind onto the rise in the floor near the entrance to the stairwell. I sat there dully wondering why the excavation had been started way out here on the periphery. I did not concern myself about it much, though. I ate again. This stuff could get addictive. And not because it made me feel happy and silly, but because it took away aches and pains and every inclination to sleep. I could sit there knowing my body was at its physical limits without having to endure all the suffering associated with that state. And my mind remained particularly alert and useful because I was not preoccupied with the miseries plaguing my flesh. Swan grunted his agreement. He did not seem to have been rendered as cheerful as the rest of us, although, come to think of it, I was not doing much whistling or singing myself. My mood improved after I had eaten again, though. In one of his more lucid moments, Riverwalker suggested, We shouldn't waste any more time than we have to, Sleepy. The rest should all be gone by now. But they went away hoping that you and the Standard would catch up. If Tobo hasn't already told them, I've got some bad news about that. The boy said nothing about the Standard. He may not have had a chance. Everybody was so shocked about Goblin and so worried about how to keep one eye from finding out. Goblin drove the lance into Kina's body. It's still there. You know me. I'm completely hooked by the company mystique. I believe that besides the annals, the standard is the most important symbol we have. It goes all the way back to Katavar. It ties the generations together. I'd understand if somebody wanted to go back after it. But that somebody isn't going to be me. Not in this decade. That good feeling was moving through me again. I rose. Swan helped me step up to the higher floor level. Hello. Riverwalker chuckled. Well, I wondered how long it would take you to notice. The crack in the floor was almost gone. I went and looked. It seemed to be as deep as ever, but now was nowhere more than a foot wide. How did it heal so fast? I assumed our presence had been a catalyst. Glancing around the crack toward the demon's throne, I noticed Doge and Tobo hurrying our way. Shivetya's eyes were open. He was watching. I thought you said everybody had left. The earthquake did it. River ignored the presence of Doge and Tobo. Swan said, It's the latest thing in home repairs. Go down there and stab that thing again. Maybe the plane will heal up completely. Might get the clockwork running again, Doge said, having overheard our conversation as we arrived. Clockwork? 
Doge did a little hop. The floor is a huge circle. It's a one-eightieth scale representation of the plane as a whole, with a complete travel chart inlaid. It rides on stone rollers and was capable of turning before the thousand voices got curious and broke it. Interesting. I take it your chat with the demon proceeded informatively. Doge grunted assent. But slowly. That was the big problem. Just figuring out that communication has to be managed very slowly. I think that would carry over physically, too. That if he decided to stand up, if he could, it might take hours. But as the steadfast guardian, he never had to move fast. He controlled the whole plane from here, using the charts and the floors and the clockwork mechanisms. Never had I seen Doge so straightforward and animated. The knowledge bug must have bitten him, along with its kissing cousin that makes the newly illuminated want to share with everyone. And that was not like Doge at all, nor like any other Nguyen Bo of my experience. Only Mother Goda and Tobo ever chattered, and between them, they revealed less than Uncle Doge on a particularly reticent day. Doge continued. He says his original reason for being created was to manage the machinery that saw that travelers got where they wanted to go. Over time, there were battles upon the plain, wars between the worlds. This fortress was built around him, and at every stage he was saddled with additional duties. Sleepy, the creature is half as old as time itself. He actually witnessed the battle between Kina and the demons when the Lords of Light fought the Lords of Darkness. It was the first great war between the worlds. It did take place here on the plain, and none of the myths have got it close to right. That was interesting, and I said so. But I refused to allow the past's allure to seduce me right now. I must confess a grand temptation to create a permanent camp here, Doge enthused. It will take lifetimes to recover and record everything. He's seen so much. He remembers the children of the dead, Sleepy. To him, the passing of the Nguyen Bo de Duang happened just yesterday. We need only to keep him convinced that we should have his help. I looked questions at each of my companions. River Walker finally volunteered. He's got to have been stuffing himself with the demon food. Meaning he thought Doge was out of character a few leagues too. Several others also went through big changes when they overindulged. That much I understood already. Tobo, have you undergone a complete character shift too? He had not said a word. That was remarkable. He had an opinion about everything. He scared the crap out of me, Sleepy. He? Who? The demon, the monster, Shivetya. He looked inside my head. He talked to me there. I think he did it to my father, too. For years and years, maybe, in the annals, when Dad thought Kina or the Protector were manipulating him, I'm betting that lots of times it was really Shivetya. That could be. That really could be. The world is infested with superhuman things that toy with the destinies of individuals and nations. Goonie priests have been claiming that for a hundred generations. The gods were banging elbows with each other, stirring the cauldron. But none of those gods were my god, the true god, the almighty, who seemed to have elected to elevate himself above the fray. I needed the solace of my kind of priest, and there were none nearer than five hundred miles. How many stories are there about this place? I asked Doge. And how many of them are true? I suspect we haven't yet heard one out of ten, the old swordmaster replied. He grinned. He was enjoying himself. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of them are true. Can you sense it, this fortress, this plain? They are many things at the same time. Until recently, I believed it had to be the land of unknown shadows, as your captain believed that it had to be Katova. But it's only a pathway to other places, and Shivetya, the steadfast guardian, is many things too.
including, I think, infinitely weary of being everything that he's had to be. Tobo was so anxious to interject his own thoughts that he danced around like a little boy with a desperate need to pee. He announced, Shivetya wants to die, sleepy, but he can't, not as long as Kina is still alive, and she's immortal. He's got a problem then, doesn't he? Swan had an idea. He could divide up that lifespan and offer it to us. I'd take him up on it. I could use another couple thousand years. After I get away from this kind of life. I moved us closer to the demon as we talked. My natural pessimism and sourness evidently reasserted itself, though I never stopped feeling younger and happier and more energetic than I had for ages. I just stopped giggling with the rest of them. I asked, Where's your mother, Tobo? His good humor waned momentarily. She went with Granny Goda? A glance at Doge made me suspect that there had been a sharp encounter between Sarah, the mother, and Min, willing to accept her son as one of them. This was Nguyen Bo's stubbornness again, from two directions. On this one, the troll must have sided with her grandson and Doge. I changed the subject. All right, you two claim you've been in Shevetya's mind, or maybe he's been in yours. Whichever, tell me what he wants. I did not believe the demon was being helpful out of the goodness of his ancient heart. He could not be. He was a demon, a curse of God, whether he was a creature of light or of shadow. To a demon, we adventurers had to be as brief and transient as individual honeybees would be to us. Though, like the bees, we might be able to make ourselves obnoxious for a short while. Doge said, He wants what anyone in his position would want. That seems obvious. Tobo interjected. He also wants loose, Sleepy. He's been pinned that way for a long time. The plane keeps changing because he can't get out to stop anybody. What's he going to do if we pluck the daggers out of his limbs? Will he go on being our pal? Or will he start busting heads? Doge and Tobo exchanged uncertain glances. So, they had not spent much time worrying about that. I said, I see. Well, he may be the sweetest guy on God's green earth, but he stays right where he is for now. A few weeks or months more shouldn't make much difference to him. How the heck did he manage to get himself nailed to his chair? Somebody tricked him, Tobo said. Surprise, surprise. You think so? It seemed there was a lot more light now than there had been when I was headed in the other direction with Swan. Or maybe my eyes had adapted to the interior of the fortress. I could make out the designs in the floor clearly. All the features of the plane could be found there except for the standing stones with their glittering gold characters. And those might have been represented by certain shadowy discolorations I was unable to examine more closely. There were even tiny points that seemed to be moving, which almost certainly meant something if one knew how to read them. Shivetya's throne rested atop a circular elevation positioned at the heart of of an intermediate raised circle just over 20 yards across. Doge assured me that that was roughly 1 80th the diameter of the biggest circle and that that was an 80th of the diameter of the entire plane. The smaller circle, I noted, also boasted its representation of the plane in much less obvious detail. Presumably, Shevetya could sit his throne and, turning, could see the whole of his kingdom. If he needed more information, he could step down to the next level, where everything was portrayed in a scale 80 times finer. The implications of the quality of the magical engineering involved in creating all this began to seep through. I was intimidated thoroughly. The builders must have been of godlike power. They had to have been as far beyond the greatest wizards known to me as those were beyond no talents like me. I was sure that Lady and Longshadow, Soulcatcher and Howler, would have little more grasp of the forces and principles involved than I did. 
I stepped in front of Shivetya. The demon's eyes remained open. I felt him touch me lightly inside. For some reason, my thoughts turned to mountainous highlands and places where the snow never melted. To old things, slow things. To silence and stone. My brain had no better way of interpreting the actuality of what Shivetya was. I kept reminding myself that the demon antedated the oldest history of my world. And I sensed what Tobo had mentioned. Shivetya's quiet, calm desire not to grow any older. He had a very goony sort of desire to find his way into a nirvana as an antidote to the infinite tedium and pain of being. I tried talking to the demon. I tried exchanging thoughts. That was a frightening experience. Even though I was filled with the confidence and good feeling that came from the gift food Shivetya had provided. I did not want to share my mind even with an immortal golem who could not possibly have any genuine comprehension of the things it contained or of why those troubled me so. Sleepy? Huh? I jumped up. I felt good enough to do that. I felt as good as I should have back in my teens had I never had a need to feel sorry for myself. The healing properties of the demon's gift continued to work their magic. Swan said, We all fell asleep. I don't know for how long. I don't even know how. I looked at the demon. It had not moved. No surprise there. But the white crow was perched on its shoulder. As soon as it recognized that I was alert, it launched itself toward me. I threw up an arm. The bird settled on my wrist as though I were a falconer. In a voice almost too slow to follow, it said, This will be my voice. It is trained, and its mind is not cluttered with thoughts and beliefs that will get in the way. Marvelous. I wondered what Lady would think. If Shivetya took over, she would be deaf and blind until we brought her back from her enchanted sleep. This will be my voice now. I understood the repetition to be a response to my flutter of unspoken curiosity. I understand. I will aid you in your quest. In return, you will destroy the Drin, Kina. Then you will release me. I understood that he meant for me to release him from life and obligation, not just from that throne. I would if I had the power. You have the power. You have always had the power. What does that mean? I recognized a cryptic, sorcerer-type pronouncement when I heard one. You will understand when it is time to understand. Now, it is time for you to depart, stone soldier. Go. Become Death Walker. What the devil does that mean? I squeaked. So did several of my companions, all of whom were awake now, and most of whom were gobbling demon food while eavesdropping. The floor started moving, at first almost imperceptibly. Quickly, I noted that only the part immediately around the throne, that had healed itself completely, was involved. I now knew that all the damage, including the earthquake, so violent it had been felt as far away as Taglios, had been initiated entirely by Soul Catcher during an ill-conceived experiment. She had discovered the machinery, and in her willful, damn-the-consequences way, had begun tinkering just to see what would happen. I knew that as fully as if I had been there as an eyewitness, because an actual eyewitness had given me his memories. I knew everything Soul Catcher had done during her several visits to the fortress, in a time when Long Shadow believed he was the total master of the Shadow Gate, and did not believe that others would dare approach it, even if they did possess a workable key. 
I now knew many things as if I had lived them. Some were things I was not eager to know. A few concerned questions I had had for years, offering answers that I could share with Master Centaraxida. But mostly, it was just stuff I was likely to find useful if I was going to become what Shivetya hoped I would. A startled blue bottle of speculation buzzed through my mind. I checked to see if I had an answer, but I had no memories of what might have become of the key that would have been necessary if, indeed, Long Shadow, as Maricha Mantara Dumraksha, with his student Ashutash Yaksha, had come to our world from the land of unknown shadows. And for sure, I did not get any relief from my fear of heights. An instant after the floor stopped turning, the white crow launched itself upward, and darned if I did not launch myself right after it, though not through any wish of my own. My companions rose behind me, in their surprise and fright, several dropped weapons and possessions and probably body contents. Only Tobo seemed to find unanticipated flight to be a positive experience. Runmust and Iqbal sealed their eyes and belched rapid prayers to their false vision of God. I spoke my mind to the God who is God, reminding him to be merciful. Riverwalker addressed impassioned appeals to his heathen deities. Doge and Swan said nothing at all. Swan because he had fainted. Tobo babbled in delight, informing everyone how wonderful the experience was. Look here, look there. The vast expanse of the chamber stretches out below us like the plain itself. We passed through a hole in the ceiling and into the colder air of the real plain. It was dusk out there, the sky still crimson over the western horizon, but already deep indigo directly ahead. The stars of the noose shone palely in front of us. As we descended toward the surface, I found nerve enough to glance back. The fortress stood silhouetted against the northern sky. On its outside, in worse shape now than when we had arrived, all our clutter, everything dropped during our ascension, or that we had had no time to grab, now flew along right behind us. For a while, I watched eagerly for the standard to join the flock. My hopes were disappointed. It did not appear. In retrospect, I cannot see why I should have hoped otherwise. Now Tobo pretended he was a bird. By experimenting, he discovered that he could use his arms to direct his flight, to rise and fall somewhat, to speed up and slow down slightly. He never shut up for an instant, loving every moment, continuously admonishing the rest of us to enjoy the adventure because none of us would ever have the chance to experience anything like this again. Wisdom from the mouths of infants, Doge announced. Then he threw up. They were both right. Chapter 95 Our flight ended where the rest of the band was camped at the last circle before the southwest road reached our destination, Shadowgate. Flying definitely offered the advantage of speed. We outflew the white crow, arriving less than two hours after our toes departed solid stone. That Shivetya fellow was a handy friend to have. I tried to see what lay beyond the edge of the plain, but it was just too dark. There might have been one or two small points of light out there. It was hard to tell. We descended feet first, evidently immune to shadows. I had sensed several of those pacing us, but they had shown no inclination to get too close, which left me admiring Shvetya's power even more, for those things were little more than bundles of hatred and hunger to kill. We passed through the top of the shielding, protecting our brethren without compromising it. The whole band watched our arrival in disbelief. Tobo managed to direct himself toward his mother and accomplished a somersault before he touched down. I did not exactly get down and hug the stone surface, but I was glad the ordeal was over. The Singh brothers rushed around looking for family. So did Doge, who ignored Sara and went directly to Goda. Goda was not in good spirits and possibly was in ill health. I could not tell much more about anyone in the feeble light available from a changeable moon. Goda did not offer any complaint or criticism. Swan stuck with me. 
As soon as he convinced himself that it was safe to open his eyes, Riverwalker began bustling around being a busybody, devoutly determined to make sure everyone and everything conformed to whatever rules he happened to recall at the moment. I frowned, shook my head, but did not interfere. We all need our rituals to help us get by. Sara, I asked, how are they? I meant those we had brought out of the caverns, because I had a suspicion that Goda's state meant nothing good, and I did not want to hear what I feared it did mean. Sarah could not feel friendly. She blamed me because she had discovered her baby strolling through the sky. Never mind that he had come down safely and could not stop raving about the experience. What a fall from a great height might do to a body never occurred to him but it certainly did to Sara. No change in the captured. One eye went into a funk when he heard about Goblin and hasn't spoken since. Mother isn't sure if it's emotional withdrawal or he had another stroke. What worries her is the possibility that he doesn't want to live anymore. Who would he fight with? I did not mean to belittle, though it came out sounding that way. Sarah showed me an instant of pique, but did not reveal her thoughts. Mother can be a handful. Probably what got them together in the first place. I made no mention of the fact that I feared Goda would not be with us much longer. The troll had to be around eighty. I'll go talk to him. He's asleep. It can wait. In the morning, then. Are we still in touch with Mergen? The light was good enough to reveal Sarah's anger. Perhaps she was right. I had not had my feet on the ground two minutes and already I wanted to use her husband. But she managed the emotion. We had worked together for a long time now. Early on with her usual being the stronger one, only occasionally with me taking the lead role. We always managed without sharp words. We always managed because we knew we had somewhere to go and we had to collaborate to get there. These days I took charge most of the time, but she could do so when it was appropriate. Only she was just about where she wanted to get to now, was she not? She had Mergen out of the ground. She would not need to go on with her role once he was up and around, unless he was not the man she wanted him to be, in which case... She would have to contrive a new Sarah all over again. I'm sure that had her on edge more than ever. Neither she nor Mergen were the people they had been. None of us were. There were going to be some difficulties adjusting, possibly some major difficulties. I anticipated big problems with Lady and the captain. Sarah said, I've done my best to keep the mist projector working but I haven't been able to make contact since we left that fortress. He doesn't seem to be willing to leave his body anymore, and I can't get that to wake up more than it already is. So she was also afraid that the rescue might have been a mistake, that we might have hurt Mergen instead of saving him. Upbeat, hopefully, she said. Maybe Tobo can help. I wondered what had become of the tough, focused, dedicated Sara who had been mean subredil. I tried to reassure this Sara. Mergen will be fine. Shivetya had given me the knowledge we needed to reanimate the captured. But we have to get him off the plane before we can wake him all the way up. Same for the others. Riverwalker returned from his tour. The demon food is going fast here, Sleepy. There's enough to get us off the plane and have a couple meals more but then we're on our own. We either eat the dog and the horses, or we scrounge up something locally, fast. Ah, well, we knew that going in. We're better off than we expected to be. Did anybody think to steal anything valuable while we were there? That comment got me blank looks. And then I realized that it was possible no one else had noticed the treasures I had discovered while chasing Tobo into the deeps of the earth. The boy would have said something if he had seen anything. He could not shut up. Swan told me, It'll be harvest time when we get there. What? 
He shrugged. I just know. So he might. Everybody listen up. Get all the rest you can tonight. I want to get up and move out early tomorrow, and nobody knows what we'll run into at the end of the road. Somebody grumbled something about if I wanted him to sleep, why did I not shut up and let him get to work? I could not keep my eyes open myself, although it had not been that long since I had wakened by Shevetya's throne. In fact, my mind seemed to be shutting down. I said, Forget everything else. I'm going to take my own advice. Where's a place I can wrap my blanket around me and lie down before I collapse? The only open space was back at the tail end of the company. All my flying companions except Tobo had to migrate back there. I had planned to eat before I slept, but exhaustion overwhelmed me before I swallowed my third bite of demon's food. My final reflection concerned whether God could overlook one of the faithful accepting a gift from one of the damned. An interesting exercise. God knows all. Therefore, God knew what Shivetya was doing and allowed him to do it. Therefore, it must be God's will that we benefit from the demon's generosity. It would be a sin to defy God's will. Chapter 96 I dreamed strange dreams. Of course I did. Was not Shivetya in my mind? Was I not in the haunted place of glittering stone? Stone remembered, and stone wanted me to know. I was in another place then, in a time not my own. I was Shivetya, as the demon experienced the world, everywhere at once, a pale imitation of God. I could be everywhere at once because by staring at the floor surrounding my throne, I connected with my realm as a whole. We became one knowledge, the singer and the song. Men were moving across my face, a large band. I knew time differently from mortals, but I understood that it had been ages since this had happened last. Mortals did not cross me anymore, not often, never in numbers like this. There was enough sleepy there for me to recognize Shivetya's memory of the coming of the captured before they stumbled into Soulcatcher's trap. Why would the demon want me to see this? I knew this story. Mergen had shared it with me several times to make sure it got recorded in the annals just the way he wanted. There was no solid feeling of a personality surrounding me. Yet I felt a mild pressure to abandon curiosity, to turn outward from questions, to cease being a viewpoint, to let the flower unfold. I should have paid more attention to Uncle Doge. The ability to abandon the self would have been a useful talent at a time like this. Time was different for the demon, definitely. But he tried to accommodate the ephemeral mortal, to get to the point, to provide the information he thought I would find useful. I watched the whole adventure, including the great and desperate escape that had devoured Bucket and had allowed Willow the chance to remain in the story as a pawn of wickedness, and I did not understand immediately, because at first I observed only the finer details of a story already known in outline. I was not completely stupid. I caught on. The question had occurred to me before, but had not been critical. Now, I just needed to reclaim enough self to recall that I had asked it. The question was... What had become of the one member of that expedition for whom there was still no account? The incredibly dangerous apprentice shapeshifter Lisa Deal Bowalk, trapped in the form of a black leopard, had been carried onto the plain in a cage, as had the prisoners Longshadow and Howler. She had vanished during the excitement. Mergen never discovered what had become of her. That he mentioned. I learned the truth, according to Shivetya. Not every trivial detail became entirely clear. Shivetya had trouble focusing that tightly in time. But it seemed that Bowalk's cage had gotten damaged in the panicky rush to escape 
by brothers of the company unfortunate enough not to be included amongst the captured. Panic, mothers, panic. The great, wicked cat caught the fever. Her violence was sufficient to complete the demolition of her cage. She ripped her way out, injuring herself in the process. She fled on three legs, carrying her left front paw elevated, allowing it to touch stone only when absolutely necessary. She whined horribly when she did. Nevertheless, she covered ground fast. She traveled nearly 30 miles before nightfall, but had chosen a direction at random and apparently did not recognize that she was not headed toward home until it was too late to change her mind. She chose a road and ran, and in the night one small, clever shadow caught up just short of the end of that road. It did what untamed shadows always do. It attacked. I found the result difficult to believe. The shadow hurt the panther, but did not kill her. She fought it and won, and stumbled onward, and before a more powerful shadow could overtake and finish her, she staggered through a derelict shadow gate and became invisible to Javetia, which meant that she was last seen alive entering a world neither our own nor the land of unknown shadows. I hoped that that crippled gate had finished her, or that it had injured her beyond recovery, because she was possessed of a hatred as dark as that which impelled the shadows. But hers was a hatred much more narrowly directed, and the company was its object. The fragment of sleepy self, never entirely subsumed into the Shivetia overview, wondered what the captain would think when he learned that Bowalk had reached Katavar by accident, when it was supposed to be impossible for the company to get there by intent. The sleepy self did not see why this news was important enough for Shivetia to have hijacked my dreams, but significant it must be. Significant, too, must be the Neff, the dreamwalkers that Mergen had named, the Washene, the Washane, and the Washone. I became more Shivetia, pulling away from the point experience of tracking the shape-changer. I became more one with the demon, while the demon became more one with the plane, more purely a manifestation of the will of the great engine. I enjoyed flickers of memories of golden ages of peace, prosperity, and enlightenment that had reached across silent stone to many worlds. I witnessed the passage of a hundred conquerors, I saw portions of the most ancient wars now recalled in the Guni and Deceiver religions, and even in my own, for being Shivetya and embracing all times at the same time, I could not help but see that the war in heaven, which was supposed to have occurred soon after God created the earth and the sky, and which ended with the adversary being cast down into a pit, could be an echo of the same divine struggle other religions remembered according to their own predilections. Before the war of the gods, there was the plain, and before the plain, there was the Neff. The plain, the great machine, eventually imagined Shivetya as its steadfast guardian and servant. In turn, the demon imagined the Washene, the Washane, and the Washone in the likeness of the Neff. These dreamwalking ghosts of the builders were Shivetya's gods. They existed independently of his mind but not of his existence. They would perish if he perished. And they had had no desire to be called into being in the first instance. Bizarre. I was caught amongst the personifications of aspects of religion in which I could not believe. Here were facts my faith forbid me to accept. Acceptance would damn me forever. Cruel, cruel tricks of the adversary. I had been gifted with a mind that wanted to explore, to find out, to know, and I had been gifted with faith. And now I had been gifted with information that put fact and faith into conflict. I had not been gifted with a priest's slippery dexterity when it came to reconciling the philosophically irreconcilable. But perhaps that was not necessary. Truth and reality seemed to be protean on the plane. There were too many different stories about Kina, Shivetya, and the fortress in the middle. Maybe every story was true, at least part of the time. 
There was an intellectual exercise of a sacerdotal magnitude. What if my beliefs were completely valid, but only part of the time, and only where I was located myself? What then? How could that be? What could that mean? It meant unpleasant times in the afterlife if I persisted in relaxing my vigilance against heresies. It might be difficult for a woman to achieve paradise, but it would be no trouble at all for her to win a place in Al Sheel. Chapter 97 That must have been one kick ass nightmare, Willow Swan told me, kneeling beside me, having just shaken my shoulder to waken me. Not only were you snoring, you were grunting and squeaking and carrying on a conversation with yourself in three different languages. I'm a woman of many talents. Everybody says so. I shook my head groggily. What time is it? It's still dark. Another talent emerges. I can't get anything past the old girl. I grumbled. The priests and the holy books tell us that God created man in his own image, but I've read a lot of holy books, including those of the idolaters, and not once have I found any other evidence that he had a sense of humor, let alone as the kind of person who would try to make jokes before the sun even came up. You're a sick man, Willow Swan. What's going on? Last night you said we'd have to start early. So Sara thought you meant we should be ready to go as soon as there's light enough to see. So we can get off the plane with plenty of daylight to spare. Sara is a wise woman. Wake me up when she's ready to go. I think right now would be a good time to get up then. I raised my hands. It was just light enough to see them. Gather round, people. Once a reasonable crowd had done so, I explained that each of us who had stayed behind in the fortress had been given knowledge that would help us in times to come. Shevetya seems very interested in our success. He tried to give us what he believed would be useful tools. But he's very slow and has his own demonic perspectives and doesn't know how to explain anything clearly. So it's extremely likely that there is a lot we know that we won't know we know until something makes us think of it. Be patient with us. We'll probably be a little strange for a while. I'm having trouble getting used to the re-educated me, and I live here. New knowledge pops up every time I turn around. Right now, though, I just want to get off this plane. Our resources are still limited. We have to establish ourselves as fast as we can. Those faces I could discern revealed fear of the future. Somewhere the dog whined. Iqbal's baby whimpered momentarily as Suruvija shifted her from one nipple to the other. In my consideration, that child ought to have been weaned by now, but I knew I had no justification for my opinion. None of my babies have been born yet, and it is getting a little late to bring them in. People waited for me to tell them something informative. The more thoughtful now wondered what new troubles awaited us since we had actually made it this far. Swan could be right. It could be harvest season in the land of unknown shadows, and it could also be the season for scalping foreigners. I was troubled myself, but had been faced with the unknown so often that I had calluses on that breed of fear. I knew perfectly well it would do me no good to fuss and worry when I had no idea what lay ahead. But worry I would anyway. Even when knowledge contracted, while I slept, assured me that we would not encounter disasters once we shifted off the plane. I had planned to offer a rousing speech, but quickly discarded that notion. No one was interested, not even me. Is everybody ready? Then let's go. Getting started took less time than I expected. Most of my brothers had not stopped to hear me say what they anticipated would be the same old, same old. They had gone on getting ready to roll. I told Swan, I guess in those days the company works a lot better after supper and a hard day's work. That's for me. Works even better when I've had something to drink, and it's a kick-ass wowzer after I've gone to bed. I walked with Sara for a while, 
renewing our acquaintance, easing the strain between us. She remained tense, though. It would not be that long before she had to deal with her husband in the flesh for the first time in a decade and a half. I did not know how to make that easier for her. Then I walked with the Radisha for an hour. She, too, was in an unsettled mood. It had been even longer since she had had to deal with her brother in all but the most remote capacities. She was a realist, however. There's nothing I can lose to him, is there? I've lost it all already. First to the protector, through my own blindness. Then you stole me away from Taglios and robbed me of even the hope of reclaiming my place. Bet you something, princess. Bet you that you're already being remembered as the mother of a golden age. That actually seemed a reasonable prediction. The past always seems better when the present consists of clabbered misery. Even without the protector back in the capital yet, once we're established, the first mission I mean to launch will be to get word back to Taglios that you and your brother are both alive. You're really angry, and you're going to come back. We all must dream, the woman told me. You don't want to go back? Do you recall the taunt you laid before me every day, Raja Dharma? Sure. What I may want is of no importance. What my brother might want does not signify either. He's had his adventures. Now I've had mine. Raja Dharma constrains us more surely than could the stoutest chain. Raja Dharma will call us back across the uncounted leagues as long as we continue to breathe, through the impossible places, past all the deadly perils and improbable beings. You reminded me again and again of my obligation. Perhaps by doing so, you created a monster fit to battle the beast who displaced me. Raja Dharma has become my vice, Sleepy. It has become my irrational compulsion. I continue to follow you only because reason insists that even though this path leads me farther from Taglios today, it is the shortest road to my destiny. I'll help where I can. I did not commit the company, though. I still had the captain and lieutenant to waken and deal with. I started to move on. I wanted to visit with Master Centaraxita for a while and lose myself, perhaps in an interplay of intellectual speculation. The librarian's horizons were much broader these days. Sleepy. Radisha? Has the Black Company extracted sufficient revenge? We had taken away everything but the love of her people. And she was not a bad woman. In my eyes, you're just one small gesture short of redemption. I want you to apologize to the captain once he recovers enough to understand what's happening. Her lips tightened. She and her brother did not let themselves be slaves to considerations of station or caste, but still, apology to a foreign mercenary? If I must, I must. My options are limited. Water sleeps, Radisha. I joined Suvran and Master Centaraxita, taking a few minutes to visit with the black stallion on the way there. It carried one eye, who was breathing, but otherwise did not look much better than a corpse. I hoped he was just sleeping in old man's sleep. The horse seemed bored. I suppose it was tired of adventures. Master? Suvran? By some chance, do you two suffer any memories you didn't have before we came to the plane? They did indeed. Centaraxita more so than Suvran. Shivetya's gifts seemed shaped for each individual. Master Centaraxita proceeded to relate yet another version of the Kina myth and of Shivetya's relationship to the Queen of Death and Terror. This one assumed the point of view of the demon. It did not say much that was new. Just shifted the relative importance of various characters and, laterally, blamed Kina for the passing of the last few builders. Kina remained a black-hearted villain in this version, 
while Shevetya became one of the great unsung heroes, deserving of a much higher standing in myth. Which could be true. He had no standing at all. Nobody outside the plane had ever heard of him. I suggested, When you get back to Taglios now, master, you can establish a mighty reputation by explaining the myths and the words of a being who lived through their creation. Centaraxita smiled sourly. You know better, Dorabi. Mythology is one area where nobody wants to know the absolute truth because time has forged great symbols from raw materials supplied by ancient events. Prosaic distortions of fact metamorphose into perceived truths of the soul. He had a point. In religion, precise truth has almost no currency. True believers will kill and destroy to defend their inaccurate beliefs. And that is a truth upon which you can rely. Chapter 98 I raised my head carefully to peer over the edge of the plain at the land of unknown shadows. Willow Swan snaked up on my right. He did the same. River Walker copied him on my left. River said, I'll be damned. I agreed. No doubt about it, Doge, Goda. Come and look. Will somebody bring one eye up? The little man had started talking about an hour ago. He did appear to be in touch with the real world at least part of the time. I beckoned the white crow. That darned thing was going to give us away if it kept circling. To who? Swan asked. I don't see anybody. Obviously, I was thinking out loud again. Swan weaseled sideways so Doge could crawl up beside me. Doge rose up. He froze. After 15 seconds, he harumphed. Gota said it. Is the same place we left. You got us turned around, you fool stone soldier. At first glimpse, it was identical, only... Look to the right. There isn't any overlook, and never was. And Kielune isn't the new city. I never saw Kielune before it became Shadow Catch, but doubted these ruins resembled that old city much either. Get Suvren. He might know. I continued to stare. The more I did so, the more differences stood out. Doge said it. The hand of mankind rested more lightly here, and men went away a long time ago. It was only the shape of the land that was identical. Back about the time of the earthquakes, you suppose? What would have been hard scrabble farmland in my world, here looked like better soil that had been abandoned for twenty years. It was overgrown by brush and brambles and cedars, but no truly sizable trees were yet evident, except those that grew in orderly rows, and those so distant they painted the foothills of the Don Depresh a deep green that was almost black. Suvren arrived. I offered a few questions. He told me, It does look like they say Kialune did before the Shadow Masters came. When my grandparents were children, the city didn't start growing until Long Shadow decided to build Overlook. Only, I don't see anything down there now but ruins. Look at the Shadow Gate. It's in better shape than our own. But not in good repair by any standard. The quakes had taken their bites. You can tell where it is. That was a weight off my shoulders. I had anticipated fighting starvation while we fussed with strings and colored powders in an effort to survey the only safe pathway through. Several men carried one eye up and set him down amongst us. They silhouetted themselves above the skyline doing so. My grumbling did no good. On the other hand, no bloodthirsty hordes materialized below the shadow gate. So it was possible that we were not yet betrayed. One Eye, do you sense anything down there? I did not know if he would respond. He seemed to be asleep again. His chin rested on his chest. People gave him room because it was in these moments he began to ply his cane. After a few seconds, though, 
He lifted his chin, opened his eyes, murmured, A place where I can rest. The wind that was always with us on the plain almost stole his words away. A place where all evil days and endless death. No wickedness stirs down there, little girl. One Eye's remarks excited everyone who had witnessed his most recent episode. Half a dozen more men exposed their silhouettes to anyone watching from below. Still others seemed to think we ought to trudge right on down there in a big disorderly mob, right now. Kendo, I called. Slink! I want you each to take six men out through the gate, fully armed, including bamboo. Slink, take the right side of the road. You take the left, Kendo. You'll be covering the rest of us as we come out. River, you're the reserve. Take ten men and wait just inside the shadow gate. You'll stay there and become the rear guard if nothing bothers them. Training and discipline took over. A superior standard of both are among the company's most potent tools. Properly employed, they become our deadliest tools. We try to inculcate discipline from a recruit's first day, right alongside a healthy distrust of everyone on the outside. We try to pound into his very bones what he needs to do in every situation. The slope from the edge of the plain to the shadow gate seemed to stretch for miles. I felt bone naked descending it without the standard. Tobo, carrying the golden pickaxe, had to take my place. I told him, Don't get too fond of the job, kid. It may be all I have if we get the captain and the lieutenant back. And I won't even have that if your dad wants all of his old jobs back. Experiment quickly proved no key, but the pick was needed to leave the plane. The shadow gate did tickle and tingle, though. The first thing I noticed outside was a powerful mixture of sagey and piney smells. There had been few odors on the plane. Then I noticed the incredible warmth. This world was much warmer than the plane was. It was early autumn here, as promised, Willow as promised. Kindo and Slink kept their squads moving, screening our advance. More and more people passed through the gate. I got myself hoisted onto the black stallion so I could see better, which meant that somebody had to carry one eye. I told Sarah, let's head for those ruins. I was about to add something about shelter being easier to find there when Kindo Cutter shouted. I looked where he pointed. It took a sharp eye to see them. The old men coming uphill slowly wore robes almost exactly the same color as the road and the earth behind them. There were five of them. They were bent and moved slowly. We did give ourselves away up there, and somebody was watching. Doge! Waste of breath. The swordmaster was headed downhill already. Tobo and Goda were right behind him which did nothing for Sarah's nerves. I rushed forward, caught the boy. You stay back. But sleepy. You want to debate it with Runmust and Iqbal? He did not want to argue with the large Shadar gentleman. I did not want to argue with the troll. I let her go. She might be more intimidating than Doge anyway. He was just one old man with a sword, she was a vicious old woman with a virulent tongue. I checked my battered old short sword. That was going to perform wonders if they climbed over Uncle Doge. Then I headed downhill myself. Sara accompanied me. The old men in brown looked at Doge and Goda. Doge and Goda looked at them. Those five men looked like they had been cast in the same mold, being nearly as wide as they were tall and very long in the tooth. One of the natives said something rapid in a liquid tongue. The cadence was unusual, but the words sounded vaguely familiar. I did catch the phrase, children of the dead. Doge replied at length in Yuang Bo, which included the formulas, the land of unknown shadows, and all evil dies there in endless death. 
The old men seemed hugely puzzled by Doge's accent, but recognized those phrases well enough to become visibly agitated. I could not tell if that was a positive sign or not. Mother Goda began muttering the incantation that included calling the heaven and the earth and the day and the night, and that excited the old men even more. Sarah told me, Evidently the language has changed a great deal since the children of the dead ran away. It took me a moment to understand that she was translating what Doge had said in an aside to Goda. There was a stream of chatter from the old men, all apparently in the form of pointed questions that Doge could not answer. Sara said, They seem to be extremely worried about someone they keep calling that devil dog Marika Montera. Also, about a pupil of this monster, a supposed future grandmaster. Apparently the two were driven into exile together. Marika Montera would be long shadow. We know there was a time when he used the name Maricha Mantara Dumraksha. He sent an agent named Ashutash Yaksha to live among the Nuang Bo in an effort to find and steal the key that we've brought with us, the golden pickaxe. Uncle Doge chided. Sleepy, these old men don't speak Taglian or Deja Gorin, but there's still a chance that they might recognize our version of names they fear and hate just a whole hell of a lot. Right now they're clamoring for answers about one Akos Tosiak Shah. It sounds like Long Shadow and Shadow Spinner before they were exiled were the last of a race of outsider sorcerers who enslaved these people's forefathers. Through their ability to manipulate killer shadows, they summoned from the plane. Wouldn't you know? They brought their business with them. Tell these guys whatever they need to know. Tell them the truth. Tell them who we are and what we intend to do, and what we've already done to their buddies Long Shadow and Shadow Spinner. We might be wise to find out a little more about them before we become completely candid. I wouldn't expect you to break any lifetime habits. Doge nodded slightly, betraying the slightest smile. He faced the old men and began talking. I found that my Nguyen bow was improving. I had no trouble isolating stone soldiers and soldiers of darkness in his monologue. Native faces kept turning my way, always more surprised. Sara told me, They are monks of some sort. They've been watching for a long time. Watching is what their order does, in case the shadow masters try to return. They did not expect anyone to come for real. They especially didn't expect women, eh? That amazes them, and Swan worries them. Their ancestors' experiences with white devils were not positive. Then, of course, the white crow swooped and landed on my shoulder, and the great black stallion with its prune of a rider came down to stick its nose in. And as the chatter picked up, still well seasoned with stone soldier and soldier of darkness and steadfast guardian, the rest of the band drifted forward impelled by curiosity. First thing I knew, Tobo was right there beside me, along with Runmust, Iqbal, and Suruvija and all their offspring, the dog, and ever-increasing jabber about what should we do with the captured. Where were we going to set up camp? You hearing these questions? I asked Doge. I hear them. I think we're going to be granted this whole valley, for the time being, while they send messages to the court of all seasons and the file of nine. We'll have more important visitors eventually. Until then... As I understand them, we can set down anywhere we want. The dialect is a little tricky, though, so be careful. Dozens of veteran eyes scanned the valley for defensible positions. It took no effort to identify them. They were the same as those we recalled from the Kiolene Wars. I wondered if all the connected worlds would be equally familiar physically. I indicated my choice. No one demurred. Runmust and the Sings hurried off to survey the site, accompanied by a dozen men armed for anything. The five old monks did not protest. Mostly, they seemed bemused and amazed. 
So it was that the Black Company reached the land of unknown shadows instead of fabled Katavar. There it was that the company settled and rested and recovered. There it was that I filled book after book with words when I was not planning or leading expedition to rescue the rest of my captured brothers, and even that devil dog Marika Montera, so he would be available for another, rather less pleasant encounter with justice than the one that had driven him into exile. The grandchildren of his former slaves feared him not at all. I won him a stay, at lady's request, so he could help with Tobo's schooling. The stay was good, for as long as he did that job satisfactorily, and not for a moment more. The old monks, as tight of lip as their cousin Doge, agreed that Tobo had to be trained, but would not reveal their reasoning even to me. At one time, the land of the unknown shadows had suffered many lean, pale bone sacks just like Long Shadow. They were invaders from another world. They had brought no wives with them. Time did not love them. And thus it was. And thus it was. Soldiers live and wonder why. One eye survived another four years, suffering strokes, yet recovering slowly every time. Seldom did he leave the house we built for him and Goda. Mostly he tinkered with his black spear, while Goda hovered around and fussed. He fussed right back and never stopped worrying about Tobo's education. Once again, Tobo was smothered in parents, both real and surrogate. He studied with one eye. He studied with Lady. He studied with Long Shadow and Master Centaraxita, with the Radisha and the Prabrindra Dra, and with the masters of our adoptive world. He studied hard and well and much, much more than he wanted. He was very talented. He was what his great-grandmother Hong Tre had foreseen. The captured all returned to us, except for those who died beneath the plain. But even the best of them, Mergen, Lady, the captain, were strange and deeply changed. Fay. But we were changed as well, by life, so that those of us they remembered at all were almost alien to them. A new order came into being. It had to be. Some day we will cross the plain again. Water sleeps. For now I just rest and indulge myself in writing, in remembering the fallen, in considering the strange twists life takes, in considering what plan God must have if the good are condemned to die young while the wicked prosper, if righteous men can commit deep evil while bad men demonstrate unexpected streaks of humanity. Soldiers live and wonder why. Chapter 99 The great general started south through the Don Depresh moments after the protector abandoned him so she could make more speed. Consequently, he met Soulcatcher on the southern side of the summit just a week later. She talked to herself continuously in a committee of voices while she was awake and gibbered in tongues during her brief bouts of sleep. Mogaba thought the daughter of night seemed smugly pleased in the moment before she collapsed from exhaustion. Kill them. Mogaba urged the moment he had Soulcatcher's ear and a bit of privacy. Those two can be nothing but trouble, and there's no way you can profit from keeping them around. Possibly true. The protector's voice was a sly one. But if I'm clever enough, I can use the girl to tap into Kina's power the way my sister did. If there's one thing I've learned from a life noteworthy for its regiments of disappointments, it's that you can't rely on cleverness. You're a powerful woman now. Kill them while you can. Kill them before they find a way to turn the tables. You don't need to become any stronger. There's no one in this world capable of challenging you. There's always someone, Mogaba. Kill them. They sure won't waste a second on you. 
Soul Catcher approached the daughter of night, who had not moved since her collapse. My dear sweet niece wouldn't harm me. The voice she chose could have been that of a naive 14-year-old responding to the charge that her 25-year-old lover was interested in only one thing. Then she laughed cruelly, kicked the daughter of night viciously. You even think about it, bitch, and I'll roast and eat you one limb at a time, and still make sure you live long enough to see your mother die first. The great general neither moved nor made any remark. His face betrayed nothing, not even to Soul Catcher's acute eye. But in his sinking heart, he understood that yet again he had allied himself with complete and unpredictable insanity. And yet again, he had no option but to ride the tiger. He observed, Perhaps we should give thought to how to guard our minds against intrusion by the Queen of Terror and Darkness. I'm ahead of you, General. I'm the professional. This voice was that of a self-important little mouse of a functionary. It became that of a self-confident woman being conversational. The voice Mogaba suspected was Soulcatcher's own. It resembled closely the voice of her sister, Lady. For the last week, I've had nothing to do but nurture the blisters on my feet and think. I conceived marvelous new torments to practice upon the Black Company. Too late to enjoy them. Isn't that the way it always goes? You always think of the perfect comeback about an hour too late for it to do any good. I suppose I'll find other enemies and my innovation won't be wasted. Most of the time, though, I considered how best to circumvent Kina's power. She did not fear naming the goddess directly. We can do it. The daughter of night stirred slightly. Her shoulders tightened. She glanced up for an instant. She looked a little uncertain, a little troubled. For the first time since her birth, she was completely out of touch with her soul mother. She had been out of touch for several days. Something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. Soul catcher eyed Narayan Singh. That old man was not much use anymore. She could test her new torments on him once she had him back in Taglios, before a suitable audience. General, if I get caught up in one of those byways that distract me so often, I want you to nudge me back to the business at hand, which will be empire building, and, in my spare time, the creation of a new flying carpet. I think I know enough of the howler's secrets to manage. This past week has forced me to admit to myself that I have no innate fondness for exercise. Soulcatcher prodded the Daughter of Night again, then settled on a rotten log and removed her boots. Mogaba, don't ever tell anyone that you've seen the world's greatest sorceress stumped for a way to handle something as trivial as blisters. Narayan Singh, who had been snoring fitfully, suddenly rose up and gripped the bars of his cage. His face contorted in terror, its butternut color all but gone. Water sleeps, he screamed. Take him, take him, he's coming. Then he collapsed, unconscious again, though his body continued to spasm. Soulcatcher growled softly. Water sleeps. We'll see what the dead can do. They were all gone this time. It was her world now. What else did he say? Something that sounded like a Nguyenbo name. Um, yes. But not a name. Something about death. Or a murder. Tai Kim. Coming. Hmm, maybe a nickname. Murder Walker. I should learn the language better. The Daughter of Night, she noted, was shaking more than sing. The wind whines and howls through fangs of ice. 
It races furiously around the nameless fortress, but tonight neither the lightning nor the storm has any power to disturb. The creature on the wooden throne is relaxed. He will rest comfortably through a night of years for the first time in a long millennium. The silver daggers are no inconvenience at all. Shivetya sleeps and dreams dreams of immortality's end. Fury crackles between the standing stones. Shadows flee. Shadows hide. Shadows huddle in terror. Immortality is threatened. This has been an Audible Frontiers production. Executive producer, Steve Feldberg. Producer, Mike Charsik. Music by Michael Whalen. Copyright 1999 by Glenn Cook. Audio recording copyright 2010 by Audible Inc. If you enjoyed this audiobook, the rest of Glenn Cook's Black Company series is available today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.